Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, amen, namaste. Public business, government business, bill second reading. Honorable members, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled an act to provide for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September, 2023, be now read a second time. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Good morning, members of this honorable chamber. I am very pleased uh, today to participate in the budget debate, to have this opportunity to respond, and I thank you for it, on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I intend to attempt to give a voice to the voiceless here in this chamber. And I want to thank all the persons who participated in our pre-budget consultations. We had several of those throughout the country. I want to thank my MPs and senators. I want to thank our staff in the various offices, and I want to thank the opposition staff for their very hard work in helping us prep for this debate. Following upon the minister's four-hour presentation, a giant wave of despair and anger swept over society's poor and working class sections. The news they reporting on reactions to the budget 2023 accurately put it in my respectful view, and I quote, big businesses generally sweet on Imbert's fiscal plan for the next 12 months, while average trees said the budget left them feeling very sour. Painful is how the Express fittingly summed up the presentation. Very few were spared this budget's wrath. Farmers, trade unions, maxi taxi operators, petrol dealers, senior citizens, passengers of the inter island ferry service, the traveling public, mothers, housewives, all have flooded the newspapers, flooded the social media, and in their own communities with pleas of anguish and grave concerns over Prime Minister Rowley's hateful 2023 budget. I ask the question today, Prime Minister, why does your government brutalize the poor? The poor have feelings too. So come down from there and face the reality. People are suffering in this country and your budget will only increase their suffering. This budget is a vicious frontal attack on the poor and working classes. It also reeks of classism. It's wicked policies that are designed to benefit, benefit the PNM upper class at the expense of the poor and working class. Only some greedy, predatory individuals and organizations would genuinely support such policies which heap suffering on the poor and working class. It was so sad to see 
post-budget, some fearful persons and organizations praising these measures, which bring pain to the majority of the population, and did so because they fed victimization from this PNM government. The government continues to treat the private sector with contempt and disdain because the PNM weaponizes access to payments, access to contracts, and refunds to instill fear of loss of livelihoods to suppress criticism. This is the most wicked act to perpetrate against the business community. This budget is also an unnecessary provocation of our poor and working class citizens. There's a seething anger building in the country against an entrenched unfairness being perpetrated against citizens to benefit a few. Our economy is in crisis. Our business sector is heavily polarized. And the SME sector remains severely challenged. International studies, and of course, we know from our own experiences, all these report that citizens are suffering very badly. So for, for seven years, this minister repeatedly cried that falling energy prices had challenged revenue streams of the country. And that was his justification for the wicked, heartbreaking measures perpetrated over the past seven years. That was his justification for reduction and removal of subsidies, for including multiple times the raised fuel price, laughing while citizens suffered. That was their justification for not increasing the value of social grants, pensions, public assistance to realistic levels. That was their justification for stalling projects in specific areas, such as schools, preschools, uh, <clears throat> highways, university expansion, hospital, bridges, drainage, road repair, police stations, in every area of life. That was their justification for government's inability to conclude negotiations with unions offering zero and one and four percent salary increases even as the cost of living continued to rise. That was the explanation for raising taxes and adding new taxes. So logically, like everyone else, when world oil, gas, and ammonia prices skyrocketed, as it has done in the past 17 months, dramatically increasing revenue, people expected an opposite response, at the very least a softening of the severely constrictive policies government had instituted over the past 84 months. Like the rest of the population, we were hoping for a budget to address the realities in our country. What happened instead, Madam Speaker? The government's reaction was to introduce and raise even more taxes, remove even more subsidies, raise fuel prices yet again, and offer unions almost less than minimum wage. Instead of sustainable measures for growth, development, and an increase in the quality of life of people, their presentation was a long, tiring, misleading diatribe, laced with statistical deceit, bluff, and outright manipulation and falsification of data. Indeed, Madam Speaker, I observed, and you may have observed, that after that long, during that long speech, many members on the other side were looking half asleep. It appeared they were falling asleep. And um, the only time they came to life and appeared to be very elated is when the minister finished and then they thumped their desk side to say, thank God he's finished, he's done. After that long diatribe. Today, I intend to analyze the budget presentation and the budget documents and to show that this has been an evil act of brutality against the poor and working class. I say, Prime Minister, poor people have feelings too. Withdraw this budget and call an election now. In my response, I propose to provide analytical evidence of the data available to demonstrate what I've said that this is a brutal act against the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I will do so by firstly looking at a brief overview of the minister's presentation. Then I'll look at the macroeconomic fundamentals and the state of the economy. 
I'll then look at sectoral details and failed broken promises. I will then look at the ongoing deliberate failure to deliver on promises for seven consecutive years. I will talk a bit about our track record of unparalleled progressive performance and delivery of goods and services in our term in government. I will also propose some UNC solutions for when we form the next government. I say without doubt, the UNC will indeed form the next government. I turn now to a brief overview of the minister's presentation. Uh, Madam Speaker, I will speak at large and in the whole, and my colleagues will develop with respect to the various sectors and present more details. If I take a brief overview of the presentation last Monday, I noted that the minister began by lamenting that on assuming office, he faced challenges ranging from the fall in oil prices, the fiscal concessions my government gave, and the pandemic's effects. The minister, however, did not speak to the fact that unlike most economies in the Caribbean, he inherited from us significant financial buffers, such as foreign reserves of more than US $10 billion, one of the highest in the region. He also inherited as a financial buffer US $5.6 billion in the HSF. While we recognize that COVID affected every economy negatively, the US dollar financial buffers and the low debt to GDP ratio that the minister inherited from us, that is what took us out of the crisis, helped us out. As usual, the minister stated there had been a turnaround in gas production. The minister has been consistently wrong. I think one reporter, Curtis Williams, called him out on it, has been consistently wrong in his projections about gas production. So he talked about a turnaround, giving the impression of full recovery. Minister did not mention, again, that he inherited gas production of 3.8 BCF a day from us, which under his government has shrunk to 2.4 BCF per day. This is what caused the closure of LNG train one. Even if all the ministers promise gas production comes in stream, he is still projecting 2022 and 2023 gas production figures substantially lower than what he met when he came into office and we left in 2015. The minister also gave no credit to the fiscal concessions granted by my government, which produced the juniper field without which without which the 2.9 BCF a day that he says is now being produced, that would not have occurred. Nor did he give credit to the Savannah and Macadamia fields, which also came out of our fiscal concessions and which will contribute in keeping output of gas up over the next three years. The minister also made much of the renewable energy projects intended to produce 10% of the output from alternative sources. But this is a promise that he had made in 2016. His goal when he made the promise in 2016 was to achieve it by 2021. Yet Monday, this was surreptitiously adjusted to become a reality in 2023. And now even that goal of 2023 achievement is in jeopardy. Nowhere did the minister state how much electricity is consumed in TNT annually. I'm sure that he will be astounded when he finds out and he will then have to better project what the milestones are to achieving his goals about um, not using uh, uh, fossil energy but to have renewable energy. He doesn't tell us about the other projects that will get us there for that goal that he has now for 2023. As usual, it is just more glib speech, speech aimed at fooling the population into believing that the government knows what it is doing. It is very clear the government has no clue about what it is doing. The piece de resistance in his opening 
was the use of nominal GDP to say that the economy's performance, what we were doing well, and to provide guidance on what is happening. It probably does the minister's ego good to say that he has growth again after six years of contraction on his stewardship. However, Madam Speaker, it must be noted, no economist, no minister in the world uses nominal data to evaluate performance and determine the economy's way forward. Was the use of this methodology an attempt to mislead the population? The minister concealed that there would be a deficit in 2022, although he tried to justify this by saying that he had transferred monies into the HSF. It is instructive to note that under my government in 2015, which was an election year, the price of oil dropped to an average of $48 per barrel. The economy had in that year the lowest deficit in 10 years of $2.7 billion. And all this was possible under the guidance of our country's best finance minister, Mr. Larry Hawaii. The minister also did not say that under his negligence, the deficits on an accumulative basis amounted to $32 billion between the years 2016 to 2019. And when 2020 is included, his deficits total close to $50 billion, more than three times the level incurred under the government I led. This he and some business chambers call fiscal prudence. How can that be fiscal prudence when your deficits amount to over 50, close to $50 billion? It is yet to be explained by them how doubling the deficit is fiscal prudence. In the same way, they still have to explain how moving the debt to GDP level to 88.7% is prudent management and prudent fiscal management. What, where is the prudent management in that? The minister made much of the fact that he contained government expenditure, reducing it by up to $9 billion. What he did not say is that this figure has increased and what is more important is that the reduction in expenditure was achieved by a decrease in capital expenditure, which seriously constrains the productive capacity of the nation. It is also amazing how proud the minister seems to be of the so-called upgrade in the rating outlook by Standard & Poor. Upgrade, the minister said, in the first time in 15 years, Standard & Poor made a change. Madam Speaker, that was not an upgrade in the rating. That was an upgrade in the outlook. And what is more important is the minister inherited an economy from us that was rated A by Standard & Poor. And he has piloted it to just above junk status now. And that has been staved off by a further downgrade, not because of any magic or any plan or policy that he had, but because of the Ukraine-Russia war and increase in commodity prices. The economy was an investment grade economy under my, my watch by both Standard & Poor and Moody's. Interestingly, the minister discontinued showcasing Moody's rating after they showed how poorly he was managing the economy and they reduced us to junk status. You remember in the past when he was unhappy with the ratings, he said he was going to hire a third rating company. What was it? Fitch. He was going to hire Fitch to do another rating. Whatever became of that, I never heard of that third rating. Maybe the minister will tell us if he got a different rating from Sandard and Poe and from Moody's. The minister continues to lament the cost of the fuel subsidy. That was introduced by a previous PM administration. But apart from laying the burden on the population, what is his government and what is this minister and his government doing to ease the burden? So we lament, you lament each time the subsidy and what a burden it is to the state and you share it with the population and so on. But what are you doing about it? Didn't just happen. This has been going on for years. My government, again under the guidance of my then Minister of Energy, and by then Minister of Finance, we recognized the impact of the cost of the subsidy. And what we did, we began introducing, introducing natural gas as a fuel for vehicles. 
While we acknowledge that the world is going to hybrid and electric vehicles, we have a legacy inventory over of over 500,000 vehicles which are petrol driven and which would benefit from conversion to natural gas. So we, we recognize that. We saw this as a possible solution to facilitate this conversion that we realized we would have to have a network of natural gas stations throughout the country. And we set about establishing that. However, another initiative that they killed and did away with, and then now comes to cry about the subsidy without any solution as to how you're going to deal with the high price of um, natural gas and all fossil fuels in the world economy. I turn now to the state of the economy. You know, this is a very important aspect of any budget presentation. And what I've noticed, Madam Speaker, is that in, in many instances, the data has been cherry-picked, the data has been falsified to some extent, not necessarily by the minister, and um, just to try to, to fool people into thinking, hey, things are great. Remember when the minister told us, I can see clearly now, the minister told us about turnaround, every budget, everything is going great, but yet the economy is un has contracted every single year under the watch of this minister, every single year. One of the most widely used measures of a country's stability and growth is what is known as GDP, gross domestic product. That is the value of goods and services corrected for price increases caused by inflation. When there is economic growth, then your GDP, real GDP increases. GDP, as I mentioned about nominal before, you can report it in the nominal dollar value of all goods and services. However, nominal GDP is misleading because output value can increase only because prices have increased as opposed to increased production of goods and services. That is why I said nobody uses nominal GDP. The international standard to measure economic growth is real GDP. I believe any attempt to use nominal GDP to compare over the years to claim economic growth is either based on intellectual dishonesty, statistical fraud, or academic professional incompetence. Member, and yet, and member, yet, member for Superior. Yes, ma'am. Some of those words are, in my view, imputing improper motive. So I'll ask you to withdraw those words and find another way to put over what you wish. Madam, I am guided. I was, I'm not saying the minister has done this. I am saying in my respectful view, if this has been done, that is how I view it in my view. I have not said that the minister and, is guilty and, and, of any of I have, this. I have ruled, I have asked you to withdraw it and find another way to say it. Certainly. I hope this doesn't come, continue for the rest of the morning. So what did the Remember. minister do? As you know, you have freedom of speech within the confines of the standing orders. So withdraw and please. I proceed. withdraw the statements. They are not made as against the minister, is against the use of nominal GDP for growth. I withdraw the statements. In April 2022, the minister used nominal GDP to boast that all sectors grew in 2021. At that time, the minister had data until the end of that 2021 year, and therefore he knew the truth based on the data. But having announced in his 2021 budget statement that the economy would return to sustainable growth that year, the minister used the nominal data, which as I said, is misleading to be used. Let me share the truth in terms of GDP, which is not being disclosed to the population. Information I downloaded yesterday from the CSO website clearly shows that real GDP had fallen by $37.5 billion <clears throat> between when this government took office and 2021. Fallen by $37.5 billion. The last full year that the CSO has data for is 2021. The data also shows that the minister was wrong in claiming that GDP grew in 2021. May I remind Madam Speaker that in calendar 2014, the
the last full year under my government, our country produced $187.1 billion in GDP, one of the highest in our nation's history. By 2020, real GDP had dropped to $151.1 billion. And in 2021, the CSO stats clearly stated GDP had fallen yet again by another $1.55 billion. Now, I've searched, Madam, to determine where the minister got the figure from and realize that that was his own figure. Since the CSO, since the CSO only has reference to the first quarter of 2022, which showed a continued contraction of GDP. I will ask the minister to tell us that the figure quoted, if you'll give us a source of that data. I say further, Madam, after seven years <clears throat> and spending three, about $393 billion, the government still has not been able to generate the level of production in this economy as we did and which he met when he came in in 2015. Seven years later, he is still billions away from what he had at the start, and that, in my respectful view, indicates failure on the part of this government. The fact is that far from GDP being the highest ever, the actual figures show that output in TNT has shrunk to what it was decades ago. Under this minister and this government, the country's production of goods and services has collapsed. One year ago in this house, the minister announced his prediction for the TT economy or overall real economic growth of up to 5%. At the recent Spotlight event, the minister continu continued his narrative and again claimed an increase in the country's GDP. He claimed the TT economy was enjoying a strong recovery. Ironically, madam, hours later, the CSO revealed the economy had, economy had contracted during the last quarter of 21 and again in the first quarter of 2022. I believe the CSO data, madam speaker. And I have to ask the question if that is why there are some who are hell-bent on removing the CSO and want to create a statistical institute that will be under the control of political operatives. So the CSO has given us the numbers, and, and those are the numbers that we accept. The central bank also reported economic contractions in the energy sector in the second quarter signaling the likelihood of another year of contraction in 2022. So where is the stability? The minister puts us the same tenacity and stability. The only tenacity I see is to continue to fail. That's the only thing you have tenacity for. Where is the stability? When the economy continues, continues to contract year after year, as evidenced by real GDP. In fact, in every metric, Madam Speaker, in every metric, and in every sector, there has been a decline in everything in the country. One year ago, the minister in this house had for the umpteen time plucked a random number from the sky predicting real economic growth in 2022 of up to 5%, premised on the energy sector growing at 13%. On Monday, in his 2023 budget statement, the minister boasted that government policy in the last two years paved the way for a recovery in all economic sectors. Nothing is further from the truth. The review of the economy produced by his very minister, Minister of Finance, 2022 that we got um, this week, showed contractions in multiple sectors. Minister says we paved the way for recovery in all sectors. The review of the economy is showing that there, was, there were contractions in multiple sectors in 2021, including mining and quarrying, a minus 5.2%, trade and repairs, minus 4.7%, accommodation and food supplies, minus 5.9%, information and communication, minus 0.5%, professional and scientific services, minus 2.1%. 
The data first quarter for 22 show contractions in the same sector. So in 21 and in 22, but yet the minister was projecting recovery and growth. Contrary to the minister's claims, the TT economy is not growing, it is declining. And contrary to the view that these contractions were caused by first Kamala and the UNC, the policies of our government, then by COVID, let's remind ourselves, there was no COVID in 2016. <clears throat> there was no COVID in 2017. There was no COVID in 2018, and the GDP declined in each of these years. So it is evident that the cause for economic collapse lies not with COVID, but something much more, much more substantial, which lies squarely at the hands and feet of this minister and his government. While GDP growth does not measure individual benefit from the national output, it provides a framework to assess the general level of opportunity in the country. I turn now to GDP per capita. One of the critical elements standing at poor reviews is the GDP per capita as a rough measure of the potential spread of economic development and the potential impact on socioeconomic stability. Any investor looking at this metric cannot help but note that under my five-year tenure, our de developmental plans, policies, sectoral and geographic distribution ensure the broadest possible participation in the national economy. So the metric will show under my government, GDP per capita increased by almost $40,000. Real GDP per capita was $140,110 during our last full year in office. This increase resulted in an elevated standard of living across the board. Within five years, this PNM government has effectively erased that as evident by the fall in the GDP per capita under their watch. According to the latest available data at the CSO, 2021, real GDP per capita stands at $109,391. This means every citizen in our country has become poorer by $30,718 because of this government's policies and practices. Under this government, real GDP per capita has fallen by 22% which shows in the reduction of the standard of living of the vast majority of our citizen. citizens. These are irrefutable facts. I find also in the minister's projections an alarming GDP growth claim. This was used um, in the growth estimates produced by the staff under the Minister of Finance the minister claimed in his 2023 budget statement Monday, and I quote page 15, our economy is projected to recover with real GDP growth of 2% for the full year. I repeat, our economy is projected to recover with real GDP growth of 2% for the full year. The challenge is that the CSO did not produce this 2% growth claim. The Minister of Finance makes it clear that this year's review of the economy, where he states, and I quote from the review of the economy, the books, this is one of the books put out by the Minister of Finance, I quote, in 2019, the CSO stopped producing current year estimates of GDP in keeping the guidelines of international good governance practices in national statistical, statistical reporting. This ensures a separation of acti activities related to GDP compilation which is the responsibility of a national statistical office, from activities relating to forecasting, preparing GD projections, which should lie with another agency. The note in the ROE continues, and I quote, the Ministry of Finance has taken responsibility for the current year forecasts. The Ministry of Finance has taken responsibility for the current year forecasts. However, 
due to the limited availability of data, the ministry is constrained in its ability to prepare court forecasts for the full gamut of sectors that constitute the new ISIC Review 4 methodology of the CSO. As a result, the ministry has relied to a great extent on, guess what, qualitative data to give its best judgment of real economic activity. Minister, I do not believe you. I do not trust your numbers. I do not trust the numbers. What it means is that the Ministry of Finance has placed a guesstimate on the public record, not an estimate of GDP growth. And to make matters worse, <clears throat> it is not one that the CSO can approve, given that the Ministry of Finance admits, in that same quote that I gave you, they do not have the capacity to make proper projections. I therefore advise, with all due respect, all members present and the nation at large, to follow the advice of the technocrats at the Ministry of Finance, and not compare GDP data from CSO with the guesstimate of this 2% growth presented by the minister. As an overall macroeconomic direction, Madam Speaker, the government has no clear policy direction to signal to local and foreign investors where to place their capital. Citizens do not have a clear focus on what sectors will be growing and how to prepare to take advantage of potential growth sectors through education, training, and for employment. Domestic and foreign investors rely on GDP growth as a back-of-the-envelope indicator of economic prosperity in a market when conducting their due diligence on whether to enter, increase investment, or to withdraw. Investors will look on with grave concern at an energy-based economy which continues to record declines in the face of very high prices in the energy sector. Foreign investors will form one conclusion. The environment for business is not favorable. And this is a critical reason why the economy continues to slide down once under this government. No amount of marketing can mask a failing economy. Worse, the fact that the government continues to misrepresent the facts will not instill confidence in the domestic or foreign investors. I turn to credit ratings, Madam Speaker. Credit ratings, um, we have used over the years Standard & Poor's rating, and they find that the rating has fallen under this government, as I told, said before, from an A grade under our tenure to a B, B, B plus, then B, 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 and then B, B minus under the management of this government. In fact, in 2020, the agency downgraded the country to a B, B minus rating, which it maintains in the July 2022 assessment of Trinidad and Tobago. And yes, S&P made a minor change in July 2022, shifting its projected future outlook, I make the point again, outlook, not rating, to stable based on expectations of structural developments in the economy promised by the government. Based on that minor change, the minister, as I said, seized the opportunity to claim Trinidad and Bago is a safe haven for investors. Choosing once more to ignore the fact that the actual rating has not improved and that the outlook was not positive but stable, suggesting at worst the hope for no further deterioration. On page 37 of his budget statement, the minister told his country, and I quote, as SNP puts it, the stable report reflects the expectations, expectations that high prices of key exports will more than offset the impact of lower than expected energy production. Since when has this minister or this government been setting world energy prices? And why is it standard and poor of the view that energy production will be lower than expected when the minister boasts in every forum 
including last Monday, about increased energy sector production. Why is the MF, MF, I, um, the s and why are they talking about low than expected energy production? I'll come back to that in a moment. We look at the Moody's credit ratings. The minister does not mention our ratings from Moody's in his speech on Monday, and we are not surprised. The minister did not tell us that the 2022 review of the economy published by his ministry outlined that Moody's assigned credit ratings of non-investment grades of BA1 and BA2 for 2021. So he wouldn't sing about that, not seen clearly about that at all. In 2022, Moody's ratings have been rebased to a 21 base here, and as expected, are unlikely to change substantially since it will be influenced by what is known to be temporary windfall in earnings generated by external market forces. What do these ratings mean? They mean that TNT issues are judged to be speculative and of substantial credit risk. It means that international lenders and investors would note that we fell from an investment grade under this government. We are now at the point where we are viewed as having a substantial risk of default on principal or interest payments for government debt. I turn to Forex, which is another very troubling issue, especially in light of the minister's claims on um, Monday about the Exim Bank and how much it had achieved. The devil is always in the details, Madam Speaker. Accessing foreign exchange remains a severe challenge, except for a chosen few. In the 2022 budget, the minister boasted that the one of access to SDR COVID support of US 644 million propped up the failing foreign exchange reserves. Repeated raiding of the HSF would also have added some currency liquidity to the overall figure. However, average users have not benefited from that liquidity. The distribution of foreign exchange remains a carefully guarded secret by this government and the governor of the central bank. However, Based on previous revelations by a more forthright governor of the bank, it became, became clear that certain financial institutions still have first right over available currency from the central bank. These institutions are part of conglomerates earning foreign exchange through trade, forward and backward linkages, and subsidiaries. The central bank has been pumping an average of US $100 million into the domestic economy every month for the last two years. And this, the minister tells, he claims, that 114 SMEs out of a total of 136 companies have been, have been able to access US $395 million in 2022. With the greatest of respect, minister, that figure tells us nothing. Tell us how much of that 395 actually went to these SMEs, because it is likely that the 24 large companies out of that group you talk of consumed the lion's share. So it is not enough to call the numbers, but to be dis to disaggregate according to the quantum that each received. Who are these la large manufacturers? What business are they involved in? Are they importing raw materials like pasta and ketchup? I asked the question in this very next sentence, Minister told us that 87 importers got U.S. 488 million. To do what? To supply the nation with food, to supply the nation with pharmaceuticals, to supply the nation with sanitary, sanitary, sanitary products, PPE, and what the minister termed other essential supplies. I asked the minister to tell the country whether any of these companies, whether a subsidiary or parent, are part of the same conglomerates receiving foreign exchange under the other head, under both heads, therefore. Tell us whether these large companies are also part of the banking sector and have access to foreign exchange there as well. I am asking for a friend because we all know that the mega company in charge of the pharmaceutical sector in this country is owned by a close associate of the PNM and a friend of the big man himself. And this company is also a manufacturer of food products. So on the one hand, you have the manufacturing sector receiving. On the other hand, you're receiving because you're importing. 
Now, when the Exim Bank was set up, and I checked it on the website just last night, when the Exim Bank was set up, and up to this, this last night, it says its purpose is to deal with foreign exchange for exports. So now its mandate has changed because now you're giving foreign exchange for exports, but also for imports. And therefore, we need to know the breakdown and the companies involved. I challenge you, Minister, if there is nothing to hide, provide a comprehensive list of the companies who have been in receipt of the 883 US million dollars. This, when a friend um, recently told me his mother was going abroad and went to the bank and he asked, can I get 500 US dollars? My mom is going for some medical attention. And it took a week and they gave him 100 US dollars. The poor have feelings too, you know. Come down from there, the poor have feelings too. It is important to note that in 2015, the total US dollar equivalent of foreign currency sold to the public by all authorized dealers was $7.4 billion. And despite that, even though we sold $7.4 billion, we had the foreign reserves of US $10.5 billion. Under this finance minister, currency sales, foreign currency sales to the public dropped to US dollar equivalent of 4.97 billion as of 2021. So we sold 7.4 billion. They have sold 4.97 billion. I found something strange, perhaps the minister can tell us why this is happening. That while sales of many of the traditional currencies, Canadian, Japanese, Euro, etc., decreased, the sales of Jamaican dollars more than doubled over the period. I can't see why. I come back to saying that access to foreign exchange is a critical consideration for any foreign investor, essentially for repatriation of funds. The reduction in sales is not because of low demand. The reduction in the forex sales is not because there's low demand. The media is replete with stories about businesses, especially small traders, seeking but unable to get foreign exchange. One group, LJ Williams Limited, has been so severely affected by the shortage of foreign exchange, they have been forced to reconsider investments in Trinidad. In the financial report for the period ending December 31st, 2021, they stated, and I quote, the continued shortage of foreign exchange restricts our growth and has resulted in, in and has resulted in reconsidering investments in Trinidad for the time being. This story has been replayed in every company in our country, of course, except with respect to those with access. So exactly who have been the lucky few individuals and businesses receiving the billions in US dollars distributed annually? Despite the 30% reduction of foreign currency sales and the hundreds of, mil hundreds of millions of US dollars sourced from the HSF withdrawals from IMF's SDR allocation and other US denominated loans accessed over the last few years, the Forex reserves today are at now $6.8 billion as of August 2022. Remember, they inherited over $10 billion from us when they came into office. They have now taken that down as of August 22 to $6.8 billion, which is even lower than it was at the same time last year. Over this minister's tenure, the country's foreign exchange holdings collapsed by 33%, and that is also an indisputable fact. So what is the real legacy of this government when it comes to foreign exchange? Has it been to destroy foreign exchange generators to protect private interests? Who can ever forget the greatest tragedy to hit Trinidad and Tobago was the closure of Petrotrin, which was a foreign exchange earner. Now we have to find foreign exchange to buy fuels from outside of Trinidad and Tobago. What a tragedy for the people and the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. So, I say, this year's budget offers no hope that government has a plan outside of remaining dependent on the declining energy sector 
hoping and praying that we will get high world prices, they have no other plan to grow revenue streams and earn foreign exchange in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, this provides no confidence to persons seeking to invest funds in our country. I turn to the ease of doing business, and Madam, I'm looking at these as a review of the economy before I go on to look at specific sector, sectors and the management and performance of the government. These are important indicators because it tells the story about why we are where we are today. Last year's budget, the minister committed to improving this country's pitiful showing on the ease of doing business. We were ranked at 105 at the time. But investors will be shocked to see that in terms of specific cons constituent parts of doing business, our country was ranked even worse. So to register a proper property, ranked 158. What was done in the last year or seven years to address this? Nothing. What is the end of this budget to address this? Nothing. Dealing with construction permits, our rank was at 128. Again, what has been done to address this? Nothing has been done. Trading across borders, rank 134. Again, nothing done to address this. Paying taxes, imagine we were ranking at 160 to pay taxes when I knew, know that the minister was always gleeful and joyful and elated every time he talks about taxes. We ranked at 160. What has been done about this? Nothing has been done. Enforcing contracts, rank 174. Almost last in the world, again, what has been done? to address this problem, nothing. Only very confused and incompetent persons would believe government made any improvement to the ease of doing business. This rating was discontinued last year, but we didn't need a rating to tell us the horrendous conditions for doing business in the country. One year ago, the minister conceded that there was a critical need to take urgent steps to improve the ease of doing business once again. On Monday, the minister advised the nation, government was putting high priority on improving the ease of doing business. Incredibly, whilst the government is saying through its minister, high priority on the ease of doing business, the minister announced two initiatives to help with the ease of doing business. One, a website to give online, online advice on the regulations for starting or expanding a business. The other was to upgrade the single electronic window. That was established years ago, upgraded multiple times, and repeats of being upgraded. This was to facilitate payments for services already administered on the same platform. So there is no real attempt to fix the problems when it comes to ease of doing business. Earlier, Monday, the minister spoke about the creation of yet another new vehicle a trade and investment promotion agency. And what is this? This is a merger of the functions of four agencies, which the government has been spending hundreds of millions for over the years. Just merging all of these. How long is that going to take to bring it all together? How much more are you going to spend to get it going? So the minister boasted now about 78 lots and five factory shells to be ready for occupation in January at the Phoenix Park Industrial Estate. Does that sound new? I'm sure we've heard this before. And I wonder who is marketing this, given that the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency is still not functional. You're now talking about creating that and establishing it. The minister tells us that may 11 of the 83 options have been committed, and there are only 90 days left to go in this um, in this project. The minister is boasting about that. 11 out of 83. In fact, without even knowing who and what will eventually occupy these premises at Phoenix Park, the minister boldly declares that about 4,500 new jobs will be created whenever the park becomes occupied in the future. What is that, minister? 4,500 jobs, and I'm reminded Many of us in this house will remember minister came and with a repeated broken promise of a library dry dock. Remember that? And told us thousands of jobs will be jobs will be created. Well, up to today, no dry dock and no jobs. The minister also told us about plywood factory. Remember that? 
with so many jobs, again, PNM promises never materialize. I turn now to look at public sector debt. And this is a very troubling issue. The escalation in the national debt. And that national debt is not the ministers and the government. No. That debt is to be paid by taxpayers of this country. On Monday, the minister finally recognized, but he dismissed the public concern over the level of government debt and our fear of the country's rapid descent into the debt trap. The minister advised the country, and I quote, based on the current borrowing and repayment schedule, we expect no significant increase in our total government debt in the 12 months between December 2021 and December 2022. Despite these bold utterances, I note the minister chose not to tell the population that he had in fact borrowed $7.3 billion in fiscal 2022. $7.3 billion. Those books, the devil is in the details in those yellow books. And when you look at the estimates of revenue, I think it is either at um, page 10, Roman 10 not at, in that yellow book, borrowed $7.3 billion in fiscal 22. And guess what? Minister plans to borrow another $8.2 billion. $8.2 billion in fiscal 2023 to fund expenditure. Question. When exactly did this borrowing take place? In 2021 and 22. When did this take place? Curiously, I also noted the revised figure for total financing needed in fiscal 22 to fund the deficit was 2.43 billion. Listen carefully. You know. I noted the revised figure for financing the deficit for 2022 to fund the deficit was 2.433. My question then, why did, it, did the minister borrow 7.33 billion in fiscal 2022, which is 4.9 billion more than his financing needs? Why? Why did you borrow 4.9 billion more? Where has this money gone? Where has this money gone? This is a very serious issue. You borrow for financing of your deficits and so on. In your revised figure for financing needed for 22 was 2.433 billion. Why then did you borrow 7.33 billion in fiscal 22? You see, it is not enough to come to the parliament and boast that total debt is unlikely to change during the calendar year. I challenge the minister to explain why he borrowed 200% more than he needed to finance his 2022 deficit. Why? What did you do with that money? Where has that money gone? You have to tell the country. And again, the projection for 2023, the minister boasted that he will have a deficit of 1.501 billion. A deficit of 1.501 billion. You know, on Monday when I did the press interview, a reporter asked me, this is going to be the, um, the most balanced budget ever, the closest of balanced budget. I don't believe a word of that, 1.5. I don't believe it. Because if that is so, again, the minister has questions to answer. Why do you project in your revenue estimates at that same page, Roman 10, in the estimates of revenue, why do you intend to borrow $8.2 billion if your deficit is $1.5 billion? What is that money for? What is that money projected to be used for? That is four and a half times more than the value of the deficit that you will be borrowing to finance. What is this $8.2 billion projected? Or what is it for? Mr. owes an explanation. Because for financing, financing, you either have borrowing, or you do finance for deficits, you get do borrowings, you do um, extraordinary receipts like sale of assets and so on. Why are you borrowing 8.2 billion when you tell us that your deficit is $1.5 billion? And on top of that, if my memory says right, the minister told us on money also there'll be some sale of assets. In the revenue estimates, nowhere does it tell us which assets are to be sold. 
If you're going to sell assets, you must tell the country what assets. It is dear patrimony. What are you selling? What are you going to sell? What is the expected amount that you will get from the sale of assets? And then how much, what is that for when you already have financing of 8.2 billion, which is four and a half times more than the value of the deficit that you project something? is The maths not matching. Something is very, very wrong here. Once again, the maths is not matching. What is this additional borrowing for? Is this to service debt? If so, which debt? What is this for? On the backs of the minister's unsubstantiated 22 projection, the minister also boasted that the government's fiscal consolidation process defined, and I quote, as revenue enhancement and expenditure restraint was bringing the country's, country's debt back on a downward trajectory. Or that could be back on a downward trajectory when each year you continue to borrow. Every year you continue to borrow. In seven years, let me tell you, Madam Speaker, the minister raised our net public debt by 50% over what he found in 2015. 50%. But he's saying we are on a downward trajectory. The minister obviously has a different, a different concept or understanding of what is downward and what is upward. Downward trajectory. Frankly, the minister could come here and talk all he wants about the debt to GDP ratio dropping. The fact is that the public sector debt, sector debt increased every single year since the assumed office by billions of dollars. Every single year. And this is in spite of raids on the HSR, in spite of withdrawal from the NIF, which totaled TT 21 billion to fund expenditure which otherwise you would have had to finance through borrowings. So I mentioned, you know, sometimes you have a wonder, people tell me what's oh, sprung us, and you really have to wonder what's going on. So you're borrowing to finance. You're drawing down on the HSF. You're drawing down from an NIF. You're selling assets. And yet, the money is never enough. You're still with a deficit. The debt continues to rise. Although the country has already paid over $62 billion in debt servicing over the last seven years. That's taxpayers' money, $62 billion in debt servicing over the last seven years because they are borrowing more than they are paying back yearly. As the debt burden rises, they are effectively borrowing to pay debt. That is what it means. They are borrowing to pay debt, which you'll have to borrow again to pay for, and it will continue in a vicious cycle. I'm reminded of a, a book, The Children of Sisyphus, that it will be pushing a bowl up a hill, and as soon as it reaches a little way, it just rolls back down again. That is what is happening under this government. The 2023 estimates of expenditure place charges on account of public debt, that is debt servicing, at $9.62 billion for 2022. Debt servicing, not paying the debt to no, just the service, 22.2, 9.6 billion. Do you know what is the estimate for the 2023 for debt servicing? 15.075 billion dollars. So where's the downward trajectory? Where is all this taxpayer's dollars going because you just borrow, borrow, and spend? You have no clear plan, no policies for growth, for sustainable development, for the creation of jobs. All you do is borrow, 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 tax, 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 and spend. We're not a care in the world. And so you have pushed our country into debt trap. Instead of frontally admitting the truth, the minister keeps spending money that is not his, putting generations of citizens into debt. That is the state of the debt packet under this government. I look at the HSF. Minister boasted he put a deposit. Well, that's the first time they ever put a deposit. Eh? But let me tell you what, the, what the, the details are. During the time when they were recklessly in debt in our country, they were also drawing down on our ability to repay those debts using our savings. I am advised the net asset value of the HSF as of September 14, 2022, was US $4.788 million. US $4.788 million in September 2015. 
the value of our savings in the HSF was $5.65 billion, dollars, five five. So under 6.55 billion, US million, under this government, 4.788.2 million. Over the last seven years, the fund has generated a solid stream of income. If left alone, it would have been valued at more than US $8 billion. $8 billion. Lending strength to our national savings and international foreign exchange buffers. In sense, the government changed the legislation. Remember, they came to this parliament and changed the legislation. They mismanaged the economy. They facilitated the extraction of US $2.5 billion from the savings in the HSF. Almost half the optimal value of the HSF in just seven years. They got almost half out of the HSF. That works out to 17 billion TT dollars withdrawn in seven years. That was money working for citizens by generating millions in interest and dividends annually to add to the total annual value, total value of our savings. So let me put this in perspective too. Last Monday, Minister gleefully boasted after seven years of withdrawing, they finally deposited US $163 million into HSF. Do you know what that works out to be, Madam Speaker? That works out to the government having deposited to the HSF a paltry 6.5% of what they had withdrawn from the HSF over their term, their seven years. 6% of what you had in total withdrawn. I make it very clear, during my tenure, in an era of falling prices, Recognizing the need for intergenerational savings, my government had deposited US $1.2 billion. Do the maths. We deposited over 600% more than this PNM government. And guess what? We never withdrew a cent from the HSF. <clears throat> what does all of this mean? At the end of the day, it's about job creation, it's about joblessness, I turn now to the issue of unemployment. There remains a significant query about actual employment and underemployment in TNT. Based on NIB reports submitted in Parliament, some 113,000 persons with jobs contributing to the NIB in 2015 were no longer contributing in 2020. What does it mean? Does it mean they no longer have a job? Does it mean they died? What does it mean? 113,000 under my watch who were making contributions to the national insurance come 2020, no longer making contributions. There, this implies that 113,000 persons were added to the unemployment pool, although it, this was never reflected in CSO employment data which reported low unemployment levels. Interestingly, the NIB in 2021 changed the method of calculating the total insured contributors. And this is very suspicious, madam. The net result when it changed the method was that the figures are showing from 2015 to 21, 70,760 had lost jobs, no longer insured contributions. And this raises suspicions. There would be persons who would have dropped out because of death, etc., but new contributors would have also balanced this out. But here we are. If we accept the NIB, NIB, NIB narrative, and let us not forget the chairman of the NIB is, in our view, illegally handpicked and appointed by this government. Eh? According to NIB reports, the total contributors increased by 41,000 from June 2020 to June 2021. This is suspicious as it would mean in the height of lockdowns and business closures, 42,000 jobs were created. It just doesn't make sense. In the height of the lockdown, the figures are saying, look, 40 something, 42,000 people are now back on, 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 on the employment roll. Available CSO statistics also show a fall in the number of persons employed by 54,000 under this government. So that's why I'm saying it is very uncertain from the CSO and from the NIB um, what the real figures are. 
I want to make it very clear. This matter of joblessness has re received very little serious attention from the government over the last seven years. My government prioritized the creation of well-paying, sustainable jobs the creation of new initiatives designed to transform the economy away from the over-reliance on oil and gas, and the creation of training opportunities for students to develop and fill roles being opened up for them. In that five-year period, we were able to create 54,500 new jobs. And to maintain the jobs of those already in employment, and guess what, Madam Speaker? We did that without raising a single tax. In fact, we took tax off the food items, the VAT. We took the tax off 7,000 food items. Not a single tax was raised. And we were able to create 54,500 jobs. Why? Again, it has to do with the strategies, the policies, and programs of the Canadian government. It was based on a clear understanding that our citizens want opportunities to earn their livelihoods. They want to work for a living. They want to make a fair income for their work. But this government does not understand that. This government has been directly responsible for the loss of tens of thousands of jobs, from the closure of Petrotrin to the shutting down of state companies, to job losses in TSTT and elsewhere, and soon Wassa and the port and other places. The, if the minister proceeds with their plans, outlined in his budget statement, more job losses to come. The massive level of unemployment also has severe social consequences for current and future generations. Madam, I turn to the impact and the troubling status of the National Insurance Fund, which is that fund to help those in need. People contribute each week or each month, as it may be, so if and when they fall sick, if and when they have to get a punch pension, they would have, that was a contributory scheme that they could fall back upon. Today we are faced with an NIB, which is increasingly challenged because of the falling number of contributors and the rising value of disbursement, the value of disbursement. So falling numbers of people putting in, but you have to pay out more. Instead of dealing with this matter frontally, the minister's obsession has been to undermine the integrity of the NIB. I ask again, how can a person be a government nominee representing the minister and his government for years on that board. And overnight, he's appointed as chairman when the law requires him to be essentially independent of labor, business, and government. Again, political interference or the semblance of political interference. Same NIB, same national insurance, the decline in contribution income. The suspicion is bolstered by the fact that the NIB reported a decline in contribution income to the tune of 175.48.48 million to 4.5 in 2021. So the number of contributors increased, but the contribution value, value decreased by more than 175 million. Do the maths. How is this possible? Until Monday, I come to the issue, issue of inflation as a serious matter which is threatening the lives and livelihoods and survival of the families of Trinidad and Tobago. Until Monday, I thought everyone in this country would agree that prices had risen substantially, whether in transport, hardware items, clothing, entertainment, food, prices had risen. You could therefore appreciate my amazement when I heard the minister state on Monday, and I quote, inflation was kept at bay during the pre-COVID years at the very low level of 1% and has been trended upwards to 4.7% in 2022. Inflation was kept at bay. Is this a joke? Are you so out of touch with reality? How out of touch the minister must be to claim that inflation was at bay? And by the way, you know, madam, I believe his entire cabinet seems to be out of touch with reality. When one member who racks up $60,000 in monthly salary, bills roaming, bills in thousands of dollars, drinking almond milk and yogurt, and could glibly speak about sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? Shame, shame, shame. Another me member takes to Facebook to complain about being cut out 
of a picture in a newspaper. I mean, are you for real? Is this real? Are these the people who are running our country? Are these the people running our country? And then the Prime Minister talks about misbehaving. The only misbehavior I'm seeing as a part of that government, their cabinet, who have totally mismanaged the economy and put our citizens at risk. I tell them, wake up and smell the coffee. Come down from there. Face the reality. And what is that reality, Madam Speaker? If you do shopping for yourself sometimes, you would have seen it yourself. Food items, as I said before, no vat on them, rose in price by 12.5% in one heartbeat when they put VAT back onto those 7,000 food items. This government presided over several hikes in fuel prices, which caused increased prices in every single good or service with the transportation cost. The cost of manufactured products increased due to increased fees, due to runaway crime, higher costs of imported products, higher duties, and so on. And Mr. Sir and his cruelest government must be the only persons who don't know this. Maybe they don't go shopping for things in the market and in the grocery. They just don't know. I looked at the components of a typical basket of goods used in many homes in this country. I compared the prices of those products in September 2015, which is when I was last there, and September 2022, which is now, or just before. Well, yeah, today's the last day of September. And what I found is that some food items had increased by as much as 90% over the last seven years. Many of you, the houses will tell you, people tell you, some had increased by over 90%. An economy pack of chicken increased from $33.98 in 2015, now to $44.56, an increase of 31%. If you had a baby, you had to buy infant formula. One of the cheaper brands was priced at $165.41 for a 900 gram package. No, that has jumped to $223.21 this month. An overall price hike of 34 cents. The price of a two kilogram package of rice increased by 48% from 2015 under my watch at $18.21. You know what it is now, madam? $27.02, $27.02. The price of a two kilogram pack of flour increased by 50% over the seven years from $13.44 to $20.16. Smoke heron with bone raised by 57%. A container of table margarine increased by 90%. Bread, biscuits, soap, salt, Onion, garlic, macaroni, all increased in price over the last seven years. And the minister says they kept inflation at bay. The prices of fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, fish have also skyrocketed. The escalation in inflation and the effect on all goods and services produced, produced is, even more, is even more critical because the government has refused to settle wage negotiations. So the net effect is what? Salaries of employed persons' wages have been devalued because your purchasing power of your dollar has deteriorated, your wages have deteriorated because of this inflation. For pensioners, those on grants, this is especially difficult and will have resulted in a substantial fall in the standard of living of the working class, the underemployed, and the unemployed. And we'll come to in a moment, madam, the little handouts that the minister says he's going to give to help the poor and the people on social grants and so on. I'll come to that in a moment. So it is evident that this government believes its own narrative that the price impact of its policies has been low. This is why they have taken absolutely no action in any way in this budget including this budget, to deal with the increasing financial burdens that they are placing on the backs of our citizens. Remember, remember the poor. The poor have feelings too. 
And so I turned to the overdraft, and this is a very troubling matter, and I'll ask the minister to tell this country whether he broke the law by going over the legal amounts in the overdraft. Remember when they came into office? They said my government had maxed out the overdraft. They were running on fumes, and that was totally untrue. It was totally untrue. From the minister's own words, when the minister said in August this year, his budget speech, he reported current account balance would be in surplus. At the same time, citizens' accounts are negative. The minister omitted that the exchequer account as of 30 September 2021 was overdrawn by $42.6 billion, page 52 of the Auditor General's report 2021. As for the seven years he has been in power, the over overdraft facility was marked out, and he crossed the limit. When he became minister, he maxed out that facility, and that's why he came to Parliament. By Finance Act, 20, Act 2017, he came, the minister came, and the government in, came and increased the overdraft limit from 15% to 20%. So when he couldn't take out any more, because the limit was 15%, he then increased the limit so he could take out more, take out more on the overdraft. What was shocking about the minister's presentation is he admitted that he had crossed his overdraft limit. I quote the minister on the spotlight. I quote, sometimes we had to tell the central bank, central bank, just ease up a little bit. Sometimes we went over the overdraft by 1% in the 2016, 2018 period. This is the minister, the great spotlight. Sometimes we had to tell the central bank, just ease up a little bit. Sometimes we went over the overdraft by 1% in 2016 to 2018 period. Is it here that the minister is confessing that he broke the law because the overdraft facility is prescribed by law? Section 46 of the Central Bank Act, which governs this overdraft facility, provides that the bank can only advance, with the increased limit now, but the minister had changed, advance 20% of the estimated annual revenues of the government. The effort is illegal if the minister is responsible for get, taking out anything above the 20% overdraft. The fact that the minister had to break the law shows the level of desperation due to the financial incompetence and fiscal ineptitude of this government. The minister must be held accountable. Now that exchequer account has been overdrawn since 2003. When the minister took office in 2015, the account was overdrawn by 20.1 billion. Note, 2015, when he came into office, 20.1 billion. In 21, on his watch, the account is now overdrawn by $42.6 billion. They have overdrawn the account by $22.5 billion and have little to show for it. Little to show for it. And um, all of this review of the economy, the state of the economy under this government can be compared, really starkly compared, to the state of the economy under the government I led. In our five years in government, we invested in people, projects, and we could show development in every sector. I ask today, given the state of the economy, which I said you've placed the economy on a deathbed. It's not just unhealthy, it's on a deathbed. What are the measures in this budget to transform and revitalize the economy? Where are the measures for dealing with increased prices, especially food prices? The economy under the UNC-led government moved from minus 4.4% in 2009 to recovery and growth by early 2021. 
we left the highest levels of foreign reserves ever, US $10.46 billion, with 11 months import cover. We left sizable sums in the HSF, which I mentioned before. And as we are not HSF, you know, the minister on Monday boasted about putting money into the HSF. But what the minister did not tell us what is, what is the NEV, what is the net asset value of that HSF today? I quoted a number that I was advised it was at a certain level, which means that it plummeted from where it was in 2015. I think the minister must tell the country, what is the net asset value of that HSF today? And why, and why it has plummeted? There was a report recently that was down by $1.84 billion. Minister, you owe the country duty to be honest and tell the country what is the NAV in the HSF today. And um, yes, I think it's only when uh, MP Charles sent a pre-action letter, the minister hastened to come to parliament to tell us that he had deposited money, but the minister still has not told us what is the net asset value in that HSF. So is that another breach of the law? Are you not supposed to lay a report in Parliament? And would you want us to send another pre-action letter before you do so? I go back, we had a low debt to GDP of 45%. In a five years in office, we tripled foreign direct investment in TNT. It was at 500 million when we went into office and over time, Increased to 1.5, not million, 1.5 billion dollars. Since then, under this government, there has been no FDI. Instead, there's outflows, outflows, not inflow of FDI, no foreign direct investment coming in, but going out. That's where this incompetent government has taken us. That helped us to shield. Sorry, we worked to diversify the diversified economy. We grew non-energy real GDP by $6.45 billion or 12%. That, and that also helped us to shield us from the energy price shocks, the energy price fluctuations. We raised the minimum wage not once, we raised it twice from $9 to $12.50 and then to $15. And as I said before, we created over 54,000 jobs we brought the unemployment rate from the 10% we had met down to 3%. That was the work we did. Today I say, without fear of contradiction, we built the economy, we improved the quality of life of our citizens, and we will do that again when we form the next government. Now every year, every budget, there's a segment in a budget statement. And in fact, if you take one budget statement to the other, the table of contents is almost identical. You'll find the same words. And one of these recurring nightmares is the heading, institutional building. Institutional building. Now this government has done the most to retard the independence and integrity of institutions from his control of the central bank to compromising of the office of the president, the illegal appointment of the new NIB chairman, the interference of the police service commission, the lack of implementation of procurement legislation, and the list goes on. So on the institutional building, the minister lists procurement. Institutional building each year, procurement, procurement, recurring broken promises. Every year, promise implementation of the procurement legislation. According to the chairman of the Office of Procurement, Leg Le procurement Regulator, Munilal Lalchan, not Rudal Munilal, Munilal Lalchan. <laughs> I don't know if they're related. Um, <laughs> on the 14th of January, 2020, the procurement regulator, regulator stated that TNT lose a conservative figure of 5.2 billion per year on corruption. 
which he said could have been used to deliver better health care. So, he didn't say it, but better health care and education, but he said it could have been used for schools, um, settling salary and wage negotiations, for all the goodies in the public sector. This meant that we would have lost $36.4 billion to corruption over the last seven years because this government refuses and continues to refuse to implement the Procurement Act that is sitting on the law books since 2015, which my government had passed. But we should have known, because when we brought that bill to Parliament in our time in office, they walked out of the JSC. They didn't want to participate in the JSC and so on. So they were never in favor of procurement legislation. It's clear they are still not, because seven years later, they have failed to proclaim that piece of legislation. And the amounts of money is lost to corruption. Every dollar lost to corruption is a dollar that could feed a child, a dollar could buy textbooks, a dollar could buy laptops. But no, they do not want to do it. For seven years, they delayed in bringing the regulations to Parliament. Now the regulations have been passed. But guess what? A new reason for delay now. First they said, we have to get the regulations passed. We cannot proclaim this, you know. But now, what is it? They now say that the new AG has to review the work of the fire AG. Another delaying tactic. And somehow the Chief Justice gets embroiled in, in, in sending some piece of paper to the new Attorney General, which they will not disclose to the population and use that now to say they cannot implement the procurement law. They will not procure. They will not do it. And I notice, um, there's some money for a house for somebody in the budget estimates. You know? Somebody's getting a lot of money for a house. I call no names. For seven years, they delayed. For seven budgets, we heard, heard about the Procurement Act to be operationalized. But this year was different. This was a repeat, repeat. This year, guess what? It was not mentioned at all in the four-hour presentation. 180 pages speech, not a word about procurement. It has vanished. It has vanished off the face of the earth. They have no intention of bringing procurement legislation. None. So it was mama guy, when the minister speaks about institutional strengthening, because this was one of the aspects of institutional strengthening. Today, I give the commitment that when the UNC forms the next government, we will move swiftly to proclaim the Procurement Act. And in spite of all the delay, delay seven years, you know what they also did, madam? The government gutted the procurement legislation. They removed billion dollar contracts from being scrutinized. They removed from it, they came and watered it down during these seven years, and they're still not happy, you know, even though they watered it down so much. They still don't want to put it into place. They changed the law so it would not apply to the disposal of state lands. Are we disposing of the Karani lands? Are we disposing of the Petrotrin lands? To whom and how? To whom and how? Are we, why don't we want this to be scrutinized? The government, the country needs to know to whom these lands will be sold, leased, given away. So they can see, they, 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 they took it out so they could sell cheaply to their friends, family, and financiers. <coughs> they can now give contracts because they took away this from the law, contracts to their lawyers and bankers because the law no longer applies to legal services, financial services, auditing services, accounting services, and medical services. Not to be scrutinized. These contracts are not to be scrutinized under the procurement legislation. So they're spending your money, but they don't want you to know to whom it is going. Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. We know about some financial services in the tune of millions to billions of dollars that these contracts are going to a relative, a family member of a cabinet minister. We know of it. Ministers who recuse themselves umpteen times from the, from the, from the cabinet. These should be open to public scrutiny under the law. This is, in our democracy, it is not government by secrecy. It is not and should not be. 
And now in this budget, madam, they talk about public-private partnerships. Several of them, billion-dollar deals, but they had taken that out of the procurement law. So they can enter into public-private partnerships with family, friends, and finances, finances without the scrutiny of the procurement legislation. It's because they gutted it and took it out. Budget 2020 speaks to many such projects for public-private partnerships. I want to ask again to tell you, ask yourself why. So no procurement legislation, millions of dollars going into corruption, and what's happening? You cannot buy laptops for our children. You can, cannot put medicine for the CDAP in the hospitals. You can in the hospitals or in the CBAP, CDAP. You cannot provide textbooks for the children. You cannot set a wage negotiations. You cannot help the poor. But you are getting million, billion dollar contracts without scrutiny. This is intolerable. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Ashamed of yourselves. You know, I want to ask the member for a REMA. We had the fortunate circumstance of attending the law school together. Very decent lady. I want to ask you, member, will you be voting for these policies and programs? These wicked policies and programs that bring hardship on the poor? I'll ask attorney Scotland, will you be voting for these programs and policies that are wreaking hardship on people? We'll wait to see. Will you be talked? Will you do that? Or do you have a conscience or a heart that you will stand for the poor people and the most vulnerable in the country. So, procurement on the institutional building. As I said, this government has no interest in building independent uh, institutions with integrity. Another repeating, repeating promise under building institutions is the National Statistical Institute. This non-performing government keeps making prom this promise year after year, and this year was no different. In fact, the minister did speak about this one on Monday in his statement. Like a broken record, minister comes year after year, he promises to, the government will implement the National Statistical Institute. Since 2016, and again repeated in 2023 budget. Year after year, the government continues to make critical decisions without any proper data. In last year's budget, we were told that it would bring the law to parliament, but it did not. What are the facts here? Because there the, the, seem to be a body of persons who want to blame the opposition for the failure of this piece of legislation to be passed in the parliament. Let, let me give you the facts, madam. That NSI, NSI, National Statistical Institute, bill was laid June 2018 in the third session of the 11th Parliament. There was no debate on the bill for the entire session. Thereafter, in the fourth session, after many months, the bill was debated on the 1st February 2019 and then referred to a joint select committee. The committee did not complete its work in the fourth session. So it was carried over to the fifth session. On the 2nd October 2019, the Joint Select Committee was given until the 31st December to report to the Parliament. The JSC never completed its work and never reported to the Parliament. Coming down now to 2020, on the 3rd July 2020, the Parliament was dissolved and that bill lapsed. There was never a final report of JSC. There was no debate on the bill from the JSC and no vote was ever taken. We are now in the second section, session of the 12th parliament and no bill is in sight. None has been laid. None has been laid. So government has deliberately stifled the bill and some want to blame the opposition. The Minister of Finance shamelessly has the nerve to come to Parliament again and promise this um, NSI. While we understand that there needs to be a modernization of the CSO, the creation of any alternative body 
must be an independent body, free from the control and influence of politicians. And this is so vital because you don't want a politician or politicians tell them what statistics to print. Because then <coughs> they will come every year and say, turn around, they can see clearly there's growth, there's recovery, uh, everything is booming, things are great. You have to have an independent statistical body in a country to get data that you can rely upon and then you can use, you can be data driven in making your policies and programs. So we understand that we need to have a modernized statistical office. This year, the minister jabs, then jabs, he hopes the opposition supports the law. Let me tell you, sir, and tell the government, we will support the NSI, but we had concerns with the bill, the original one, and if these concerns are not addressed, you will not get our support. Our concerns including that the minister had too much involvement in the NSI in that bill, where it was proposed that the minister appoint all six members on the board of the NSI. How can you expect any reason, right thinking person to support that, where the minister will appoint all the members of the statistical board? Then the minister calls up and says, listen, we'll get a growth rate of 20%, is it? Listen, predict we'll get gas production up by 100%, oil production. No, you must have an independent statistical institute. So we could not support that. We could not support it. Second, the process of appointing the director, the power and jurisdiction of the director, and the defined relationship with the relationships with the board and other entities required greater clarity. Thirdly, financing for, financing for independence and autonomy, a direct fiscal alloc allocation for the NSIT. NSIT. You can't go begging cap in hand, as so many other ministries and people do. I take some ministers even say, they're not getting no money from the Minister of Finance. Not getting no money. They should have an independent vote, fiscal allocation to keep their independence. There were many other, more, there were many other issues, but as I say, the opposition is willing to support, provided that the concerns are met. And it's not only the opposition who has raised concerns about this um, minister's political influence over the Statistical Institute. Retired statistician, statistician Lance Busby lamented in a Loop TT article after reviewing the bill, that there needs to be more autonomy for the institute. This government is not serious about improving data collection in the country. All talk and no action, and no institutional building in this regard. Another area for institutional building is the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority. The minister spends a lot of time talking about the TTRA, Seems he finds joy, as I say, in taxing the population. Uh, by Act 17 of 2021, this is what happened. The government unscrupulously removed the special majority. Order. I rise on standing order 49, please. Thank you for the break. This is under challenge. This is under challenge. All right. So, um, member, I, I'll allow you a little leeway, but if this is under challenge, please don't go into any depth with respect to, to this matter. I am guided, Madam Speaker. Um, so, the minister removed the special majority, and that has become a modus operandi of the government. We will bring a bill that requires a special majority, they remove the special majority clause, and then pass it. Um, that is why I will not use the word again, but that is why I, I find something is, is wrong with, with operating in that manner. But if that's how the government operates, that's how it operates. So the government removed the special majority requirement, 
and with a razor thin majority in the parliament, they passed the TTRA Act. The government paid no heed or regard for the constitution. They have removed the independence of the Board of the Inland Revenue and substituted it with a Member, political handpicked revenue Member, authority. And, and, and that's what I was trying to guide you away from. So that, because that is, is, is the challenge. So up to before you embarked on this, it was okay. Please go on to something else. Okay, madam, I thought they were objected to the word unscrupulously. Because that's all I had said up to that point. I had said the minister unscrupulously removed the majority. And, 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 and the and, challenge and, came at that point. And, and, and then you went on to the issue about the constitutionality. So please leave that and go on. Thank you. So what we object to in this um, matter is the fact that uh, we're talking about institutional building. And so under that TTRA Act, the independence of the Board of Inland Revenue has been removed. That is our respectful view. But what and is wrong with that? That is my view. I, I, How is it unparliamentary? No, it's not unparliamentary. We're under the sub-judicial standing order. Okay, and, and that is the whole basis. Okay. So please go on to something else. Okay, so we are saying we are not happy with the provisions of the TTRA Act, and it doesn't seem in our view something for institutional building. Is that acceptable? That is my respectful view. We have already placed our position on record that we are not in support of the TTRA. We note that government has now found $20 million allocated in the estimates for fiscal 2023 to establish the TTRA and again cannot find money to help the poor people of this land. We are of the view that we should strengthen the capacity of the BIR so that it will become more efficient. I know that the government, any government wants to collect taxes. So we should strengthen the BIR and not interfere with it. So, Madam, as I move on, the minister admitted in this budget, due to administrative changes implemented at the BIR, they have increased revenue collection in the non-energy sector by 1% of GDP, or 1.5 billion, without that TTRA. Therefore, we can improve tax collection in the country with strengthening of the BIR. I turn now to another aspect of institutional uh, strengthening, the property tax. Again, the minister comes to tell us that this year he's going to implement the property tax. Minister said that they're busy updating the valuation rules to ensure that citizens take out what little money they have to give to the government. They have raised gas, they raised the cost of living, food prices are soaring, and now persons will have to dip deeper into their pockets to pay property tax. There will be a corresponding increase, uh, Madam Speer, again, in the cost of living, in renters, and so on. In 2009, when things were not as bad as now, the Honorable Member for Diego Martin West, I see he's not in the chamber, the Honorable Member for Diego Martin West, when he was fighting the then Prime Minister, he said this, Newsday 20th, December 2009, and I quote, and this was about the property tax then. In my constituency, there is anger, anxiety, and resentment at both ends of the spectrum. Stop taking your own advice that nobody is annoyed. The member advised the government. He said they have brought the tax at the worst possible time, alluding to tough economic times. The member repeatedly said that people were not against the idea of paying taxes, but they were upset that this measure could have been adverted if the government had acted differently previously in this expenditure. Rejecting claims that the property tax wouldn't cause hardship, the member said, for the member for the Guatemala West, I know a lot of people for whom $100 is a lot of money, a lot are struggling to make ends meet. Prime Minister, people are struggling to make ends meet. The economic times are worse now, 
review this tax, withdraw this property tax. Now is not the time. Now is not the time to implement the property tax. And therefore, if the government had operated differently in the expenditure patterns and in the revenue earning streams to gain revenue, this would not have become necessary at this time. Digital transformation is another aspect of judicial um, institutional strengthening. On Monday, the minister repeated the failed and broken promises of a fully digitized society by 2025. Now, there's a late, the latest buzzword, everything is digital, digitalization, digital, <laughs> a digital society, a digital society uh, by 2025. This is what the minister told us. Instead of reporting to the nation on how far the government had reached with becoming a fully digitized society, we heard excuse after excuse as to why none of the products in ICTs had been completed or even started in most instances. The minister abandoned his previous announcements for business development, outsourcing centers, cybercrime legislation, completed e links and job creation in this industry. Instead, the minister focused on creating a cashless society and a fintech ecosystem hub, both of which we have heard about before in previous budgets, but with no results up to this time. The minister spoke about the benefits of these two projects while partnering with government majority owned TSTT to make it a reality. This is the same TSTT, madam, that up to a few months ago, they could not receive payments for phone and internet bills at their own outlets due to the collapse of internal software, security, and hardware systems that took them weeks to resolve. But this is the same TSTT, TSTT government wants to partner with for this project. What is even more shocking, madam, is that the Ministry of Digital Transformation is not digitized. It is often said that the devil is in the details. Let's look at page 163 of the 2023 draft of the estimates of the development program. We know that after two financial years have elapsed, the governor places an allocation of $3 million for this ministry of digital transformation. And yes, you heard me right. According to the budget documents, this ministry has not been digitized since it was created two years ago. So do we have any hope for the rest of the country and the other ministries? It demonstrates the government's lack of political will and commitment. As I say, it is nothing more than a charade and a sham, and nothing more than clickbaiting. The minister has mastered the art of what is referred to by the techies alike as clickbait, and this is true in this area of this ministry. I want to spend a little time now, madam, because the minister talked a lot about the fiscal measures in his um, budget presentation. I would like to spend a few minutes on those, um, because at first glance, they appear to be very good things. And yes, in some instances, they are. But again, the devil is in the details. First of all, I want to um, say that government plans to collect from taxpayers $40.5 billion in tax revenue. So out of the taxpayers, they're going to collect, that's their projection, $40.5 billion in revenue from the revenue estimates at page Roman 7 of the estimates book. And they plan to take over $1 billion from the increased fuel prices. Well, what do they offer instead? Some measly fiscal handouts. Nothing in these incentives appear to be part of a comprehensive plan for making specific sectors more competitive and they just amount to tinkering with the economy. First, the proposed increase in personal income tax allowance amounts to just $4.10 per day. You cannot even buy a doubles, far less a beacon shock. To make matters worse, the minister demonstrated how out of touch he was 
by stating that this $4.10 increase per day would help offset the increase in fuel prices. Were you taking over a billion dollars through increased fuel prices from taxpayers? This is ludicrous, since fuel prices affect the cost of virtually every product or service citizens must purchase. Just as his colleagues chastised citizens for not making sacrifices, they now realize they were never in charge of anything I know they cannot deal with it. The Minister of Finance and his government are also not in charge and they cannot deal with the economy or manage the economy. Another fiscal measure the Minister mentioned was the increase in the VAT threshold. And this has a negative effect on businesses who wish to participate in the VAT regime. Instead, the government should have provided enhanced technical support to enable companies to comply and participate in the, in the scheme. This increase in the VAT threshold has two knockout or knock-on effects. It is an insignificant, insignificant measure given that companies earning just under 42,000 per month must participate. So this has been increased to a minimum of 50,000 per month. What it means is that companies who will no longer be able to get VAT refunds because they're no longer in meeting the threshold will not be able to claim MAGVAT. So again, the smaller companies are going to suffer. They will not, even though they pay VAT on things, they cannot claim back that, that VAT. The re renewable energy rebate is aimed at the larger commercial farms, not small farmers. Small farmers are not in a position to invest thousands of dollars in solar energy or wind energy, as the case may be. And this is what the renewable energy rebate is, is for. Farmers are saying you can now apply for a rebate, not for money, for a rebate to build uh, solar plants, wind plants, and so on. They're not good. They can barely make ends meet. And they are the bedrock of sales in various markets. If I'm small farmers cannot do this. So this is aimed at whom? The big farmers, not the small farmers in the country. As for the apprenticeship program, that's a joke. The existing on-the-job training program offers the same service to an even wider group of participants between the ages of 16 to 35. However, Government has callously reduced the OJT program by almost 50% instead of enhancing and strengthening that OJT program. So you will see, as of June 2015, when we left office, there was a total of 7,533 trainees under the program, the OJT program. Under this government, as of July this year, they have been reduced to 4,070 active trainees participating. Then when we look at the allocations, there has been a 36 million reduction in actual expenditure for this program. This government decreased from $308 million in 2015 when I demitted office down to $271 million in 2021. So in two ways, this is, this is a joke because you have the OJT for a wider pool of persons. You have not been supporting that program. You have been underfunding that program. I know you want to set up another apprenticeship program. I don't think you're serious at all, and this will go the way of all the other promises that have been made. We come to the manufacturing tax credit. Again, I think this is nonsense, if I may use that word, nonsense. No one would invest five or $10 million because the manufacturer would get back a 50,000 tax credit. So it doesn't make sense. Further, this will not be of value to companies with tax losses. They will have absolutely no value. The fact that this is a one-time measure will only benefit those companies that have been lucky to be resilient against the onslaught of COVID lockdowns. 6,000 business closures and loss of market opportunities have already occurred. The tax incentives for upstream and deep water production 
is not going to cause anyone to accelerate their plans for the sector. The incentives in the energy sector will not have a significant impact, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The tax credit for financial providers does not make sense. They require more details in, in, in how it will work. Minister says it's to help develop a digital economy. And um, the minister raised fuel prices again. No concern, as I said, for ordinary citizens. And then he comes with a Mama Guy grant. He said, I'm going to give you a $1,000 fuel grant for persons earning under $7,500 a month, register at BIR or NIB. And Mr. is saying he's going to give back in total $240 million to Cicero. But he's taking back, as I say, over um, one billion from the same citizenry in return. So you can fill your tank with this thousand dollars, madam. Maybe you can jump and fill your tank three times, the thousand dollars. And another point, this does not kick in until next year, but if fuel prices kicked in, on the very day the minister read the budget. Very day. So I, I guess you can apply for this thousand dollars, but let's be reminded that um, there's still so many people who are waiting on COVID grants. So these applicants will have to jump through all the hoops in order to try to access this grant. I wish them good luck. <coughs> Excuse me. Another um, fiscal measure that sounds good on paper, but again doesn't match the reality, is with respect to the GATE program. Minister is providing, promising to expand the GATE program to provide tuition assistance for students who have already accessed GATE at the diploma, associate degree, or lower TVET level to pursue baccalaureate level degree programs. Page 173, budget statement, 2023. But let's be real, Minister. There has been no increase in the estimates of expenditure for GATE for fiscal 2023. None. So where are we going to get the monies? Are you going to come in a midterm and via and supplement and so on? No estimates. So I think I think this was just a promise to make people feel good. I'm giving out a handle. No money estimated for this um, for 23. And that estimate remains the same as it was last year. So where's the increased money going to come from for this increase minister talking about? How exactly does government intend to fund this expansion of the gate program? Will they cut back on funding for the current number of beneficiaries, that is to give less of them, to service this expansion? It's another example of government's use, as I say, of clickbait and mamagai to deceive the population. Further, this government has a goal to boast about expanding gate after they discontinued that program in 2020 for postgrad students, making tertiary education unaffordable and inaccessible to thousands of students. Additionally, under this government, the number of students benefiting from gate drop decreased by an astonishing 68% compared to when my government was in office. You've cut the program. You've closed the gate on so many young people. In June 2015, under my government, there were 59,605 students benefiting from the GATE program. 59,605 students. In 2022, this number has dropped to 40,464. You've closed the GATE on about 19,141 students. And you want us to believe that you are going to expand the GATE program as described in your budget statement. I don't believe you. I do not believe you, the evidence does not point to that. Further, there has been a reduction of $1 billion in actual expenditure for this program, decreasing from 3.3 billion, 3.3 billion, we spent $3.3 billion on GATE. You know why? Because we believe education is the passport out of poverty. We still believe that. Education is the only way to a better quality of life. Many of us sitting here know that. And that is why we invested heavily in education. So we spent $3.3 billion in 2015 
And today, when they come into office, 2015, they've dropped it to $2 billion under the, the present government, 2016 to 2020. So can we believe you? Do we believe this minister is going to expand that gate? No. They've shut the gate on so many young people, not just in um, shut education, not just then. Education we'll talk about, and MB Haynes will deal a lot more on the whole education sector, but we don't believe you. And then the minister in fiscal measures talks about some nuisance taxes to raise revenue, again putting more pressure on already pressured population. I guess the greatest nuisance tax must be what is about the fifth fuel price increase since the government came to office. They have raised the price of gas so many times, fuel so many times, that driving is no longer within the reach of so many persons. Apart from the extra cost to drivers, there are already announcements of price increases by taxi drivers due to the cost of fuel to their operations. The recent reports of food price increases will be updated as some distributors are already stating that the accountants will inform, will ha have informed that the 13% increase in diesel will result in an increase of 1% to 3% on total costs. So going to put an extra cost on the price of food and other goods and services. Because of this, there will be the expectation of varying food price increases over the coming weeks for all food items. The impact of a further 1% to 3% price increase for food means that a family who would have paid between 1,000 to 2,000 per month in groceries can now expect an increase in costs ranging from 10 to $20 on the low end and 30 to 60 on the upper end, all because of the fuel price increase. This doesn't take into account other things like property taxes and so on. The fuel price increase also hurts our fishermen. Fishermen in Cedrus and Otaheite Bay say the recent price hike in gas, diesel, and kerosene will put many of them out of jobs. At Fullerton Beach in Cedrus on Wednesday, fisherman Rakesh Ramda said, fisher folk were shocked that there had been another fuel hike so soon after the last one. He added that fisher folk may have no choice but to moor their boats and find alternative arrangements. At Otaheite, Fishermen also expressed despair and hopelessness. Ramcharan Partap said after the government increased the fuel prices earlier this year, fisher folk tried to cope by purchasing kerosene engines, which were cheaper to fill. But now, with kerosene also increasing by $1, Partap says they may soon be unable to go fishing. He said fishermen from Cedrus and Maruga were facing an even more difficult time, particularly those with gasoline engines. So these incentives, in my respectful view, are a continuation of the mamagai. They can't help themselves. They're just tinkering with no clear thinking or vision and understanding of what needs to be done. These unnecessary fuel price hikes will bring immense pain and suffering to already burdened citizens. The cost to fill up your tank, though. I am told that for a 40-liter sedan, for example, like a Tida, Using super, this year alone rose from $199 to now $279, an increase of $80 each fill up. Diesel for 60 liters from $204 to $265, an increase of $61 each fill up. The monthly bill for the average person who fills their tank once per week will rise from $795 to $1,115 for super, an increase of $320 every month in this year alone. For diesel, it will increase from $818 per month to $1,058 per month, an increase of 240 every month this year. Now we must remember that for drivers using super gas in 2015, their monthly bill would have been $432. Now they're being asked to pay 120% more, or $683 every month. This will bring really severe suffering on an already suffering um, population. The government must reverse this measure with immediate effect. We call on the government to reverse the fuel price hike.
immediate, immediate, immediate effect. And as we talk about that fuel price and the subsidy, I will now turn, Madam, to some of the sectoral areas. As I say, my colleagues will develop more on those areas. I turn to the energy sector. Minister was very clear that the energy sector is a cornerstone of the community, of the country, and I believe it. It is the economy's engine, and partly because, yes, it is, we, have a, we used to have a competitive advantage in that era, but, and also because this government has failed to provide any other revenue streams, so we remain dependent on the energy sector to generate revenue streams, to generate foreign exchange. The global, global commerce and travel rebound in 2021, the Russia-Ukraine war has led, to, um, led the world into a period of high oil, natural gas, and ammonia prices. These high prices are directly responsible for the increase in revenue, government experience, in fiscal 2022. We should note, however, that oil and gas prices in recent weeks have been falling on fears of a global recession. Further speculation surrounding a pot potential OPEC output cut next week resulted in markets settling yesterday at prices generally below the US $90 per barrel, the minister projected. This alone merits a reduction in the target price in the budget. If the government keeps the budgeted oil price at that level, it is now then one, is now, then one can only conclude they're doing so to enable them to raid the HSF once more in fiscal 22. Reuters noted yesterday, and I quote, Brent crude futures settled down 83 cents at 88.49 per barrel after rising as high as $90.12 during the session. U.S. crude futures for November settled 92 cents lower at $81.23 a barrel. So it would be wise, Madam, to temper expectations of windfall extending into 2023. As was made clear by the many graphs presented at the September Spotlight event, even with these high energy prices in 2022, government revenue is not back to 2014 or 2015 levels. The minister based the budget on an oil price of $92.50 per barrel and $6 per MMBTU for gas. While these are the highest price assumptions ever used in preparing a budget, the ex expected revenue for fiscal 23 still does not equate to what was collected by my government in fiscal 14 and 15, when total government revenue was 58.4 billion and 57.7 billion, 57.2 billion respectively. It is reasonable to assume that the minister selected these high price assumptions to avoid having to make deposits deposit into the HSF. Now, I mentioned before there is decline in every metric, and this is uh, especially so in the energy sector. Why is our revenue not back to its highest levels, in spite of the highest price assumptions? The answer is because of our falling level of production in oil and gas. There has been a consistent decline in the production of oil and natural gas in Trinidad and Tobago under this government. The fact that natural gas production has fallen to lows last seen 19 years ago did not get the attention of the minister at all. Nothing was talked about that. In the last seven years, natural gas production has fallen by 32%. On every measure, in every metric, the evidence is refutable that the energy sector has declined, and decline has not been marginal. It has been substantial decline in the energy sector. decline in the sector excuse me, is a direct is directly related to the policies of those on the opposite bench to the PNM 
The decline is directly the result of the work of the PNM. That has been that has had direct consequences for all people of Trinidad and Tobago, especially we talk about the man or the woman on the maxi taxi. Any man or woman on that maxi taxi, the ordinary man, has really severe consequences because of the failure and decline of the energy sector, which Minister said was a cornerstone. I have said this engine of the community, of the country. So if you're declining, then it's going to pack every single thing in the country. From 2015 to 2021, CSO data indicates that the economy contracted by 19.4% 19 19 and half of that GDP contraction came from a declining energy sector. The energy sector declined by 28.8% in terms of real GDP from 2015 to 2021. Now get this right, the energy sector has declined by 28.8% from 2015. Regarding employment in that energy sector, we talk about job loss and a lost decade. Regarding employment in the energy sector, CSO data in quarter three 2015, we are told that there were 22,500 persons with jobs in the energy sector under my watch. By quarter one, 2022, that figure collapsed to 10,600. In seven years, a 53% decline in persons with jobs in the energy sector. What a shame, thanks to that PNM government on the other side. So where have these people gone? I am told that many have migrated to Canada, others seeking jobs. Um, some have found jobs in Ghana and Suriname. And it's a worrying sign of the decay of the energy sector. It just goes beyond, it goes beyond the tragedy of the closure of Petrochrin. These are not numbers from the opposition, the numbers I'm giving you are numbers from the CSO in the quarterly labor force survey bulletin. Our energy sector professionals are fleeing the reign of the incompetence of this PNM government and that Minister of Energy. The period 2015 to 2025 will become known as the lost decade of Trinidad and Tobago economy under the, under the energy sector, under the PNM government. In decline, in the contraction, we have seen plan closures, many plan closures under this government. I mentioned the closure of Petrotrain, and by the way, that no four-year closure of a once proud refinery. What has happened with that refinery? We're supposed to sell that refinery to someone. What has happened? We don't know anything further about it. The last time we heard, there was a buyer, then the buyer disappeared. Somebody up in the United States somewhere. So, after four years of closure of the refinery, is it now a case of buying scrap iron or old battery buying? The pace of the refinery closure The case of the refinery closure must be prosecuted. I must get to the bottom of that decision, decision and determine who is the owner of that tragic decision. Who put the light out at Petrotrin? We must come to the bottom of that. Today in a world of great supply chain uncertainty, we have to import gasoline, diesel, and jet fuels. And so that's the closure from Petrotrin. We also had the closure of the metal steel complex in 26 lane. That was the first industrial sin of this government. Then there was a the closure of Proman M1 plant in 2017. Then there was a the closure of Yara ammonia plant in 2019. The closure of the Titan methanol plant in 2020. And now infamous closure of train one in 2020. Plant closure, shame. Shame in competence of the PNM government. The closure of these plans has led to the idling of billions of dollars in capital in the energy sector. Idling, these plans are just sitting there. As I mentioned before, related job losses. The mother of all ironies is a minister of energy appearing on CNN's Quest Means Business. 
quest means business. And boasted that we will ramp up natural gas production to meet a shortfall created by the Russian-Ukraine war. Wow. We reach, as they say. Trini reach. And while the minister was saying that, ammonia, methanol, LNG plants right here in TNT could not get the volumes of natural gas they needed. Train one had to be shut down because they couldn't get the gas. And the minister is boasting. We're going to supply gas on the world market because of about false, false, false dreams. The minister is obviously dreaming or is not aware of the reality in the energy sector. And so despite flying to Houston, London, Zurich, The Hague, Doha, and parts unknown over the last seven years, and meeting with international energy companies, the reality is our natural gas production has not improved but has fallen. The situation would have been much worse had it not been for the natural gas projects I mentioned before that were initiated under the government I led. It would have been much worse. The current level of supply cannot meet the total demand of all customers in the country. And it is for that reason we have had planned closures, understand it? It's not because anybody is wicked or bad mind or anything. It is because your, 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 your policies and your projects and your programs have all failed to keep the energy sector going. You have failed. Just last week, Fertecon, an international ammonia publication by IHS Market, reported, and I quote, the supply of natural gas to industrial consumers in Trinidad is curtailed currently reportedly by around 25%. Curtailed, you know what I mean? Cut down. The impact on ammonia output isn't crystal clear. Though operations and nutrient plants at Point Lisa are said to have been up and down. Mess where are you getting this gas? Where are you getting these energy products to sell on the world market? Were you truthful when you spoke to that CNN people on that program? Because you have not the capacity, nor the ability, nor the competence to, to do so. So in spite of the glowing rhetoric, in spite of the trips abroad, abroad Point Lisas and Atlantic continue, continue to limp along. In the 21-22 budget speech, Minister boasted that oil production was on the rebound. He said natural gas production was improving. He said natural, and I quote, natural gas production would rise to 3.37 billion standard cubic feet in 2022. Nothing is further from the truth, nothing. He then said it would stabilize at 3.60 billion standard cubic feet. All of this is just pie in the sky, wishful thinking. The minister comes in 2022, he gives a conservative forecast for 23 of 3 billion cubic feet per day. And given his well-established track record of wrongly forecasting natural gas production, one could assume those numbers he's given are also on the thread. But the unfortunate reality is totally, reality is totally different from the fanciful imaginations of the government. The unfortunate reality is that this government has facilitated the decline of natural gas production. And you know why? Because it reversed the suite of incentives that had been put in place by my government. That's what happened. They reversed it and had no idea what to do except to tinker, as I say, here and there. The PNM is now in its eighth year of government and must take the blame for the condition of the energy sector, especially the unacceptable levels of last natural gas production. They must take the blame. Seven years going eight, don't stop blaming Kamala, stop blaming Ukraine and Russia. Blame yourselves for your failure to manage the sector. Last year, the minister said, Oil and condensate production would increase to 86,000 barrels per day in 2022. Another untruth. I know I can't say lie, but this is another untruth. Did not increase. 
for the first eight months of 22, oil con and condensate production averaged 59,000 barrels per day. What did the minister say? 86,000 barrels. Average, 59,000. What a big difference. Yet again, the minister is wrong. Last year, the minister bet heavily on the Woodside BHP Ruby project, but that project disappointed greatly. So you didn't get the gas from there. Broken promises on fiscal reform. So what, what is the problem? Why do we continue to have falling oil production and falling gas production in Trinidad and Tobago? I wonder if those on the other side remember and they officially hung their heads in shame that we were so blessed, blessed in this country to have one of the oldest oil industries in the world, over 100 years old, and you put the light out on that industry. You have decimated the energy sector. You have placed the entire nation at risk because you don't seem to have an idea or a clue of what to do. What is the source of this decline? Talk to people in the industry. Do you talk to anyone? Talk to people in the industry. That's what I do. I'm not an energy expert, but I talk to people who are in the industry, and they will tell you it is all due to what they call above ground factors all due to what they call above ground factors. The fiscal regime that underpins the energy sector is the main deterrent to the levels of investment needed to increase production of oil and natural gas. It is a fiscal reform that you promised repeatedly and failed to honor. Before 2010, the oil and gas industry told the then Manning administration that there was a need for reform of the fiscal regime. From 2011 to 2015, we met with a lot of the oil companies when we formed the government, and they, they, they asked for the fiscal reform. And because of that, we introduced a range of incentives, including harmonizing the SPT, Supplemental Petroleum Tax, increasing cost recovery levels for deep water, and introducing accelerated capital incentives for development drilling and exploration drilling. The accelerated allowances for exploration drilling caused BP to drill two exploration wells in 2017. So it was not because of you. It was because of the accelerated allowance for exploration that were given by the government that I led. These wells were successful. One of them, the Savannah well, gave us the Matapal project. The other gave the Macadamia project. And as part of the SIP project, the minister is now boasting and talking about. All that came from the government I led, from under my watch, through a good minister of energy who was knowledgeable in the sector and by one of the best finance ministers, as I said, Larry Hawaii. So what can this government boast about? What new exploration, what new drilling? None, there's none. And the failure on your part has been that you fail to, well, you, you did not keep your promises for reform of the fiscal regime governing the sector. Because companies make investment decisions, <coughs> excuse me, based on economics, based on net present value, NPV, and internal rate of return, IRR. These three things. Investment decisions are made, taking them into consideration. Economics, net present value, internal rate of return. These international companies don't make decisions based on trips to London and Zurich. And as I said, parts are known. Parts are known. In the last seven years, the government has promised in almost every budget to do exactly that, reform the fiscal regime to get more investment. So what did the minister finally do in, in this budget Monday? Or what the minister said he would do? Because so many times things are said and they never materialize. I say PNM, PNM promises never materialize. The minister said he will make changes now to the investment tax credit. Of course, again, you have to bring legislation. But so many times we have promised legislation in a budget and years later, the legislation is not brought, so as we say, seen is believing. So the minister says now he made some changes to the oil and gas fiscal regime last Monday. These changes can best be described as tinkering, 
piecemeal and ineffective. First change was a change to the investment tax credit for oil and gas companies, increasing it nominally from 25% to 30%. So you have a 5% um, increase in the investment tax credit. And it's a tax credit, it's not you're getting money, it's a tax credit, so it's an incentive. This will have little impact on the attractiveness of this incentive and will have little impact on getting in more companies to um, oil and gas companies to invest. I'll tell you why, I'm not saying this. I'm quoting Ernest and Young. The publication came out after the budget. I don't know if it's the same young as Mr. Young. Are there, is there any relationship? Ernest and Young has noted. And I. Okay, thank you, sir. Very important. Doesn't change. It doesn't change the price of cocoa or the price of oil. They have noted, and I quote, that in order to claim the ITC, the, the investment tax credit, the development activity undertaken will have to be approved and certified by the minister in the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, the same Minister Young, for the time being. Whilst the enhanced proposal is welcome, this is the same company I'm quoting from, whilst the enhanced proposal is welcome, historically, obtaining such approvals from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries has proved challenging. This change to investment tax credit will have little or no impact. Minister also made changes to the SPT, the supplement, the SPT um, regime, and introduced a new SPT arrangement for new oil wells in shallow marine areas, whether in existing, thank you. Um, what is the stop time, please? Thank you. Talking about the SPT regime, well, there's a fundamental misunderstanding here in this change that the minister proposes. For new oil wells in shallow marine areas, whether in existing or new fields. For new oil wells, first of all, it's only for new oil wells. So how long does it take to get a new oil well going, to explore, to find, to drill, and so on? But that's not the problem that I see here. SPT is not computed on a well-by-well -well basis. Did you hear that? Minister wants to give you this SPT for new oil wells. But the SPT is not computed on a well-by-well -well basis. So how are you going to ever get this SPT you're talking about? SPT is computed on the aggregated production of an oil field that is fiscalized quarterly. In other words, you're not going to get it talks about wells, but you don't, it, it doesn't work like that. The SPT is calculated, as I say, on the aggregated production of an oil field. So this provision is almost impossible to administer. Secondly, the minister offers new SPT rates on a sliding scale for shallow marine areas. So for example, the middle band of US $70 to US $90 in this band, minister proposes an SPT rate of 20%. However, at present, companies producing oil in mature marine areas pay SPT at 33%, but guess what? They get a 20% discount is applied for mature marine fields. So it brings down this SPT to what? 26.4%, 26.4%. So the benefit to companies from this new incentive is only 6.4%, even though the minister is saying that he is going to give an SPT rate of 20%. When prices are in the 70 to $90 range, where they're expected to be of most of the time, so it's a 6.4% only. Therefore, this change to SPT regime will have little or no impact. Coming now to changes the minister made to the Petroleum Profits Tax, PPT. With regard to changes in the PPT for deep water, this too is ineffective. This provision will only apply to companies holding exploration and production license, 
It will have no impact on those holding production sharing contracts. The majority of deep water acreage, I'm told, is under the production sharing regime. So, Minister, it's spinning top in mud. The way of production sharing contracts work, the way they work, the Minister of Energy pays the tax liability of the operator out of his share of petroleum profit. So, changes in the PPT really have little impact, and therefore, this change is moot. The point has been further confirmed by Ernst & Young in the 2022-2023 budget commentary, and I quote, they say, only companies engaged in petroleum operations under an exploration and production license will benefit, as production sharing contracts typically include a tax indemnity, whereby the taxes of the energy company are paid out of the minister's share of production. Therefore, this change to the PPT regime will have little or no impact. Again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Let us see if this, these incentives will impact in two or three years. Indeed, what um, they have done before 2022 to reverse the significant incentives introduced from 2011 to 15, and what they did was introduce a one-size-fits-all royalty in 2017, that has collapsed drilling and production, and the data bears this truth out. Here's the data. In 2015, the country recorded 2,859 rig days. In 2021, they were just 1,161 rig days. That is a massive 59% decline in drilling, which has ramifications for the oil and gas industry and the maritime, maritime services sector in Chagaramas and Libri. That decline in drilling is the main factor behind the fall in natural gas production by 32% in the same period. That fall in natural gas production caused plan closures, as I mentioned, including the closure of train one, for which 10% shareholder NGC, remember that? They blew away $250 million on maintenance when the major shareholders, BP and Shell, opted out of that train one. So the fall in oil and natural gas production has everything to do with the incentive structure industry, and the minister has failed spectacularly in that regard. Now, three days before this budget was to be delivered, BP and NGC announced a new gas supply contract. What an amazing coincidence. On the same day, BP announced it had approved its SIP project. Yet another amazing coincidence. coincidence. All this seemed strangely choreographed by BP, the NGC, and the government. The question is, did the government push BP to sanction the SIP project? And was a condition for that sanction a new contract with NGC? Is the government so desperate for good news on the energy sector? If so, what concessions were made by the Prime Minister and the Energy Minister when they met with the BP leadership in London? What were the concessions? The opposition has also noted that the recent European tour was conducted in the absence of public servants. The question is why do you exclude the technocrats and, the technocrats and public servants and two politicians go up to meet in a room somewhere in Europe with these companies? Is the government aware that these energy companies um, is the government aware that these energy companies are subject to many anti-corruption legislation in the UK and the EU? The same was done in 2017. The Prime Minister and then Minister of Something met EOG and BP. It is worrisome that the recent BP NGC contract is shrouded in mystery. We can understand confidentiality when it comes about price. But the public has not even been told what volume of our gas will be sold to BP, um, will be sold by BP, by BP to NGC. So what is the way forward in the energy sector? Because Minister admits repeatedly it is the cornerstone of the economy. It has remained the engine of the, of, of the country and of the, of the economy. And if you're doing nothing else, well, you must have to do something. The Prime Minister recently warned that if no new improvements are had in the investment profile of the oil and gas sector, there will be far-reaching consequences for government 
revenues and the quality of life for all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. The Prime Minister is seeing these dire consequences manifesting by 2026, because I think they are already manifesting now. How did we come to this point? And why did it take the Prime Minister seven years to have this Damascus moment? The position of our energy sector is a direct result of the misunderstanding of the same fiscal regime they are now tinkering with after seven years. There will be some minor improvement in natural gas in 2023, but anything is an improvement after you fall into a hole, deep hole in 21 and 22. The government has also placed a lot of its effort on seeking natural gas from Venezuela, and that has not materialized, and it doesn't seem to be likely to materialize anytime soon. And in this very budget Monday, page 22, it talks about production beginning in 2025. So that's not going to help us 23, 24. Production to begin and again projected. And as I say, we don't believe anything this government tells us. It is foolhardy to bet your economy on removing sanctions on Venezuela unless there are radical policy interventions to improve the competitiveness of the energy sector to truly stimulate exploration, as was done in the 2010 to 15 period when we re re received record levels of acreage awarding, the downward trajectory of the energy sector will continue apace with very serious consequences for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a very, very urgent matter that needs to be addressed. And I trust the minister will be able to, to um, answer the, the, the um, quotations I gave about the, the, the um, various uh, changes to the fiscal regime and tell us how are we going to revitalize and resuscitate the energy sector if you want to keep it as the engine of our economy. As I said, Madam, I will just do a few a few points on, on some of the sectors. My colleagues who are very competent and well researched will follow up on other sectors. Um, the one I would like to turn to now is the health sector because that is one of the worst that we have. Health care in this country now is at its worst. Um, before I, I go there, I want to talk a little about the businesses who are owed um, all these VAT refunds. So, millions. Value added tax refunds continue to be a bane to businesses. Despite government claims, there are still large sums outstanding, negatively impacting business activity. And um, we saw recently, following the budget presentation, business leader Arthur Lockjack, chairman of ABL, they have six factories in Trinidad and Tobago, is reported to have stated the main thing has been the VAT refunds because when we go into the export market, we are paying VAT, and we need to get those refunds back. Lockjack lamented that this withholding of their VAT refunds was a tremendous blow on the cash, on their cash. However, the minister failed to deal with the government holding on to people's VAT, um, VAT refunds. When speaking at page 31 of his statement, the minister talked about the size of the fiscal deficit and he stated, by way of example, we were able to pay out four billion in VAT refunds in 2022, significantly more than planned. So business owners could be pardoned if they got the impression the minister would have preferred to keep the money, not pay the VAT refunds at their expense, merely to give their parents of a smaller fiscal deficit. I have repeatedly warned government against using private sector VAT refunds as an interest-free loan. In our consultations, we met and engaged with several stakeholders from um, business chambers. One such chamber proposed that as a solution for VAT refunds, the government should allow companies to net off the VAT refunds with taxes to prevent them from encountering cash flow challenges. The minister spoke of the amount of VAT refunds being paid four billion. But that is beside the point. The question is just how much, what is the quantum, how many more millions are owed to businesses 
Why does the government refuse to give the people their money? Give them back their own money. It's their money. They need their money to recover and to grow. What is required of this government is a consistent, reliable process whereby businesses can receive their VAT refunds on time. This is no science for any willing government. And in fact, for this government, with their agenda, yet unable to ensure refunds are paid on time, is a clear indication of their priorities being misplaced. I want to commit today that the UNC government will immediately ensure the full resourcing of the office responsible for VAT collection and processing to eliminate the long wait for refunds with stifled business confidence and compliance. Further, the UNC government will introduce a system which allows businesses to discount the value of VAT up to the value of outstanding refunds from the government with appropriate approvals. This will rapidly clear up the backlog of outstanding VAT refunds while introducing a more efficient VAT processing system. I turn now to national security because we cannot talk about lives and livelihoods without addressing the fact that crime has totally spiraled out of control in Trinidad and Tobago. We see Approximately 3,434 persons have been murdered since the PNM assumed office. To date, the murder toll stands at over 442. Daylight killings and drive-by shootings using high-powered weapons are now the norm. During our consultations at Sama, we heard from Mr. Ramchandra Timal president of the Aranguez Taxi Drivers Association, about taxi drivers being robbed, one person being murdered in broad delight. Miss Noreen John, a small business owner from Port of Spain, told us about how she was robbed, her home invaded, and to this day, justice was not served. In every single one of our cons consultations, the issue, was issue of crime, spiraling crime, was raised numerous times. Prime Minister, something has to happen. Something has to give. But in this budget, there was nothing that gave us hope that you have any plans or programs or policies to deal with the spiraling crime. What I can tell you is that your biggest mistake was when you caused Gary Griffith not to be appointed as Commissioner of Police. That's one of your biggest mistakes. I hold no brief for Captain Gary Griffith, but at least when he was there, your crime numbers were going down. And I worked with him, we worked with him, and under my watch, we brought serious crimes down to the lowest in decades by 2014. We slashed them by 2015 by 50% compared to 2009. By 2015, we saw the lowest number of serious crimes reported in this country since 1984. The current situation is critical. It requires urgent attention by government. We expected, as I say, for the budget to bring some hope for citizens you know, really suffering with the scourge of crime. Now, this government had promised a border security agency in the Manifesto 2015, and then promised it in several budgets. What did they then do? They watered it down to a, what? a security task force. In this budget statement, what did we hear about plans and programs to deal with crime? The minister told us they plan to spend money to facilitate accommodation for two Cape class vessels that they rushed to buy, even though they already had good fleet of vessels, the diamond vessels that we have purchased. They rushed to buy these two Cape, um, Cape class vessels. So what are they going to spend money on? How are they going to fight crime? They're going to fix up a place to park up these Cape class vessels, because that's where the diamond vessels are now. They're parked up there doing nothing. They're not using the vessels, but you run and you bought two more vessels. The minister in his presentation spoke of improved technology throughout the National Security Service. In his budget presentation, I note with concern that in the wake of several high-profile cyber attacks on public and private institutions and reports of sophisticated crimes such as card skimming, the cyber security program under the ministry 
has been allocated only 150,000 for fiscal 23. One would expect that this program, which was introduced in fiscal 2015 by my administration, would play a role in combating the emerging threat. What has happened, I think, that is contributing to um, not being able to deal with escalating crime is that we had conceptualized the National Operations Center to be a high-tech entity aimed at, at accelerating, accelerating the state's report, response to critical events and at the same time feeding real-time intelligence to all agencies. But when this government came into power, they lumped the NOC together with the SSA and they have been granted expanded spine powers and that's what they're doing. I am told today by a gentleman that they have evidence. They have evidence on, on paper documents that they, they, their phone is being intercepted, they're being spied upon and he's planning going to the High Court in order to expose what is taking place by the SSA and with um, agents in the TTPS. So we gave it to the SSA and nothing has happened. They promised uh, what a national Forensic Sciences Center, repeat promise, 2020 we were told there was an agreement signed between TT and China for this center. Two years later we are told on Monday, cabinet is now approving lands and conceptual drawings. So we are nowhere nearer to this Forensic Science Center. Four years since this was announced and nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. So no new measures, CCTV camera again, you collapse the whole city. When you came in, we had about five, we had put in about 500 CCTV cameras. They all became, most of them are non-functional under your watch. <clears throat> so Minister, there is no hope in your budget for people to take comfort that you are in fact dealing with crime. Another failed sector is that of the health sector. Under your government, citizens have experienced the worst healthcare in our country's history. Your pervasive criminal negligence has resulted in the deaths of thousands of persons. Member, Emma, yes, ma'am. I'd ask you if you withdraw that word and, and find another way. Which word, madam, please? You said you're pervasive and you said some words after that, please. Mm -hmm. The government's pervasive negligence has resulted in the deaths of thousands of persons, not only from COVID, but also uncared for patients with chronic NCDs, such as diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. Over 4,200 unfortunate citizens became casualties of the woeful, incompetent mismanagement of the pandemic. In your budget statements, every one of the last seven years, you promised scientific networking through a network of modern facilities. And again, up to today, you promised the central block at Port of Spain General Hospital that is still not constructed after seven years of your government. You boast about other hospitals we gave you, my government, we gave you the commencement of the Point Fortin and the Arima hospitals. We gave the people of Trinidad and Tobago the Coover Teaching Hospital, the San Fernando Teaching Hospitals. When you came into office, you rolled back the closing time for most health centers. We had increased those to 9 p.m. in order to give working people the opportunity to come there after work for healthcare. You rolled that back down to 4 p.m. So all people are working, you can't get to the health center because you work until 4 p.m. We had initiated that and so you're depriving working people the opportunity to have primary care in the health sector and the in these um, health centers. There is a worsening CDAP program, unavailability of life-saving medicine and anti-cancer drugs and insufficient medical and surgical supplies. Patients are dying in your so-called parallel health system while they await um, urgent major surgery, including cardiac surgery. Some persons have suggested it should be renamed not a parallel health system, but a death system. Patients are dying in the overcrowded emergency departments, unable to have a ward bed, even after waiting 48 hours lying in a trolley or sitting on a wheelchair. 
their uncontrolled and worsening NCDs. Sometimes there is only one CT scanner functioning for the entire country. You have repeatedly promised to establish and implement a national health insurance since 2015 in your manifesto and then in your various budgets. Seven years later, that remains a promise which never materialized. PNM promise never materialized. Presently, there's a worsening in CDAP program with a lack of essential medicines. Medical and surgical supplies for major operative procedures are not available. There are thousands of delayed surgeries. There are unacceptable waiting times for critical CT scans, MRI, and ultrasound. Severe overcrowding in emergency departments and hospitals. There's an acute shortage of medical, nursing, and paramedical personnel. Children are dying awaiting assistance from a children's life fund, which still requires a promised legislative change seven years ago. There's an acute shortage of medical and nursing personnel. This sounds like a horror story or a war zone. That is the state of your healthcare under your watch. These are just the tip of the iceberg of your government's abject failure to provide adequate health care for all citizens. But then why should you care? When you get sick or you want to get checked out, you fly off to Miami, you fly off to LA, so why should you care what's happening to the ordinary people here? You boast in Aunt who has the best health care, but when you become ill, where do you go? You fly off to LA, fly off to Miami, fly off to other parts unknown for health care. I want to give an assurance today that this is a sector that touches and impacts upon every man, woman, and child in our country. And when the UNC forms the next government, as you know, we have many doctors in our, um, in our, in our fold. Right now in the parliament, we have three medical doctors with us, and um, there are many more that we can call upon for help. When the UNC forms the next government, we have several plans for improving and restoring the nation's health care to first world standards. Yeah, I'll just mention a few today. We will immediately make the necessary legislative changes to the Children's Life Fund. We will implement a patient charter with waiting times, guidelines, and timely care guarantees. We will re-implement the extended hours at the health centers. We will implement a way to do non-urgent surgeries on weekend to deal with backlogs. We will explore the potential of the capacity of the private sector to complement these initiatives. We will implement a health card to monitor dispensing of medication and detection of abuse. We will reduce waiting times for diagnostic tests. We will introduce a mobile diagnostic unit with MRI, CT to ease the backlog and improve accessibility for non-urgent cases. These are just some of our plans for when we form the next government to effect true transformation and inclusion in the health sector. I want to give the commitment again that we will also establish a commission of inquiry into mismanagement of the COVID pandemic. I turn now just briefly on public utilities because this is a, an area where there's a lot of buzz and buzzwords taking place and a lot of concern. The minister has essentially said to the country that the funding needed to invest in upgrading the utility sector can only be achieved by raising water and electricity rates. There has been no capital investment in the public utility sector by this government over the past seven years. Today, 
They will have you believe that they have the panacea to the problems in public utilities. Instead of investing the patrimony of oil and gas dollars in infrastructure of a country, the taxpayer is now being told to carry the burden of the cost by paying higher rates for water than many of them do not receive, and for an electricity supply many of them cannot depend upon. Last year's budget cut, budget cut major cuts to WASA, $350 million in maintenance, materials, and supplies, and employment. Today we feel the effects of that with dry taps. We saw nothing to reduce the financial challenges that Tiendek is experiencing concerning the billions in debt it has to NGC. And we saw the continuation of TSTT assets being sold out to the friends and finances of the government. That sums up most of the activities in the public utilities sector over the past year. Now, a few days ago, I received a document entitled WASA's Strategic Plan. This plan is a policy document formulated by the government to be sent to the RIC to make a case for increases in water rates. So even though the government denies it, that is your document that you're going to send the plan to the RIC to make a case to increase water rates. What is contained in that document is not surprising at all, but it's something government has denied over and over again. On page 53 of that plan is the government's commitment to the RIC. On page 53 of that strategic plan is the government's commitment to the RIC to send home, fire, and put on the bread line, sack, axe, however you want to put it, 2,500 employees of WASA. The joblessness is already so high, and the government is hell-bent, it seems, on creating more joblessness, more unemployment in this country. That is the bottom line of that document. As an aim of WASA, to reduce the headcount and personnel costs. As I say, more unemployment and more hardships. Respectfully, I firmly believe that the minister and his government are taking the people of this country for fools. It is illustrated in the abandonment of their previously announced budget promise of a cash utility card. Where did that go? What became of that cash card? With great gusto and bravado, the minister last year announced the introduction of the cash utility card designed to assist the most vulnerable in our society to offset the cost of utilities. In this budget, there is no mention at all of this initiative. When one looks at the social sector investment program and expenditure estimates, there is no line item or explanation of a cash utility card, hence making this another bogus promise of the government. Madam Speaker, I turn now to infrastructure. Again, in our budget consultations, this was an error that was most bemoaned and complained and lamented about. That issue was one that almost every citizen can agree upon, and that is we have some of the worst roads in the world, worst roads in the world. This was another central point raised by citizens at our consultations. As your governor, Sir Mr. Kenny McIntyre, he lamented the deplorable condition of our roads. He said that citizens are now purchasing materials and repairing roads on their own due to neglect by the government and no money being given to regional corporations. In the Prime Minister's constituency in Diego Martin, we heard from one Mr. Darren Lafleur. He highlighted a recurring landslide on the car on the Carnage Main Road. He said that every time this happens, it causes a major traffic issue, damage to vehicles, and complete blockage for the neighboring school. And this is in the Prime Minister's constituency. Prime Minister, something has to happen. People have feelings too. The Minister of Finance made several promises again in this statement about improvements in our failed and crumbling infrastructure. Minister, I don't know, Minister really is, has a really brass or bold face, as they say. 
to come again to make promises. All these promises are repeated year after yes, year. PNM promises never materialize. I want us to remember this is a seven budget. Six budgets came. This is eight. He has presented um, six before this. <clears throat> In 2016, they promised to remove all traffic lights from Arima to Port of Spain. They promised to construct ring roads and implement other traffic solutions in built-up areas such as Chagonas, Grandi, and um, Scarborough. He then promised a Toko port since the first budget. I think he may have lost that copy because clearly he forgot this has been promised again and again. Again in 16 and 17, Minister promised the same Maruga port, promising again this year. The point is your promises for infrastructure are hollow at best. Promise to talk about again, nothing has happened to date. And so you will not deliver on anything, because that is just the nature of PNM promises never materialize. Another promise for the completion of the Solomon Hocha Highway. I want to remind you, Madam, that it took the UNC government to start the extension after decades of being promised this extension of this highway. And as soon as the government came into office, they stopped the project redid the scope of works, gave the contractor to whichever friend, financier, or family. And what happened? The road crumbled down on the creek. Like what um, one said, like cricks, it crumbled like cricks. We yet have to find out how much that cost us, how much more it will cost us to fix it. So it's crumbling infrastructure everywhere. This in extension of that highway was poised to go to two PM strongholds, Point Fourteen and La Brea, but it stopped it. They halted the work. Now we get to this new state company. This new company will fix all the potholes and repair all the roads. Well, we wait to see that. In terms of real issues affecting daily commuters, nothing for them. 200 million to set up a new state company for PNM and their friends and family and financiers support board members. On any given day, hundreds of thousands of citizens travel on the North Bung Lane of the Uriah Butler Highway, Sir Solomon Hucho Highway, and at the same time, the Churchill Russell Highway. Almost six hours a day, citizens have to spend sitting down in traffic. How productive do you expect these people to be after they reach to the work? They are miserable. They hate everything after suffering in that traffic. So why wasn't there any allocation made in this budget to address that problem? Is the only solution what the Prime Minister said. The Prime Minister talked about work from home and then changed his whole mind about it. He talked about it some time ago. Now he's talking about saying, save fuel by not getting caught in traffic and choose a different time to avoid traffic. So how can you do that? How can you do that when you force people back to work into the same routine after you promised a work from home policy and then said, no, cannot happen. In your 2020 manifesto, you promise a work from home policy. PNM promises never materialize. The majority of funding allocated in this budget for the Ministry of Works is for existing incomplete projects. No new initiatives. That's the same old broken promises again and again. So when you hear the allocation and you watch it in the estimates, it sounds like so much. But it's the same promise, prom repeated promise from year to year. I turned for a short while to housing, and um, I, I read an Express editorial uh, recently about the Chambers, the HECs, and the fact that there are over 119,000 applying for houses from the government and so on. And um, I see the government cause a further hurt to the poor and vulnerable by slashing home improvement grants. Fiscal 13 and 14, we disbursed over 1,200 home improvement grants and families through the Ministry of Housing. For fiscal, fiscal 21, we did that each year, of course, from 2015. For fiscal 21, a meager 389 grants. So they've slashed that too. In 22, 368 grants under this government. There are 90, I'm told, um, over 191,000 persons applying for um, housing. 
So we'll wait to see what happens under this government. Um, the number of housing, our shadow portfolio um, um, member, MP for Urupuch <clears throat> West will deal with some more on housing. Education, a very important sector. The true wealth of our nation is not in oil and gas, it is in people. And so the issue of sending our children to school was another key takeaway from our consultations. We heard Ms. Gillian Ramsaran from Pache say well, how the struggle to send children to school is now overbearing. Maria Peer from Tabaki told us how expensive it is now to pay for transport to send children to school, $50 per day. In Bish, Whitney Pacheco questioned if the ICT access centers will be reopened because children do not have access to the technology. That is what our government aimed to do, give our children access to the world at their fingertips with our laptop program. <clears throat> now that the visionless PNM has dismantled the laptop program, they cannot even ensure properly function, functioning ICT centers. Prime Minister, I say again, something has to happen. Poor people have feelings too. The SEA and CSEC level results show students could not cope with the changes of the pandemic. This could have been caught and rectified before the exams if the government had used a data-driven policy approach. That is, if government had been proactive, ensuring our students were prepared during both the online and hybrid systems. About physical opening, Information coming to me from sources that the Ministry of Education says, the Ministry has 350 tickets a mark for school repairs. However, only 84 have been executed by the start of the school term. That is simply appalling. Is the government allowing our nation's schools to fall into disrepair like they have destroyed our road network, and other infrastructure. How can our children learn in a classroom that is falling apart? And let me remind you, during our watch, we built over 100 schools. Can this government point to schools that they built in seven years? I believe it's seven schools in seven years. That's what I'm told, but then they boast they've built schools, secondary, ECCE. My information is you've built only about seven schools. Seven schools. What else have you done? the high cost of getting back to school, the absence of a proper school transfer system regime, the fact that so many have been unemployed, the rising cost of living have led all led to some children dropping out of the school system because parents could not afford to send them to school. And what will happen to these children who drop out? Some may be permanently unemployable, others may turn to crime, others may become homeless. So we are creating, in effect, a lost generation. I make a commitment again, when we form the next government, we promise we will make educating the children of a nation a number one priority again. I turn now briefly to the labor sector. In the labor sector. We know job security is a myth under this government. They both they kept, so kept so many persons in jobs, and yet so many persons lost their jobs. After seven years in charge, they cannot point to a single project, a single policy, a single development which has created jobs for the people of the nation. Not one single project or policy. In this year's budget, the minister told the public servants, I quote, we are of the view that our current offer of 4% over the period 2014-2019 for Main Street Public Service is prudent, practical, and judicious. This is with food prices rising, inflation, fuel prices, property tax, a meager 4%, an insult to the hard-working public service who have kept our nation going. It should now be evident to the working class and trade unions that the policies of this rowley led government are to undermine, weaken, and completely dismantle the trade union movement. The employment of strategies, devices, and mechanisms inclusive of closures of state-owned enterprises, 
Petrotrade, privatization, for example, TTRA, and the rampant proliferation of contract labor in the public sector <clears throat> at the expense of permanent and long-term employment are being all utilized. Their utter failure to settle over nine years of outstanding wage and salary negotiations in the public sector, with every public sector and public service trade union and association, they failed to do that all except for one. What they did instead, they offered $100,000 workers, a tra 100,000 workers, a trail of breadcrumbs falling from the master's table, and the unions have so far rightfully rejected. I am very proud to say and remind you that the government I led in a five-year period settled over 135 wage negotiations. In the labor sector, I speak of the betrayal of a decision given to the nation by the minister in his budget statement of 2022, when he said he would regularize, regularize the employment state of over 3,400 nursing personnel who would have been given temporary continuous employment where these workers secure neither gratuity nor pensions. And I know both the member for Naparima and the member for Kuva um, South have raised this issue repeatedly in Parliament about the status of regularizing these nursing personnel. The government was supposed to settle the matter. Questions were asked of the minister and of the prime minister, and they said it is being worked out. By December 21, it was supposed to be done, but they have failed so to do again a betrayal of these workers. What did they do instead? They have filed an appeal against a judgment handed down by the industrial court that was supposed to dispose of this matter. On September 12th of this year, they filed that appeal, betraying the promise to the nursing personnel of the nation. Thank you. Now, over 30,000 daily rated workers are still waiting to establish their contributory pension plan that the government promised to take effect in 2020. Now the minister tells us, so that's 2020, where are we now, 2022, 23? The minister tells us now a consultant is reviewing these plans for the following year, yet again, yet again, a betrayal of the workers. Tens of thousands of public officers were told, was, sold a dream that this promising government would review public service pensions to index to their entitlements. That was expected to be completed by 2020. Almost two years have elapsed, and public officers are still awaiting <coughs> indexing, excuse me, your pensions. They're still awaiting indexing of the pensions. Not a broken promise by PNM promises never materialized. Madam Speaker, I turn now again to workers. The CPEP program. In 2015, when my government demitted office, there were a total of 11,069 persons employed under the CPEP program. In 2021, under this government, that has dropped down to 9,000. 108 persons, 1,000, dropped down by 9,108 persons. So you've, you've reduced the number of workers, against, again, creating more unemployment, more joblessness. For fiscal 23, there has been no expansion in the program. This is seen in the expended estimates. The program was revised downwards from 425 million in 22 to 410 million in 23, meaning more of these workers will have to go, have to go on the broad line. We look at the URP, another form of employment, labor. They have cut expenditure by $0.5 billion, 2016 to 2021. For the past seven years, this government, through its minister, has come to parliament to appropriate billions of dollars of public monies. They have consistently refused to account for how they were spending the people's monies. And so this new year, we expect the same. We await the debate and the start of the debate. From evading opposition queries on expenditure to non-disclosure contract agreements 
to exemption of state agencies from public scrutiny, the government remains unwilling to account to the nation transparently. A few words on agriculture because this is a very, very important um, sector to drive the economy for revenue streams, of course, and to help us with food security. I've spoken before about the decline in the agriculture sector under this government. I have noted that the studies show growing food insecurity in the region due to a lack of production and high food prices. When people say they are not making a living anymore, believe them. When many go to supermarkets, they are forced to compromise and take only the bare minimum to get by. In some cases, because as we said before, the exorbitant food prices. At our UNC pre-budget consultations in Princeton, Mr. Mahade Ramnarine of Navet, of the Dashin Farmers Association, lamented how difficult it is for farmers who sometimes do not have proper agricultural access roads, no retention ponds, no sluice gates available. He spoke about the lack of technical services from the Ministry's Extension Department for Pest Control, amongst other things. How can we reduce our food import bill if we continue to dismiss the plight of our farmers? Mr. Javed Rahman of the Jerningham Junction Farmers Association told us about the issues of flooding, Pridia Lasni, poor infrastructure. Mr. Mpias Khan of the Kali Bay Fishing Association spoke of the neglect of the fishing facilities and community. He explained that the fishermen used to have VAT returns on engines and vehicles, gas subsidy, and an enforcement committee visiting the sites and caretakers. He says all these things have now been discontinued. Government has treated this sector with more contempt than any other government in history. Yet what did they do? They want to puppy show themselves with fancy expos and photo ops. You remember that? Um, big, what was it, Agri Expo. And the farmers down on the ground were not even invited. I wonder how many people sitting down in that place were indeed farmers in that expo. Um, <clears throat> government held the Agri Investment Forum in Port of Spain. A month later, the HDC is talking about pushing ahead with turning the St. Augustine in nurseries into housing development, destroying the agricultural aspects there. Prime agriculture land with a history of supporting Standing farmers for decades. Standing order 49, please, ma'am. I'm sorry. OK, again, I'll give you a little leeway. But um, this is sub so please be careful. I'm not sure which one. Oh, oh the nurseries. OK, yes. thank you. I don't see what I would say would influence any judge, but I'll be guided. I can't influence any judge. I'm sure maybe some of the other. Let's, let's get on with it. Oh, okay, ma'am. I'm guided. So we have seen the um, government has a history of supporting, no history of supporting farmers. And now we see what is happening there at those nurseries. Nothing in the budget, definitely, madam, I've seen, for the scourge of pre larceny. Very small budget allocations for flooding, which destroys so many crops and drive off the cost of local foods. Again, they allocated 300 million that will never be used to benefit farmers. This might be used to buy hampers again. We saw what happened with the, that, um, those hampers and the vegetable boxes. The UNC's plan, madam, I want to share a bit of this before I close, to ensure food security. Now remember when I spoke about agriculture before and the fact that we have to delve into agriculture uh, partly as a revenue earner but also uh, for food security. The Prime Minister said there was no land. We don't have land. And Prime Minister does not understand, given all the vertical ways of farming now that can be done, so many ways, not everything is on flat down. On he has no idea, absolutely no idea as his government, of how you can do agriculture with very little land, but it's not true to say we don't have land for agriculture. We do have farmers who are farming and need to be supported. So I say our plan to deal with food security, our national economic transformation plan, we place agriculture as a central pillar of a diversification strategy. This would lead to massive job creation 
and help us reestablish food security with proposed initiatives such as creating agricultural parks with all necessary infrastructure and focusing on local crops, organic superfoods, and non-traditional export crops. Indeed, our plan includes implementing an agriculture insurance protection system to protect farmers from losses incurred through flooding, drought, pest and disease, and pretty larceny, fire, and business interruption. We propose investing in R&D, research and development, and encouraging innovation in agricultural practices, processes, technology, and commercialization of new products. We propose <clears throat> working with farmers in the private sector, investors, investors, to capitalize on global demand for non-traditional food crops, which offer lucrative opportunities such as hot peppers. And I think last time I spoke, I talked about the fact that we have um, the scorpion pepper is one of the hottest in the world. I spoke about the fact that peppers, any peppers that you can grow can be easily exported. So that's why I talk about this could be a revenue earner, forex earner, job creation, as well as help us with food security. Evi inviting, we propose inviting private investors to establish an agro-processing complex to process the supply from agricultural parks. This will be created through the lease of about 25,000 acres of former carry lands to registered farmers and private investors. There must be a focus on policies that will spur economic growth. Our nation desperately needs innovative solutions in this crisis. I must say a word about Tobago, madam. I would like to, not I must, I would like to. The minister acknowledged that the change in admin in Tobago was a good thing for the development of the island. When he stated, and I quote, Madam Speaker, I am, broad, I am in broad agreement with the socio-economic agenda advanced by the new administration by the THC in its June 2022 budget statement of fiscal 2023. The minister continued, the policies, programs, and activities that have been announced, if implemented properly, will improve the economic well-being and quality of life of the people of Tobago. We anticipate the creation of more jobs in the private sector, as well as the maintenance or preservation of existing businesses and the generation of new ones." End of quote. Madam Speaker, it seems to me that even the PNM seems to be happy that the PNM lost the elections in Tobago. The minister acknowledged the lockdown measures and closure of the economy would have devastated the tourism industry on the island, and there would be the need to kickstart. Tobagonians are not coming to Trinidad to go to Maracas Beach and rest and relax. They are coming here because there are services and goods which are not provided in Tobago. Notwithstanding the THA's best efforts, they are not in control of the air bridge and the sea bridge. These are controlled by central government. And we have to wonder that this uh, price increase now, whether they're trying to punish Tobago because of their loss in the elections. There have been recent complaints about the number of flights on the air bridge. Citizens have been clamoring for government to increase flights to ensure those who wish to travel to Tobago will have access to the opportunity. The solution this government presented, as I said, was to raise the price to reduce the demand with all resource in Caribbean Airlines to be able to increase flights to Tobago. The increase in fares goes against the tourism agenda in Tobago because a large segment of travelers to Tobago are domestic tourists from Trinidad. Maybe this difficulty to travel between the islands is what the Prime Minister meant when in the heat of the election he stated that he will never forgive Tobago if they do not vote PNM. They will never forget Tobago if they do not vote, never forgive if they vote PNM. The increased fares will not encourage persons in Trinidad to staycation in Tobago. Finally, Madam, the UNC's plan to rebuild and restore Trinidad and Tobago. 
There is no question, in spite of the minister's false narrative, that we are doing reasonably well. The reality is our country's future is in peril under this government. Our economy is tanking, and the government is oblivious to what needs to be done. The Prime Minister has called on citizens to stay the course, but of course, that course we are headed, we are headed on is for disaster. The UNC is ready, willing, and able to steer our country into calm waters. Our track record speaks for itself. Under the government island, the economy was on a stable growth path. We had initiatives in train to increase revenue generation. And as I said, we created jobs, over 56,000 jobs. We have completed a comprehensive plan to help rebuild the economy and restore stability. The first recommendation we have is, one, reduce tax burden. Reduce the tax burden. We believe reducing the heavy tax burden on our citizens and businesses most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic will help citizens start to regain their footing. I mentioned before about the VAT regime and the fact that we will again remove basic food items from the VAT net and improve the efficiency of the tax system by strengthening the BIR, the VAT office, and customs and exercise. We will also simplify the personal corporate income tax regime as well as the VAT regime. Our second booster to the economy, to help the economy to recover, is to jumpstart food security, and I just mentioned some of those initiatives. We believe there must be a jumpstart to our agriculture sector, and I gave some of the uh, uh, some of the plans there, and we commit that we should spend at least 10% of the PSIP to de develop the agricultural access roads, irrigation, and drainage for agricultural parks. We will also incentivize the private sector to establish an agro-processing plant. There will be no wastage or dumping of produce, which is a bane for many of our farmers. The third strategy we are proposing is to restart petroleum to regain fuel security. We believe government must re-examine its plan for petroleum. We are proposing to restart our refinery. By reopening petroleum, we will have greater fuel security we will save foreign exchange, we'll provide meaningful jobs, and of course, we will gain uh, for, for ex, um, foreign exchange revenue and to continue to contribute to the Treasury. Our fourth proposal is for government to invest in renewable energy. Now, the government speaks of it, but it's just lip service and just never happens. Our initiatives in renewable energy and recycling, such as the establishment of a solar energy park at Tamana, an industrial recycling park across the east-west corridor to reduce our carbon footprint while adding to environmental resiliency. Our fifth economic booster for the economy and its recovery is the creation of three innovative funds to mobilize financial resources. We believe the government should now adopt the approach and start the National Food Security Fund, a national infrastructure fund, and the National Climate Trust Funds. These funds will not raise our public debt. We recognize that the citizens of TNT are critical to achieving our goal of recovery, sustainable growth, and diversification. Our plan is built on three interconnected principles. Principle one, people-centered development, getting people back to work. Most important, getting people back to work. Principle two, pro-business, allow the private sector to grow, drive growth and government, development. Principle three, resilient, resilience, deepen economic reforms, but with a human face. Principle four, local content, give people a sense of ownership and independence. Principle five, sustainability, promoting environmental stewardship. And so the UNC's National Economic Transformation Plan 
lays out a com comprehensive suite of policy initiatives and programs to steer our economy towards a more sustainable development path. Our plan, again, is to create more jobs, to focus heavily on diversification and new business development so that people will people and uh, the people across the country will benefit. The plan has diversification and prosperity engines. With the economy in sharp decline, we must focus on new revenue generation schemes, which seems we deals and programs. We cannot continue to put all the eggs in the energy basket given the volatility of this sector. We have identified several prosperity engines to create new jobs transform the economy, and create more revenue. One, a Brechen Castle agro-processing complex. Two, a sugar manufacturing facility. Three, an east-west biotechnology manufacturing corridor. Four, Sevilla Digital Innovation Park. Five, Tamana Solar Tech Renewable Energy. West Port of Spain, Trini Creative Arts Street Area. East Port of Spain, Steel Pan Manufacturing Facility. Eight, Piaco Aircraft Maintenance Repair and Operations Hub. <clears throat> Nine, Cedrus Maruga Southwest Peninsula Economic Zone. 10, Point Galeota Energy Logistics Hub. 11, Plymouth International Cruise Ship Complex. 12, Make Tobago a Duty-Free Zone. And the Port of Spain, Port Revitaliz Revitalization. These prosperity engines will mobilize and engage the private sector, both local and international, and the implementation will have large positive multiplier effects in kickstarting the economy, kickstarting economic recovery, fostering growth, and supporting transformation. What is needed is a government and a leader who will put their shoulders to the wheel, a government that will see private sector and stakeholders as partners in the process of development. We recently marked our nation's 60th anniversary of independence, of a 46th anniversary of a republic. We made significant progress on our journey, but successive PNM administrations have stymied further development. This latest PNM administration has been the worst in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. We cannot go on this way. Our country and people deserve better. We deserve a government that cares about citizens that will take decisive action to improve circumstances. I repeat that the UNC is ready to get to work to rebuild and restore our nation. Some of these uh, programs I've mentioned for economic transformation and recovery and rebuilding, I have mentioned before, and I still believe that they are very viable and workable and definitely in need. For the past seven years, the government has branded anyone who dared to speak truth as treasonous. Well, the entire nation can see this proposed budget by the government is nothing short of a betrayal of the people of our country. The budget will do nothing, do nothing but work against the people of our nation, condemning them to hopelessness, to a cycle of poverty, to joblessness, some to criminality, violence, and despair. Budget 2023 has fully exposed the government for what they are, a government of incompetent and unqualified persons who have no desire to work to improve the lives of the people of our nation. A failed budget, a failed government will produce failed budgets. Failed budgets will produce failed nations. The entire nation now knows that as long as this government sits in office, the greater the danger to economic stability, peace, and prosperity. To citizens of this great land, the salt of the earth, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, I say take heart and have faith 
For as sure as a day follows the darkest night, the sun shall and must always rise again. I know we are experiencing very difficult times, and as a result of this failed budget, it is going to get even worse. But we must remember that the people united can overcome any adversity. Adversity. In times of crisis, I often think back to the comforted words of my mother, who would always remind me that everything in life is temporary, even troubles, and that that too shall pass. So please have faith, this too shall pass. Soon these seven years be nothing more than a bad memory. We will overcome the crisis if we believe in the potential within ourselves. I will never give up on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I ask you, please do not give up on our nation. It was a great freedom fighter, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, and I repeat, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love have always won. They have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time they can seem invincible, but in the end, they always fall. <coughs> Excuse me. Srinath Tobago, I say to you today, this government is now tipping over on itself. Prime Minister, I ask, why do you continue your government to brutalize the poor? Poor people have feelings too. I again call upon you, withdraw this wicked budget and call the election now. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You know, Bonnie West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am very proud to rise today and this afternoon to respond to the leader of the opposition as a proud member of this People's National Movement government. First, let me go on record, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the constituency of Lupino Borneo West, to endorse this fiscal package presented by the Honorable Minister of Finance on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This fiscal package themed tenacity and stability in the face of global challenges. Madam Speaker, I have listened carefully to the contribution by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. And I must say, Madam Speaker, that as I listen to her, it gives me good encouragement. It emboldens me, Madam Speaker, that the people of Trinidad and Tobago must be grateful for the People's National Movement. Because, because if we do not stand in the gap for the people of Trinidad and Tobago and offer good, stable, honest, decent government, then the alternative is chaos and confusion. Chaos and confusion. As per usual, Madam Speaker, as per usual, the leader of the opposition stood there for three hours and as in her normal self, had nothing good to say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We stood here in this parliament, we spent two years in this parliament, and she led her team at every single moment, filibustering. Overrule, member said the leader of the opposition, and then said she. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, two years 
in this second term of the PNM government. We came here, we presented policies, we presented bills to protect the people of this country, to increase our revenue standing. And at every opportunity, the leader of the opposition and her honorable members opposite, they stood and they obstructed every opportunity and every attempt that we have made to improve the living conditions of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Today, she came here and she presented her response to the national budget. And I must say, it is nothing but shameful because she believes, because she believes that the people of Trinidad and Tobago forgot her. She believes that the people of Trinidad and Tobago forgot the term. On a ruler on 48.5. So, um, again, remember, it might be artificial to be saying the leader of the opposition all of the time. And it will be artificial for us not to allow she sometimes. But please remember um, to populate your contribution with either the honorable member for Siberia or the leader of the opposition. I am so guided, Madam uh, Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me say that I will not stand here and disrespect any office holder, any member of this house, and, um, but I will be guided by your ruling. But, Madam Speaker, let me see that when the PNM came into government in 2015, we came recognizing that there are serious challenges in this country, and oftentimes some serious decisions to make for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Very, very serious decisions. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition will have us believe that when we came into office in 2015, the circumstances that existed then, from 2015 to 2022, were different from 2010 to 2015. She talked about her gross domestic product and all the policies that they pursued to advance the economic interests of this country. But the Honorable Leader of the Opposition believes that the people of Trinidad and Tobago all forgot that when the UNC was in office between 2010 and 2015, the oil price then was hovering about 93 US dollars per barrel. The price of gas was averaging four dollars, four US dollars per MMBTU. When the PNM came into government, declining oil prices, declining revenue production, declining gas prices, thereby resulting in billions of dollars being lost in revenue position in this country. As a matter of fact, between 2015 and 2020, 2015 to 2020, this country lost over $18 billion as a result of global prices. And this government had to buckle down and pursue decisions and pursue policies to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. In 2020, Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition spoke for three hours three hours, she made absolutely, and the Honorable Leader made absolutely no reference to the fact that Trinidad and Tobago face economic whirlwinds and headwinds. The Leader of the Opposition made no reference to the fact that we as a country had to battle a global pandemic. So when making comparison, when the PNM came into government in 2015 to 2022, take into consideration that when the UNC formed the government in 2010 to 2015, the UNC did not have to manage difficult circumstances as we have managed. And we leveled with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We leveled with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And the people of Trinidad and Tobago understood fairly well, fairly well, that as a government facing difficult circumstances, we had to make decisions to protect the interests. 
of their, of their interests. It is the Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister told this country and told this government that under his watch, we will not go to the IMF. He said that. He said that as a country, we will make the necessary decisions to protect our interests, as others have done in the region where they went to the IMF. And of course, it resulted in all kinds of social dislocation because of loss of jobs and other difficult decisions. But we as a country, we have decided that faced with difficult circumstances, we will make decisions to the best and the, and, 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 and the interest, the good interest of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And despite difficult circumstances, despite difficult circumstances, Madam Speaker, this government spent over $5 billion through COVID relief for individual and businesses. $5 billion. Let us look at other social and humanitarian support that we provided because the leader of the opposition spent three hours trying to paint this government as wicked and detached, but nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. A government faced with a global pandemic and difficult economic headwinds, protecting the less vulnerable people in the society, the most vulnerable groups in the society. 25,100 grants for existing beneficiaries of food support at the value of $17.1 million. They believe that the people of this country forget all about that. 20,497 grants valued at $510 each, at a value of $31 million for households that receive meals from the school support program. 42,450 grants valued at $22.5 million at public assistance, disability assistance grant, Madam Speaker. 2,000 818 grants valued $1,500 each, totaling $12.7 million as food support to persons who are approved for senior citizens' pension. Does that represent a government that is detached? Does that represent a government that is wicked and pursuing policies? I say absolutely not. They are a bunch of hypocrites emergency food hampers, food vouchers, rental assistance grants for families impacted by the closure of businesses or loss of income. Member. Thank you, thank you. Because you see, they prefer to sit here and pretend that this government is not pursuing policies to the, to the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And in the face of truth, they cannot sit there and listen and understand because they do not want us to remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago that we are continuing to pursue policies that are in their best interests. So she spent, the leader of the opposition, sorry, spent three hours trying to paint this government as being detached and not taking care of people. And therefore, I, as a PNM Minister of Government, have to respond to her and to remind her and to remind all the people of Trinidad and Tobago of the policies and the programs that we have put in place for the vulnerable people in our society. Rental assistance grants. Rental assistance grants for families impacted by the closure of businesses or loss of income. Fuel relief grant to maxi taxis and taxi operators. Financial assistance for non-scholarship students staying at UWE. Credit unions have been resourced with a reimbursable amount of $100 million to protect, to provide emergency income support loans to their members, policies pursued by this people's national movement government on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Salary relief grants to citizens whose employment have been terminated or suspended without pay. Religious bodies being given over $40 million to assist with food distribution, Madam Speaker. 139,906 market boxes to the value of $81 million for all 
41 constituencies, both PNM and UNC, and all of them benefited from it, and all their constituents. But today, the leader of the opposition comes to parliament because she believes it's the honorable leader. I do apologize that the people of Trinidad and Tobago forgot all about this. And she must um, pre uh, read from a prepared speech to paint the impression that this government is detached and wicked. I say they are all hypocrites. Madam Speaker, in this 2023 fiscal package, 300,000 individual taxpayers stand to benefit from new tax exemptions to the tune of $450 million annually. We have increased the Housing and Village Improvement Program from $145,000 to $165,000, $170,000, and $175,000 to people in depressed communities so that they can improve their living circumstances. And the reason why this government can pursue this is because over the last seven years, we have exercised fiscal prudence on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and that we can now utilize some of the extra financial resources that are made available to us so that we can benefit some of the most vulnerable people in the society. That is not the example of a government that is wicked or detached. The person or any member who gives that impression is not leveling with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the School to Work Apprenticeship Allowance to encourage businesses to hire some of our young people, 16 to 25 years, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition made absolutely no reference to this program. $200 million to compensate healthcare workers. The Leader of the Opposition stood there and she could not bring herself to even congratulating all of our health workers who work tirelessly to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. As a matter of fact, the leader of the opposition is now threatening, threatening a commission of inquiry as though health workers perpetuated fraud against the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Roshan Parasram and his team of medical practitioners, they have they are shining examples of what citizens and what we can do as a people. But yet still, yet still, the leader of the opposition stood there and threatening a commission of inquiry as though things have gone. That is very shameful. Very, very shameful. And therefore, I want to take this opportunity and congratulate and thank Dr. Roshan Parasram and his team of medical professionals. I want to congratulate the Minister of Health and all the team of medical professionals who work tirelessly for the government and for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, thereby resulting in a country that has been spared the worst effects of this global pandemic, especially when we compare to what has taken place with some of the most even powerful countries in the world. Thank God we have not seen bodies lying on the streets and in containers. We have not seen that, and we have not seen it because of the hard work of some of the medical professionals and the team of doctors and everyone who put their hands and their head together to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And why is we did that, Madam President, Madam Speaker? Why is we did that? Honorable members opposite took every opportunity and opposed every single program to obstruct this government from protecting the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But today, the honorable leader of the opposition stood there and called for commission of inquiry. Why don't you call commission of inquiry into the operations of the UNC between 2010 and 2015? Call for a commission of inquiry on the conduct of every single member of this parliament who stood and conducted themselves in such a way to prevent policies from being pursued for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Call commission of inquiry on all of them opposite. All of them. 
Madam Speaker, thank God the people of this country know the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank God we know the member for Superior. We will not be lured. We will not be misguided. We will not be distracted. And as a matter of fact, as I listen to the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I remember that very beautiful spite, um, poem by Mary Howitt, 1829, The Spider to the Fly. Will you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly? Tis the prettiest little parlor that ever you may spy. The way into my parlor is a winding stair, and I may have curious things to show when you are there. The spider to the fly. The spider to the fly. And bidding you good morning now, I call another day. The spider turned him around about and went into his den. For well he knew the silly fly would soon come back again. So he wove a subtle web in a little corner sly and set his table ready to die Madam Speaker, upon the fly. Standing order 481, relevance of speech. Members, Prime Minister, members, please continue. And so the spider goes. For well he knew the silly fly would soon come back again. So he wove a subtle web into a little corner sly and set his table ready to dine upon the fly. Then came out to his door again and merrily they sing, Come hither, hither, pretty fly, with pearl and silver wing. Your robes are green and purple. There's a crest upon your head. Your eyes are like diamond bright, but mine are dull as lead. Alas, alas, how very soon this silly little fly. Hearing his wily flattering words, flattering words we heard this morning, Madam uh, Speaker, flattering words came slowly flitting by with buzzing wings she hung aloft, then nearer and nearer grew, thinking only of her brilliant eyes, thinking only of her green and purple hue, thinking only of her crested head. Poor, foolish thing at last. Up jumped the cunning spider and fiercely held her fast. He dragged her up in his winding stair into the dismal UNC den. Within his little parlor, but she's nearer come again. And now, dear little children, who made this story read? To idle, silly, flattering words, I pray you never give a head. Never give heed. And I want to commend this poem to the people and to the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. Be careful of the political conmen and political conwomen. They have lovely words. They dressed beautifully. Some put powder on their faces, both men and women. Some wear wigs, looking beautiful. But the cunning spider who trapped a spider, who is a web of death, seduction, and manipulation. A cautionary tale, Madam Speaker, against those who use flattery and charm to disguise their true intention. That is who they are. And I warn the people of this country of political conmen and political conwomen who are busy spinning their web of deceit to trap the unsuspecting few in our midst. And that is all I have to say in response to the leader of the opposition. We will not be trapped by that. We will not be trapped by that. The leader of the opposition, her ways and the things that happen under her control between 2010 
and 2015 have all rendered her and her team unelectable. Unelectable. And if there is one thing, if there is one thing that encourages me to stay here and soldier on with my team on this PNM side, is that we will fight to the bitter end on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago because the alternative to the PNM remains chaos and confusion. Madam Speaker, I now turn to my focus on the Ministry of Public Utilities. Madam Speaker, it has been a very challenging year, a challenging period for the Ministry of Public Utilities. The public utilities sector, Madam Speaker, it plays an integral role in the development of our nation and the provision of a certain quality of life for our citizens. Both TSTT, WASA, are undergoing restructuring and transformation because at the end of the day, we have to ensure that this country is water secured and that all our citizens and our communities get a reliable supply of water. In the same way, we would have seen, Madam Speaker, that in the throes of the pandemic, digitization, digitalization, telecommunications played a very critical role in holding our citizens and our country together, especially our students and our young people. And therefore, moving ahead, we ought to ensure as a government that our telecommunication sector and our water sector, the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission, the postal services all play a critical role as we seek to advance the economic well-being of this country. The utility sector, Madam Speaker, have been experiencing unprecedented changes driven by rapid technological developments which require utilities to move to agile delivery models using smart networks and increase adoption of digital services and capabilities as they digitize their grids, infrastructure, and improve the customer's experience. TNTech, Madam Speaker, is the sole electric utility company that has overall responsibility for the generation and the transmission and the distribution of the supply of electricity to customers all across Trinidad and Tobago. The Commission's national grid is 99.9 covers 99.9% of the country, providing electricity approximately to 512,000 customers on a 24-hour basis. But before I go on to talk of some of the major projects happening under TNTech, Madam Speaker, let me first give an update on the implementation on the recommendations of the report contained in the island-wide outage on Wednesday, the 16th of September, 2022. Madam Speaker, you may recall, in this house I laid very bare for all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago the findings of that report and the recommendations contained therein. And therefore, today, I am presented with an opportunity to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago on the outcome of the work that are ongoing in the implementation of the recommendations of this report. In this report, the committee noted inter alia that the country's electricity grid or network is robust, very important, that the country's electricity network is a robust one with reasonable redundancy and generally well operated and that no electricity grid is without risk or immune to failure. Very, very important observation. But Madam Speaker, some of the action item mentioned in that report speaks to the completion of the 220 kilovolt Union Gandhi line. A contract for the construction of this line was issued in March 2021, and the expected completion of this uh, Union Gandhi line is February 2023. Very early in 2023, we will complete this project. 
Construction is in progress and the towers have been all installed. The second recommendation, to develop an emergency response plan for power system failure, which must incorporate an incident commander. Madam Speaker, this recommendation was acted upon and it is, has been completed and the incident manager has been assigned his responsibilities. To identify the third recommendation, identify power system vulnerabilities that can lead to catastrophic failures. In response, Madam Speaker, a steering committee has been convened comprising of representatives from the various IPPs, the National Gas Company, NGC, the Ministry of Public Utilities, the Ministry of Energy, and the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission. The fourth recommendation, to develop power system restoration procedures, completed. We have acted upon this recommendation. The fifth, to develop a proper communication protocol between the TNTEC control center and the IPP's control centers. Madam Speaker, I am happy to report that this recommendation was also acted upon since proper communication was now established with both the IPPs and the ODPM via the use of radios. The sixth recommendation, meet with the IPPs to develop a load rejection scheme. This is an ongoing plan. There's an ongoing plan to act upon this recommendation and discussion on this topic continue to take place at the steering committee meetings. The seventh recommendation, to develop various islanding schemes for the power system, and that recommendation is being acted upon. The eighth recommendation, check the capability of all DC supplies for batteries at the various substations that has been completed. To meet with the ODPM to work out mechanism for response during an island-wide blackout, completed. Several meetings were held with the ODPM and an action communication plan was identified and developed. Survey and provide costs for the construction of a double circuit line from BC substation to gateway substation. The survey and the estimate were completed and the estimate is um, somewhere in the region of $500 million to be budgeted and acted upon. And Madam Speaker, I can go on to a number of the other recommendations and to give a status, but at some appropriate time, perhaps in the Senate, I will continue to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with an update on the recommendations that will contain in that island-wide blackout report. In fiscal 2021 to 2022, TNT continues to support the socio-economic growth and the development of Trinidad and Tobago and has made significant investment in the electricity infrastructure all across Trinidad and Tobago. The following projects were completed in fiscal 2021 to 2022. The replacement of two 63-33 kilovolt MVA power transformers for the Ryzen Road project substation completed. The upgrade of St. Mary's Galeota 33 kilovolt circuit, the replacement of defective poles and insulators completed. The benefit of the replacement of age transmission infrastructure all across Trinidad and Tobago in Pinto Road and in several areas, Madam uh, Speaker, they are ongoing and they are very close to completion. And arising out of the nationwide outage that occurred on February the 16, 2022, the Commission has undertaken significant works to expedite the completion of the second 220 kilovolt double circuit bundled conductor tower line from Union Estate substation to Gandhi Village. And as I've said, Madam Speaker, this project is set to be completed in February 2022, 2023, I'm sorry. With respect to disaster preparedness, you would recognize, Madam, Pres Madam Speaker, that as all utilities, like TNTEC, WASA, TSTT, have been all suffering with extreme weather conditions. And as a result of that, TNTEC has embarked upon putting together a robust disaster preparedness plan and strategy. We have so far procured an amphibious vehicle which can traverse through flood areas, swamps, etc. 
and this vehicle is expected to facilitate quicker inspection of the network during and after disasters, and consequently improve its response time for disruption on its network in extreme weather condition. The vehicle was shipped and received at the port of, uh, in Trinidad on September the 12th and will be commissioned in the coming weeks. Using the PSIP funding in fiscal 2021, the commission procured 98 12 21 meter poles as spares under the disaster preparedness program, which in the event of a disaster will be used in the restoration process for electricity or communities impacted by electricity disruption. The poles were all received in May 2022. The commission has also completed the procurement under its tender rules of 750 12.2 meter poles as spares under its disaster preparedness program. The poles were all received in August 2022. And given the increase in the frequency and the intensity of natural disasters resulting from climate change, the, the disaster preparedness program is geared to minimizing disruptions in the electricity supply and quicker response time to outages. With respect to repairs of street lights, Madam Speaker, as at August 2022, a total of 23,017 streetlights have been repaired, and this project contributes to a greater sense of safety and security of citizens, especially during the nighttime. And I can give you the assurance that in the new fiscal year 2023, we will be seeking to ramp up activities in our street lighting program to remove all of the blown lights across our highways and our main roads, and I have already given authorization for the request coming from various constituencies both on both sides of the house to be given serious consideration because I understand and we recognize that our street lighting program is very, very vital to the peace and the security of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I have asked members on both sides of the house to present to me their request, and I look forward to 2023 being an active, year, an active year where we pay specific attention to the lighting up of our streets, our secondary roads, and all our rural communities to improve our security. Madam Speaker, with respect to the Water and Sewage Authority, a lot have been said in recent times in the media with respect to the transformation of WASA. You would recall Madam Speaker, that two years ago we laid in this parliament our, the, the report of the findings of a cabinet subcommittee on the operations of WASA. This report was laid before this parliament for every single member to read and for every single citizen who might be interested in the operations of WASA. That report was laid bare before this house on the instructions of the Honorable Prime Minister. So when I heard the leader of the opposition talking about some secret strategic plan to reduce staffing in Wasa by 2000, I, I was astounded. I was astounded because the views of the government on the operations of Wasa are all contained in a report that was laid before the House. And therefore, and therefore we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to hide with respect to the operations of Wasa. So when the leader of the opposition comes here this morning and talk about some action plan, there is no action plan approved by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to reduce staff by 2,000 employees inside of WASA. I'm not aware of it. I am not aware of it. What action plan? There is one action plan approved by the government of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to, that, um, with respect to WASA. And that action plan speaks to the improvement of water for all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And it has been a public document. But I was hoping that the leader of the opposition would have provided us with more details of what she was referring to. But unfortunately, it was not forthcoming because in their usual style, it is all geared towards riling up the people of Trinidad and Tobago without leveling with them, without any scintilla of truth or decency. And if, as a leader of the opposition, you are prepared to come here and talk about some action plan, give us the details. 
Because I did nothing in this ministry. And so far, over the last two years, we have leveled with the people of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to Wasa. And there's absolutely nothing to hide. And I, I call upon every member of this house, both on this side and that, especially those on the other side. Your constituencies are also being affected by an unreliable water supply. The member for Coover South, the member for Coover South talked about um, water riot because some people in his constituency was getting water once a week or once every nine days and he threatened water riot and I expected the first member on the UNC side to come and to defend and work with the government of Trinidad and Tobago as a member for Coover South. Don't engage in mischief because they are not interested in solving problems. They are hoping that as this government confronts the problem of this country that we become unpopular and it will create an opening for them to be in government. The people in the, of this country don't want the UNC, sorry, to govern them. The people of this country know them. So don't feel as though when we are called upon to make decisions that may not be politically popular, that it is going to present you with a political opportunity to come into government. If you want to come in government, present to us your plans and your program because you always have a plan to remove the PNM from government, but you never have a plan to govern this country. Honorable member, you have five more minutes of speaking time. You may request an additional 10 minutes. I am requesting 10 minutes. Please, please proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And therefore, Madam Speaker, we will continue to pursue our responsibilities to ensure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago get an efficient water supply. And Madam Speaker, as I talk about WASA, we have completed the transformation plan. That transformation plan was passed to the Board of Commissioners for implementation. And I trust that the Board will continue to do its work to implement the transformation of the Water and Sewage Authority because we are all invested in having an organization that can execute the government's plans and the government programs to ensure that the people of this country continue to get an efficient and reliable supply of water. But as we do that, as we do that, Madam Speaker, we would have undertaken a number of plans and a number of projects under the Water and Sewage Authority especially under our community water improvement program, where a number of communities have all benefited from an improvement and an increase in their water supply, low cost, low hanging, low capital expenditure. And I can list a number of these projects, a number of these programs were executed in the UNC constituencies. And some of their own members, they came forward and they would have given their testimonials that these projects under our community water improvement program would have enhanced their lives and improved their water supply. And as we do that, we will continue to ramp up our activities in 2023 to pursue similar types of projects all over Trinidad and Tobago, thereby improving the supply of water. So much so that this program has been so successful, so successful that currently the levels of service the levels of service, 24-7, level of service across Trinidad and Tobago has now increased to 51%. 51%. And therefore, I want to thank the Honorable Minister of Finance for continuing to provide us with the financial resources to continue to pursue these projects and programs. And with a lot more to do in this new financial year, we will continue to do very um, uh, important emergency work on the Karani water treatment plant, the Navet water treatment plant, the North Oropooch water treatment plant. We will continue the desilting of the Hillsborough Dam, the Kualan water treatment plants. All of these major water treatment facilities are all operating below their capacity. And as we believe, as we undertake some critical in intervention to rehabilitate those plants, we are confident that communities all over Trinidad and Tobago will see an improvement in their water supply. In early 2023, in this new financial year, 
We will undertake robust well development program in Siparia, in Penal, in Freeport to increase water production productions, targeting areas that are getting water 24 1 and below. Because we believe, Madam Speaker, we believe that no community, whilst everyone is entitled to a 24-7 water supply, that we have the resources and we have the capacity to bring every single community to at least 24-3 and 24-4 levels of service. And as we do that, we continue to collaborate with our international partners, and I look forward to the implementation of modular water treatment plants in the Sangri Grandi area, in the Ravin Salb area, in the Mayaro area, to increase and improve water supply to over 20 imperial million gallons of water per day to increase and to improve water supply. Even in my constituency of Lopino, we would have pursued a number of initiatives under TNTEC, under WASA, getting the assistance of the Ministry of Sports and Culture, getting the assistance of the Ministry of Housing to pursue programs for my constituency. I want to say as difficult as the task of Minister of Public Utilities might be and consuming, I take the time to go and visit my constituency on a regular basis, and it is because of their support I feel emboldened to continue to do the great work that we are doing at every single level. And I want to take this opportunity and thank my constituents of Lopino Bonia West for their love and for their support because it is very, very critical as we undertake the task of governing the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Madam Speaker, the transformation of WASA is on the way and we are pursuing a course of programs all across Trinidad and Tobago that will see an improvement in our water supply. With respect to leak management, before I move on from WASA, with respect to leak management, when I came into the ministry, there were over 5,000 leak backlogs in, our, in, in WASA. 5,000 leak backlogs. Last year, we commenced a leak management repair program. And I am proud to say that this program has been very successful with a merger of in-house and external contractors to reduce the levels of leaks on the distribution network. And so far, I can tell you, in Tobago, the leak backlog has been completely eradicated. In Central, in South, and Southeast Trinidad, by next week, the leak backlog will be completely eradicated. And as we eradicate the backlogs, as we eradicate the backlog, what is naturally going to be happening is that the system is going to maintain better pressures and there will be a more reliable supply of water to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We anticipate that with this strategy, Madam Speaker, with this strategy, by November, the backlog of leaks on Wasser's system will be entirely eradicated and therefore the, the, the authority will be in a better position to respond and to comply with the RIC standard to repair leaks within 24 to 48 hours. And we are well on the way to achieving this. So we look forward to some of these programs taking place, and I wish to congratulate and to thank the Board of Commissioners and all of the hardworking people in Wasa for the support that they are given in this regard. With respect to road improvements, we have recognized that there are institutional flaws in WASA's management of road restoration. WASA's main mandate is to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with water and wastewater services. And therefore, with respect to road restoration, a decision has been taken to allow for experienced road pavers to conduct road rehabilitation and road restoration, thereby allowing the utility company to focus on its key mandate, which is to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with a reliable water supply. Madam Speaker, TSTT, Madam Mr. Deputy Speaker, TSTT is continuing to do great work. It has crossed the, a very, very difficult uh, process in transformation. And I can tell you TSTT is looking to roll out a suite of digital services to its customers. It has increased 
and expanded its mobile FDD, F, uh, 4G LTE networks all across Trinidad and Tobago. And over the past year, TSCT has expanded, expanded its mobile FDD, 4G LTE network with the deployment of 30 new LTE 700 megahertz sites along with the expansion of top, top 10 congested LTE megahertz sites across Trinidad and Tobago. The company is continuing to do its work to expand its services all across Trinidad and Tobago and will launch a new suite of digital services in the areas of home automation, security solutions, software as a service, SaaS, as well as its best-in-class software e-tender service to all its customers. Recently, the, uh, the authority launched its Palo and its e-commerce platform to support some of our local artisans and our local craftsmen and craftswomen. And therefore, I'm very, very proud of TSTT and the support it is giving to some of our local manufacturers, giving local manufacturers an opportunity to export their products to the region and to the wider world. I'm very proud of them. Madam Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have done a lot of work from a policy perspective. Because at the end of the day, as a ministry, our responsibility is to ensure that we have the legislative and a policy framework to move the utility sector forward. And in so doing, we over the years, over the last two years, would have put together a number of policies and programs in the area of waste management. We would have completed the integrated waste management policy for Trinidad and Tobago, the beverage container policy, the recycling policy. We have currently before the cabinet an integrated water resource management policy, the energy efficiency policy, the energy conservation, and all of these policies putting in place as we seek to strategize and to position the utility sector to continue to be robust and to respond to the challenges that are faced by every single utility in Trinidad and Tobago. By April of next year, we will be in a position to commence the construction of our engineered sanitary landfill in, uh, in South Trinidad. That has been on the books for some time. The Solid Waste Management Company of Trinidad and Tobago would have completed its typographic and hydrographic surveys, its cadastral survey, its geotechnical and groundwater studies. Presently, the authority is working with the Environmental Management Authority on an ESIA as well as a certificate of uh, clearance, environmental clearance. And once all of these statutory approvals and processes are completed, I must say that SwimCall will seek to engage a design build um, uh, consultant to construct a new engineered landfill in Trinidad and Tobago because I can tell you the Guanapo landfill, the Beetham landfill, and the landfill in South, they are all bursting at their seam. They are all at their maximum capacity. And therefore, in Trinidad and Tobago at this point in time, it is a sense of urgency that we move into a more engineered landfill, that we get on board our beverage container um, legislation. We change the behavior of our citizens in the way that we manage waste because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, waste management is very critical, especially as it relates to the protection of our environment and the protection of our water courses and our underground aquifers. May I ask you how many time do I have remaining? Play just over three minutes. Three minutes. So I wish to end, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on some of the social programs because we would have been regaled with so many unfactual matters presented by the leader of the opposition that we are detached and that we don't understand the feelings of ordinary men and ordinary women in this society. I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that under the Ministry of Public Utilities, we have a social sector program to protect our vulnerable citizens. Members on, this, on, the, on, the, on the opposite side would pretend that they don't know 
that over 220,000 citizens of Trinidad and Tobago benefit from an electricity rebate policy by this government. 220,000 um, thousand citizens. Last year, in the last fiscal budget presented by the Honorable Minister of Finance, the rebate was increased from 25% to 35%. And therefore, the government now has to undertake an expenditure of $72 million to ensure that we have reliable electricity services to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about that. And the Honorable Leader of the Opposition would have spent three hours this morning, attempting to mislead the people of Trinidad and Tobago with information that cannot be supported. And therefore, I tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we in the Ministry of Public Utilities, we continue to work on policies and systems to protect the less vulnerable, the vulnerable groups in our, in our society. There is a utility assistance program where 13,000 citizens are beneficiary, beneficiaries of that program, where we assist vulnerable groups, pensioners, to pay their utility bills, their WASA and TNTEC bills, 13,000 citizens. Hundreds of citizens benefit from our water tank assistance program, where we protect, we provide water tanks of vulnerable groups in society, especially in communities by members, represented by members opposite. But yet, you will not hear about it. You will not hear about it because they don't want the country to know of the policies and the programs that we are continuing to pursue to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Under the CWIP program, as I've explained a short while ago, it's another development program of the Ministry of Public Utilities. Plans and programs are being put in place while we seek to transform the Water and Sewage Authority a number of communities on both sides of the house, especially on those opposite, benefiting from an efficient water supply. The member for Manzanilla can tell you that. And so many members opposite whose constituents have benefited from a community water improvement program. And I can tell you, I can tell you, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker, and I can assure the people of Trinidad and Tobago that in this new fiscal year, while we seek to transform the utility sector and make decisions to ensure that the utility sector is always at a position to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with an efficient utility sector program, we will pursue programs to protect the less vulnerable in our society. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for Princess Town. And honorable members, remember, for you have 45 minutes and you have an additional 10 minutes, you will show so desire if you need it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to be able to contribute to the Financial Appropriation Bill 2023. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would also like to take the opportunity as I first start to congratulate the Leader of the Opposition for reflecting the views and pulse of a nation plunged into despair, darkness, and hopelessness. Today, the Leader of the Opposition has given a comprehensive response to the Minister of Finance fiscal package, and it demonstrates her understanding and her ability to deal with the issues that most impact and affect the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and understanding that the challenges that are faced by the majority of our citizens are real. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on listening to my colleague from Lopino Bonnet West, the Minister of Public Utilities, it is best described in terms of the Minister's presentation as feeble, vacuous and puerile. Those were the words that came to mind in terms of the minister's attempt to critique the presentation made by the member for Separia. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I paid close attention to what the member for Lupino Bonnet West had to say, 
I remember attempted to contextualize his presentation by indicating that when this administration came into office in September 2015, that they were faced with so many challenges, especially the challenges affecting the hydrocarbon sector. But then the minister went into a long-winded tirade, regaling us about all the wonderful things that were happening under the various sectors and the various ministries. Today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to ask the minister, if things are so good, why are people bawling? Why are people suffering? Why are people still living in abject poverty? Mr. De Deputy Speaker, after listening to the presentation made by the member for Lupino Bonner West, I can understand why that minister is in charge of solid waste. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the minister failed to say why it is that 4,000 people died of COVID, while thousands of children are still today without devices. The minister did not tell us why did so many of our nation's citizens have to line up for hampers and grants, and still many of them are today on the breadline. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Minister failed to say why so many of our nation's citizens die at the hands of murderers under his administration. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, through you, I have a piece of advice for the Honorable Minister. Next time citizens are murdered in this country, recite for them the poem of the spider and the fly. When next citizens cannot afford groceries in the supermarket, recite for them the poem of the spider and the fly. When people cannot get basic services of water, recite for them the poem of the spider and the fly. That will be your legacy, Mr. Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to add my support to several things the member for Separia said today. And the member for Separia called out organizations and persons in this country who are afraid to call a, a spade a spade for fear of reprisal. And that is political and economic reprisal. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll give you one example. How can we have in this country organizations representing businesses headed, and you know it's always said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you know the backstory to the story, then you understand why people are motivated by what they say and what they do. So when one organization can come out and say this was a thoughtful, well-prepared budget, and that same organization is represented by a family member who gets billions of dollars in construction contracts in this country, you understand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, why people say and why people do what they do. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have seen and we have heard over the last day or two the utter utterances of what have been described as that of Trinidad and Tobago's Marie Antoinette. But today we have almost heard from King Louis. <laughs> because after the last presentation made by the member for Lopino Bonaire West, the member for Separia was right when she described government as being tone deaf and totally out of sync, detached from reality. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in 2021, it was reported that Trinidad and Tobago had 17,000 small and medium enterprises. That was a figure that was provided to us in this house by the Minister of Labor when asked in 2021. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in 2015, there were 23,000 small and medium enterprises. Mr. Deputy Speaker, after the pandemic, we were told that from the 17,000 small and medium enterprises, that 6,000 of those were closing down. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have seen today by the presentation made by the member for Separia, 
that the only people who are suffering apart from the average man, woman, and child in this country are the small and medium enterprises that have been forced to close their doors or who are on the brink of closing their doors. And the, the fiscal measures contained in the Minister of Finance budget presentation did nothing to help those small and medium enterprises, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this budget reminds me of something we say in Trinidad and Tobago. And in local parlance, we often say, say that you live for today and let tomorrow see about itself. And that is the mentality of every PNM administration time and time again. And today, we are reaping the rewards, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of that mentality. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Lopino Bonnet West dealt with several areas in the sphere of public utilities. And I would like to address some of those, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member spoke about the investments that were made, particularly in WASA, in terms of water production, distribution, and looking at alternative supplies. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at the recurrent expenditure under WASA for the year 2021-2022, WASA was cut by $350 million in the area of maintenance, materials, supplies, and employment. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was very intrigued to see what was the allocation that was made to WASA in this year, areas of maintenance, supplies, and contract employment. Mr. Deputy Speaker, once again, WASA has been cut by over $250 million. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this affects the distribution and supply to many of our nation's citizens who day on day in this country suffer for reliable supply of water. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Lopino Bonnet West, almost as if he sought to give comfort to the population that things were happening with respect to WASA and productivity, the minister introduced for the very first time in this budget presentation, the issue of the water modulated treatment plants. And that announcement was made in February of this year. And the minister, when the minister made the announcement of the water modulated treatment plants, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I quote from the minister on February 11th, 2022. The minister indicated that 10 of these water modulated treatment plants will be built across the country to improve productivity and to improve the distribution of water across the nation. But the minister also in that same speech promised that the very first water modulated treatment plant will be delivered in October of 2022. The minister, like the minister of finance, appeared as though he forgot selectively as usual, that he had made that announcement and made that commitment to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am real, reliably advised that not one grain of sand, not one grain of sand has been committed to the construction of any water modulated treatment plant. So therefore that promise and the leader of the opposition told us PNM promises never materialize. The very first promise of a water modulated treatment plant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is bogus and it is hogwash because nothing has commenced in the area of these water modulated treatment plants. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Lopino Bonnet, Bonnet West spoke about a comment made by the member for Separia as it relates to a document she spoke of. And you see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Lopino Bonnet went on to, to, to tell us that the cabinet had appointed a committee to look into 
the future plans of WASA and the restructuring of WASA. That was not the document that Mrs. Pasabi says a member for Sabare spoke of when she exposed that 2,500 employees of WASA will be put on the bread line. You see what the member for Separia spoke of was a document entitled the Strategic Business Plan and Model for WASA that was prepared with government policy to be sent to the Regulated Industries Commission. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is that strategic business plan and model that will inform whether or not the RIC institute new tariffs and new rates. And also, it will inform how the RIC goes about coming up with those, with those new tariffs and new rates. So when the member speaks about, the member for Lobby, no body, speaks about the restructuring plan. It's not the restructuring plan we were speaking about. The member for Sibaria has a copy of the strategic business plan that has been finalized to be sent for, to the Regulated Industries Commission. And on page 53 of that document, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it cannot be disputed because the member for Lopino Bonnet up to now did not dispute the revelation made by the member for Separia that over 2,500 employees of WASA will be sent home. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to remind the RIC. Language is poor. But the volume is offensive, that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Again, okay. Okay, members. Thank you, members. Again, Honorable Member for Princess Song, right? Um, you already have a very distinct, protruding voice. So, again, you know, that's. that's See how best we can work it out. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to remind the RIC that the approach in terms of new tariffs and new rates for water and electricity, and the Minister of Finance was very clear in that the only way in which water and electricity where we will actually see investment into the area of water and electricity production would be through these tariffs. The minister was very clear that there would be no other capital investment because government is dependent on an increase in these water and electricity rates in order to invest that money that they anticipate will come in from the increased tariffs. Outside of that, the minister shows and demonstrates no alternative supply of capital investment in these areas. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to remind the RIC that in de determining these new rates, it's a three-pronged approach. First, WASA and TNTEC has to submit the business plan and the business Mr. model. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I am having some difficulty in hearing my colleagues, so I would ask that the members of the government adhere to standing order 48 Four, five, and six. In terms of okay. their volume. Okay, okay, members. Again, on both sides of the house. Again, if you all can speak in a little more hushed tones, it will be appreciated. And again, likewise, Princess Tong, kindly proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in determining these new rates, the RIC has to look at the business plan submitted by TNTEC and WASA. They then evaluate, and then the third stage is the public consultations. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as part of the review by the RIC, the RIC and their evaluation have to determine whether or not citizens are comfortable or happy or are actually receiving that quality of supply of water and electricity. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, through the public consultation, citizens will have the opportunity to say whether or not they are satisfied and whether or not they are actually receiving a satisfactory Silence, please. supply from both WASA and TNTEC. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll tell you why I raise this. Because when you look at the allocation made to the RIC, for these public consultations, because in the budget presentation, through the Social Sector Investment Program, we are told that the RIC will implement these new tariffs and so on by the second quarter of 2023. Therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one would expect that in the allocations made to the RIC, when you look at the line item hosting of conferences, seminars, etc., there is actually no projection there, Mr. Dep Deputy Speaker. There are no estimates. There are no allocations. So therefore, my question is, how does the RIC intend on airing the views of citizens as it relates to these tariffs, these impending tariffs? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will say to the RIC again that you cannot institute new tariffs without justifying a proper and satisfactory supply of water and electricity to citizens. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, that goes to my next point. You see, at a joint select committee of this very parliament, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a joint select committee of this parliament, the manager of customer control and customer relations at WASA told us that 16, one six, 16% in February of this year, told the Joint Select Committee of this Parliament that 16% of this country receive a full 24-7 supply of water. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the minister then disputed that figure, and the minister said it was somewhere in the region of 30%, but could not give any facts or any data. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have in my hand a copy of something called the Quality of Service Standard Report of WASA. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is an internal document that is compiled by WASA, and it gives a breakdown of every area in Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to the scheduled supply of water. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the RIC standard in terms of how it is aggregated, is that you must receive 48 hours in terms of an average week. 48 hours within, the, within a week. That is the RIC standard in terms of scheduling. Mr. S Deputy Speaker, this quality of service standards produced by WASA, dated August 2022, internal document of WASA, says that 52% of all the areas in Trinidad and Tobago that are on a scheduled supply of water are non-compliant. Non-compliant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 52%. So when the minister comes to the parliament, I remember asking a question about my very own constituency and colleagues ask questions about their own constituencies. Many of us represent rural areas and we have the challenge of citizens not being able to get pipe born water and so on. And we asked him, and the minister got up and he said, he said, you are, all, or you are on a schedule. And then we said, well, minister, but people are complaining. They are not receiving the water. He said, that is not my information. Well, minister, if you do not have a copy of the quality of service standards dated August 14, 2022, that says only 52% of the country actually receives. No, not, not receive, 52% of the country does not receive the scheduled supply of water, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And today we have to hear our colleague from Lopino Borneo West lecture us on the spider and the fly. If the minister was actually doing his work, 52% of this country would have had a better supply of water, but the member is more concerned about Lacare and Bacchanal. Not about productivity and improving the quality of the lives of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it does not get better. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to share with you, on March 7, 2022, a Loop TT article headlined, Wasa assures tap water is safe. It further stated that WASA has launched an investigation into claims that the pipe-borne water supplies causes illnesses. 
Wasser refuted claims stating that they are both false and speculative, as it's not supported by any scientific testing of the water quality, and further went on to say that the authority assured customers that the water currently being supplied through its distribution system complies with the guidelines of drinking water quality of the World Health Organization and is safe for use. This was published on March 7, 2022. One day later in the conversations with the Prime Minister on March 8, Minister of Public Utilities Marvin Gonzalez boasted that for the first time, WASA has put together a business plan and a capital investment plan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, former Prime Minister Patrick Manning used to tell us in this house, facts are a stubborn thing. Ironically, in the said WASA business plan on page 174, it states that while the portable water remains bacteriologically safe, compliance with the physiochemical quality remains at around 65%, although the standard proposed by the RIC is the World Health Organization guideline of 95%. WASA has failed to meet the scientific testing of the quality of water to be consumed by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is not my words. This is what is contained in the quality of service standards. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've been at pains to show you and demonstrate that we cannot take what the member for Lopino Bonnet West tells us are all the great strides they have made with respect to the production of water and the increased capacity of WASA when their very own quality of service standard document is refuting their claim from March 7, 2022, that this water is not causing illnesses and not making people sick and so on, and then their quality of service standard report of August 14, 2022 says that the World Health Organization standard is that you must be at 95%, and how much is WASA at? By their own document, 65%. And the minister must explain that. The minister must explain why you told the country in March of 2022 that we were compliant, that the water was bacteriologically safe, and then your own internal document of August 14th, 2022 says you have failed by 30, over 30% 30 in compliance with respect to the World Health Organization standards. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member for Lopino Bonnier West also shared with us projects. The member spoke again about infrastructure and pipelines and so on. This is a very member, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When I stood in this parliament and I asked about projects that was promised by then Minister Le Hunt as it relates to aging infrastructure, the minister, new minister, Marvin Gonzalez, got up and he said, I had no idea. I don't know what you're speaking of, member for Princess Town. Today, the minister rolls out some of those repeated promises made by then minister of public utilities, Robert Lee Hunt, almost three years later, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Is it that the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing? Is it that this is the approach of this government as it relates to the public utilities sector in this country like everything else, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Lopino Bonaire West indicated that government had allocated $4.7 million to rebates for both water and electricity. First, I want to deal with the issue of the electricity rebate. The Minister of Finance in last year's budget presentation told us that over 200,000 persons in this country, they receive a rebate as it relates to electricity. Mr. Deputy Speaker, based on the impending increase in the tariffs, the member for the Martin Northeast Minister of Finance did not share with the country how many of those 
persons who fall within that 200,000 category will be bumped off from receiving rebates when that electricity tariffs are reviewed and new rates are implemented. Instead, we are told that over 14,000 will receive rebates for electricity and water. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what a tangle web we weave where we first set out to deceive. And that encapsulates the approach taken by the Minister of Finance and the member for Lopino Bonnet West as it relates to the area of rebates. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, how did they move for, from over 200,000 persons in this country receiving these rebates last year to now 14,000? without any explanation. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, members opposite come year after year and they repeat some of these same broken promises, but they also jump from one area to the other with the hope that people will forget what they said previously. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is my sincere hope that the member for Diego Martin Northeast or the member for Lopino Bonnet West will share with the population how did they re move from 200,000 people benefiting from rebates to what is contained in the social sector investment program of only 14,000. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to share with you in WASA's business plan, page 266, it says, based upon the evaluation process described above, WASA is proposing to face in tariff increases to fully cover operating expenses at greatly enhanced efficiency levels by the end of the regulatory control period and to provide funding for a portion of the annual depreciation expenses to move towards financial solvency. Again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the only way for the government to pay its bills is to increase the financial burden of citizens by increasing taxes paid. This government only strategy to generate income and pay its bills is taxation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on page 192 of the plan, it states that WASA has adopted a cost-based approach to its tariff setting, and in so doing, has also reassessed its customer classes as a grouping of customers with similar characteristics enables the matching of service requirements with the cost of providing the service. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it goes on to say, on page 199 to 200, it says the current tariffs for metered domestic customers is based on a two-tiered tariff structure. Customers are charged TT 1.75 for, for the consumption up to the first 150 M3. This submission proposes to reduce the initial tier of the consumption from the existing level. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it also says this change will increase the proportion of household consumption priced at the second tier rate level and is designed to encourage water conservation from the high current consumption levels. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, it went on to say that their plan is not only to introduce new tariffs, but also to deliberately adjust the, tar the parameters of the first tier of the tariff system so that the majority of the customers will fall into the second tier, having to pay higher rates. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it also says on page 200, with the current tariff structure for metered domestic customer, customer consuming 443 M3 per year will pay a volumetric total tariff of TT 776. After the reduction in the block of consumption from 150 M squared to 45 M squared per quarter, tariffs for customer consuming 443 M squared year with an increase to TT 1262, an increase of 78% in the volumetric tariff. Considering the elasticity of 0.15, the customer will reduce their average demand. So their volumetric tariff decreased to TT1113 instead of TT1262 that will result from a higher consumption. So while they are only focused 
on reducing demand, Mr. Deputy Speaker. They ignore the tax-paying citizen. The average customer will now, according to these calculations, have to pay 78% more for water supply, one that is not even safe for consumption. Instead of focusing on reducing demand, why isn't the focus on improved cri crippled distribution infrastructure and introduced strategies to increase water production? You see, the government wants you to think that they care about you, but in reality, they only think about and invest in themselves where the population is fed to the wolves. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is what is happening with respect to WASA. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you would permit a few minutes, I would like to deal with the issues of TN Tech. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I saw a few weeks ago, and it's almost as if the Trinidad Express has now awoken, but I have been asking this of the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, the Minister of Finance, Diego Martin, North East, for the longest while. And that is, what is the rate in terms of the natural gas that is being sold from NGC to TNTech and whether or not that subsidy has been removed in whole or in part? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I saw the Trinidad Express picked up this issue a few days ago, but it's almost as though it's shrouded in secrecy. And I'm hoping one of those members will be able to tell us what is the going rate now, because as far as I understand, this rate is fixed by the subcommittee of energy, um, who then passes on that price to NGC for the purchase for TNTEC to purchase natural gas. Mr. Deputy Speaker, something that is being parroted in the public domain, and I hear the member for Diego Martin Northeast speak about it in his budget presentation. And the member speaks about the $7 billion that TNTEC owes to NGC for the provision of this natural gas. And the member says this has been happening for the past 10 years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is the furthest thing from the truth because this debt that is owed from TNTEC to NGC, that occurred under this People's National Movement Administration post general election 2015. Mr. Deputy Speaker, up to 2015 when the People's Partnership exited office, TNTEC did not owe NGC those, that $3 billion that the minister scribes happened under the People's Partnership. So therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm hoping the member would spend some time dealing with how do you intend on clearing the $7 billion debt and also clarifying to the population how did the PNM allow that $7 billion debt between NGC and TNTEC to occur? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was hoping to hear from the member from Lupino Bonaire West, and the member almost as if he took a page out, the honorable member that is for Lupino Bonaire West almost took a page as though he just took a page out of the report into the power outages. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, this was not one power outage. This country has, has experienced two power outages, and we have had, and we have seen dips in electricity over the past couple of weeks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. No explanation. The member told us what was contained in the report about what occurred at the Gandhi Village substation, but the member did not tell us what investments were being made so that we would not see those reoccurrences happening again, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We were not told about what is happening in terms of the maintenance of these substations, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We were not told whether or not additional stations that will carry the excess load will be filtered into another area. Nothing about investments in those areas that will have a direct impact in terms of the public utility sector in this country, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Those were the things we wanted to hear about from the member for Lopino Bonaire West, but instead we got some hogwash about fly and spider, but very little about water, electricity, things that impact on the day-to-day -day lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Madam Speaker, as you resume the chair, I want to spend a few minutes on TSCT. And Mr. Deputy, Madam Speaker, up to this time, we have not been provided by this government with a reason for the acquisition of Massey Communications at a cost of over $255 million. 
much of what the member for Diego Martin Norti spoke about in terms of a cashless society and fintech and all these things is dependent, uh, Madam Speaker, on the software and the technology that is available through the companies that we depend on to provide these services. Madam Speaker, since that purchase in 2017, 2018, we have not seen an increased capacity in terms of TSCT being able to provide the software and the security to enforce any of these platforms. I heard a member for Diego Martin Nortis in his budget presentation said that 100,000 products will be launched on this platform and that they will utilize this platform to create small and medium enterprises by advertising. And also at the same time, they will utilize that platform to receive the payments from persons not only purchasing these products locally, but regionally and internationally. And the member for Separia was spot on, Ms. Madam Speaker, because just a few weeks ago, we saw TSCT's system crash. We saw Massey stores in this country, their, their, their system of payment going down. But the member for Diego Martin Northeast tells us all these grandiose bravado plans are contingent on the support that they receive from TSCT, but cannot tell us why after spending $255 million to acquire Massey Communications, TSCT is in the doldrums. The only thing that has occurred since then to know is that TSCT has hired a spin doctor, paying them $50,000 a month, while you have sent home over 3,000 employees at TSCT. The only thing that has occurred at TSCT, Madam Speaker, is that while you sell off the assets of TSCT in my own constituent, Princess Town, this tall high-rise building, vacant in San Fernando, right here in Port of Spain, what they're doing is instead they're renting properties from friends and financiers up the road, Ms. Madam Speaker, in Lopino Bonne West, in that constituency. And Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Speaker, sorry, the, this and these are the challenges that are affecting the public utilities sector in this country. And Madam Speaker, we expect nothing to change, you know. All these plans are plans that we've heard before. All these policies are policies. Standing order 48-6, please. Okay, so. Finish? Explaining. Um, overrule, member, I just would ask you to audit your volume. Okay, um, I know you have a full voice, but you have to try and audit your volume. And I also remind you, you have five minutes left of speaking time. You may, if you wish, ask for an extended time of 10 minutes. <coughs> Have my extended time of 10 minutes, please. Madam Speaker, I now turn to the area of digital transformation. But before, Madam Speaker, I turn to digital transformation. The member for Dago Martin Northeast. Madam Speaker, the member had the audacity to speak about modernized infrastructure as it relates to the public utilities sector. And Madam Speaker, I'll say this. It is vexing to say the least, because my colleagues and I have been raising the issue of dilapidated aged infrastructure for a number of years being the primary reason for the poor production and distribution levels across the country. While the minister has announced the creation of the Office of Water Resource Management, and Madam Speaker, essentially what that does is take out the component of water production out of WASA with the establishment of a board of its own with commissioners and so on. Really, it is for the government to micromanage that process. And one wonders why government wants to micromanage that process. Does it have anything to do with the 10 water modulated treatment plants that are being promised? Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Minister of Public Utilities 
spoke about the creation of this water resource management. Madam Speaker, it's almost as if government is lapping up their own political vomit. Because you see, Madam Speaker, in 2015, we were told that several ministries were being condensed and that they were closing down the Ministry of Water Resources and returning to the Ministry of Public Utilities. It was the creation of that Ministry of Water Resources that saw under Kamla Pasabi's administration that over 76% of this country had pipe-borne water. That was the reason why we were able to, to, to create so many policies and programs, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we had alternative areas and supplies of water in this country. Madam Speaker, when you look at the allocation for wells and the creations of alternative water supplies under the Ministry of Public Utilities in Wasa in the recurrent expenditure, Government could not even spend what they allocated. So what it in fact told you, Madam Speaker, is very little new wells had been developed, very little new infrastructure had been developed, and with a cut of over 350 million last year and 250 million this year in the area of material and supplies, there had been no major projects as it relates to dilapidated age infrastructure, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, communities across the country have been plagued with dry taps. You only have to ask people in Kokorit who protested last week in Digger Martin for the people in Barakpur who has had not a drop of pipe on water since last month. Our poor aging infrastructure continues to be one of the main challenges affecting the sector. But instead of investing in upgrading the infrastructure, the government has systematically driven WASA and, dare I say, TNTEC and TSTT into the ground, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I turn to the area of digital transformation. And the member for Separia, again, spot on in her presentation. Madam Speaker, for two years, this ministry has been in existence. This ministry is supposed to be the cornerstone, the platform in which many of the projects identified across government agencies and ministries should take off. But Madam Speaker, when you have the Ministry of Digital Transformation not being digitized themselves, then you know, Madam Speaker, very little will continue to happen because there is neither the political will or the know-how to get it done. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance has mastered the art of what is referred to as clickbait. Madam Speaker, clickbait is content whose main purpose is to attract attention and encourage persons to buy into something that looks good on the surface but may not actually be so in reality. Therefore, Madam Speaker, clickbait aptly describes the government's approach to digital transformation. Madam Speaker, digital transformation was one area in the minister's budget presentation. 50, 53, one. Madam Speaker, 53 1F. If the members opposite cannot be silent, could you invite the member for Princess Town to re audit his volume upwards? Well, okay, so uh, members, generally we have no difficulty in hearing the member for Princess Town. I just ask all members to be guided by standing order 53 with respect to their, their volumes. Continue. Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, digital transformation was one area in the Minister's budget presentation that I highly anticipated because it is an area that has a tremendous amount of opportunities, especially for the youth of our nation. After the Minister of Finance and others repeatedly gave us the assurance that Trinidad and Tobago would be fully digitized by 2025, a lot of what was announced in previous budgets on the digital transformation has either been abandoned or stultified. But we should not be surprised as the government is symptomatic of clickbaiting citizens. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance clickbaited the nation when in his 2022 budget presentation, he promised to provide supporting legislation to give effect to creating a digital society. But like everything else, the minister was only interested in the buy-in by the population and not the actual end result of a digitized environment. Madam Speaker, if we turn to page 21 of last year's budget statement, the Minister promised a cybercrime bill, amendments to the Telecommunications Act, and laws for national digital identity. 
Up to this time, Madam Speaker, there has been no mention of any of these pieces of legislation. The government in 2017 sent a cybercrime bill to a joint select committee that has not been resurrected since. Our telecommunications act in many parts remain antiquated and do not meet the requirements for the times that we live in with respect to a global, technologically driven world. Madam Speaker, it appears that the government has once more abandoned its own legislation, its own joint select committee, and its own promise to the people of the nation. The announcement of a legislative framework for a digital society has been nothing more than clickbait. Madam Speaker, I would demonstrate why the Minister of Finance is like a parrot on a stick, afflicted by repetitive compulsion symptomatic of a psychological phenomena in which a person repeats themselves over and over and again with little or no results. This is a government that lacks continuity and moral authority when it comes to the legislative agenda. Therefore, the budget statement continues to be a re rehash, Madam Speaker, a rehash of the same old rhetoric from the Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, the clickbaiting does not stop at the promises the Minister and his government made with respect to supporting and creating a digital society through legislation. The minister once more copy and pasted out of last year's budget the establishment of a national e-identity and interoperability solutions. Madam Speaker, if we look at page 22 of the budget 22 statement, the minister said, and I quote, the national digital ID and interoperability ecosystem will be facilitated by a unique digital ID which identifies the user as we move ahead in our digital nation thrust. In 2022, we will introduce a pilot project. Madam Speaker, today I want to ask the master of clickbait, the Minister of Finance, was this just a grandiose soundbite filled with buzzwords that sounded new and exciting to you, or whether this project has actually commenced? My information, Madam Speaker, is that this pilot project does not have as much as a pilot pen because it has not commenced. But again, should we be surprised when we have to expect only public relations and gallerying in a sector that could be creating jobs and modernizing the way in which we do things across the public service. Madam Speaker, it is astonishing that as far back as May 3rd, that the Prime Minister in the Trinidad Guardian was reported as saying that he wanted a unique e-identity card for every citizen. Now, Madam Speaker, I know members of the government has a partial for local parlance. So let me say that in the Trinidad Express of September 8, 2022, mouth open and story jump out. You see, when the Minister of Digital Transformation, Minister Hassel Barkas, indicated that the plan might be changed, we are now being told, Madam Speaker, that in 2020, that while they had all these grandiose plans and projects, the Minister is now saying that we are not able to achieve any of that. Just two weeks ago, the Minister at a post-cabinet press conference said that they were unable to achieve any of these projects in digital transformation and that they are lagging behind, but they are working speedily to rectify the problem. Two years ongoing, Madam Speaker, cannot digitize the Ministry of Digital Transformation, cannot bring on board any of these projects under the ministry a mouth open, story jump out, the Minister of Digital Transformation tells Trinidad and Tobago that none of the projects that they have envisaged have reached the stage of completion and in many cases have not even started. Madam Speaker, for several years, the member for Separia have been advocating for technology in the hands of for putting technology in the hands of our nation's children. The member for Tabakit, I anticipate, Madam Speaker, in her debate, will deal with the issue of education and technology. But, Madam Speaker, in the area of, uh, and the sphere of business, the member for Diego Martin Northeast, again, with much gusto and bravado, beat his chest loudly last year when he spoke about these business incubation, incubators. The minister told us that we will be outsourcing services through small and medium enterprises in the area of ICT to regional and international companies. Again, as though, though the minister had abandoned those plans and policies, 
Not one mention of it is made in the budget statement. And when you look, Madam Speaker, and the member for Sibaria told us the devil is in the details, when you look at the allocations, there is very little or nothing in those areas that suggests to us that no jobs were created and that no businesses, in terms of the small and medium enterprises, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, benefited from this program. Madam Speaker, in the area of the ICT centers, the member for Dago Martin Northeast for the past seven years has been promising 100 ICT access centers. Madam Speaker, when you look at the minister's budget statement, this is what it says. The community ICT access program was expanded during 2022 from the original six centers to 32 centers. We are well underway to achieving our targets of 100 centers. Madam Speaker, again, without any achievable targets, the minister was unable to tell us out of those 100 ICT access centers, how many have actually come to fruition. Madam Speaker, I am told that out of the 100 ICT centers, only six of those centers are accessible. Yet this government comes with foolery and mamagai, hogwash, when they speak about 100 ICT access centers, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, what are these ICT access centers? These are actually putting the software and the hardware in terms of computers and internet connectivity and so on in community centers. Many of these instances, it is community centers that they are utilizing. Madam Speaker, again, they cannot even get these projects off the ground. Madam Speaker, in terms of the digital hub, this was an area I had great hope for. I hoped it would have been a tremendous amount of progress. And however, instead of the minister reporting on the achievements in the area, he just shamefully repeated the broken promises of the digital developer hub. Madam Speaker, this is another sector that will suffer the same fate as the public utilities sector, Madam Speaker. Fluff, mamagai, bravado, but very little actual, real, tangible results to impact on the lives of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Deputy, Madam Speaker, I want to take the last few moments I have really to advocate on behalf of my constituents in the constituency of Princess Town. The only time the roads in Princess Town were ever fixed post September 2015 was when the PNM was campaigning for the Maruga Tableland seat that they lost to Michelle Benjamin. That was the only time they fixed the roads in Princess Town because they had to traverse on those roads to campaign in Maruga Tableland. Madam Speaker, I'm advocating on behalf of my constituency for our roads and our land slips to be addressed. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues as we point out the woes, the shortcomings, and the lack of political will to increase the quality of life of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly as I have addressed it in the area of public utilities and digital transformation. And as I look forward to hearing from my rest of colleagues. The Minister Madam. of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this debate. And I thank the constituents of St. Anne's East for the opportunity to represent them here in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, forgive me if I move directly into my contribution without reference to the last contributor, but just to say that I have never maybe experienced more, a more ironic contribution. Talk about clickbait. Not a recommendation, not a solution. Madam Speaker, the constituents of St. Anne's didn't send me here for that. So I want to congratulate the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Planning and their teams, Madam Speaker, for the hard work, research, and the analysis involved in producing this fair budget to Trinidad and Tobago. When I say a fair budget to Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the budget was not all roses. That's a fact. No one can feel happy about price increases, even if one understands the reason behind them and why it is done. 
Madam Speaker, another fact is that things are not as easy as they once were in the world. And Trinidad and Tobago is a country of the world. Ireland, yes, but we exist in this space with everyone else and therefore, as have other governments, this government in Trinidad and Tobago has had to implement fiscal measures that though necessary may not be desirable nor popular. But Madam Speaker, these are the things that leaders must do. Leaders must make the hard decisions when it is time to do so. And I assure you, Madam Speaker, that these decisions are not easily made. No government wants to be in that position. But when the rubber hits the road, the people of Trinidad and Tobago elect us to do what is best for our country. Madam Speaker, regardless of the hard decisions that, made, that were made, that were, had to have been made, all is not lost. And I'm here to speak to education, one major asset, Madam Speaker, that has not been removed from the people of this country and the young people of Trinidad and Tobago is educational opportunity. Madam Speaker, if you were to question many of the members of this honorable house on both sides, they will tell you stories similar to mine. Some of our leading national professionals, our athletes, they will tell you, and the leader of the opposition herself alluded to the fact that educational opportunity is a critical thing. And this has always been a legacy of the people's national movement, opportunity to education for all. Like many of my colleagues on both sides of the house, Madam Speaker, that was the one thing available to me, education. I come from sunshine in Sawo, and I'm saying it just like how I say it when I'm at home, sunshine in Sawo. And now I'm speaking to all the parents and students who have challenges. I know what it is to have challenges. I know what it is to wear one overall from form one to five, to not be able to pay school contributions, to wear my brother's old school shirts to school, to not have textbooks, to buy cloth in the crazy right where KFC is now, there was a cloth store, buying cloth there to sew my own clothes on my mother's machine. So I know what it is to have challenges. I know. At that time, there was no gate when I had to go to university. There was no gate. Thank God my grandfather was able to stand security for my student loan, and my parents couldn't do it. That's how I got to UE. I'm speaking about educational opportunity. I'm speaking to the young people who feel that there is no hope, speaking to you. I can afford one textbook in UE. I still have it today because it's a testament to what I, the challenges you had to overcome to get where you are. All the others you have to borrow from the library. Worked hard at UB, got through there. By the time I finished my master's program in UB, which I worked in UB to be able to afford, couldn't pay for that tuition. I had two children to care for, so I'm speaking again to the young parents, the young parents who are looking for opportunity. Know the struggle. From UB, went in as a teacher in St. Francois Girls, didn't have a car, traveling to work, two children. While I was there, three children now, my husband wasn't wasting time, Madam Speaker, three children now. Hmm? NUE, finishing a PhD, repaying a student loan. Thank God there was the opportunity to get a student loan because without that opportunity, PNM policy, I would not be able to finish my studies at all or even embark on them. It was rough, it was a struggle. And from St. Francois to Costard, from Costard to politics. So, Madam Speaker, I know the value of educational opportunity, and I know the opportunities it can bring, not always immediately. But if you don't have a ticket, you don't have a chance. And on this job market, where it is not roses in any country, one has to avail themselves of the opportunity available. So I want to hold out some hope to our young people, some hope to our young parents. Because I know for a fact, I'm an MP. People message me all the time. I speak to them all the time. Some people feel very hopeless coming out of COVID-19, the challenges that came with that. 
And I want to hold out hope because there is educational opportunity in Trinidad and Tobago, and I want to encourage us all to take the advantage of it. Education may be free in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, but it isn't cheap. The funding to provide educational opportunity is in order of $7.5 billion annually, with the Ministry of Education itself being allocated $5.5 billion. Parents, parents, I'm speaking to you now. Help your children attain the best education they can. Focus on it and young people. Take advantage of the opportunity. Do not waste it. Break the cycle. The opportunity is there for you. Regardless of all the other difficulties that we face as a country and as a world, the opportunity for educational achievement in Trinidad and Tobago is still there for you. Aim to complete your post-secondary or tertiary education. The government provides funding to COSTAT, MIC, UTT, NESC, YTEP, and UE so that they can operate and offer educational programs across a wide range of areas. This year, in this budget, $1.3 billion, sorry, $1.3 billion is allocated to these institutions. If you are doing CAPE, there are 100 scholarships available for the top performers to go to university. $178 million is allocated to that. 500 bursaries are also available for tertiary level studies. And you have to pass a means test to be eligible. What this says to the young people who feel they have challenges, it means that if you are a person who needs the help, you are at an advantage. Forget these bursaries, 500 bursaries. It was done this way to help those who need it the most, to get down to the people who are high achievers and need the support. Don't waste the opportunity. $25 million is allocated to provide these bursaries this year, young people. Even if you don't get a bursary, you can still get up to 100% tuition covered through GATE for a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Up to $450 million will be spent on GATE this fiscal. 400 already allocated, and more will be supplied in the midterm as necessary. Leader of the opposition, you know how this works. Don't clickbait the population. You know that the midterm is there, and if they need more, we will supply more. Some of our young people, you have to work after Form 5. That's the reality. So your part of bachelor's degree is different. You may have to do a part-time diploma and associate degree. The gate has now been opened for you again. You can access funding twice for the first program and then for the bachelor's program. Take advantage of it. Madam Speaker, I was a lecturer at Costat and I witnessed firsthand what was happening with gate in some, in some years. It was a misuse. There were students regging, registering for courses and just dropping out. Madam Speaker, we do not have money to waste like that. We have money to apply to persons who are serious about their education and who are serious about their personal development. So yes, we have had to put strictures to ensure that the money that is spent, the investment, goes where it should go and is used as it should be. I was there firsthand speaking to students and encouraging them, don't just drop out of the course but because it was just free. That's what was happening. The leader, of, the leader of the opposition spoke to the disbelief that they would get access to gates. Disingenuous, because the leader of the opposition knows that we can get access to increased funding for gate if it is required. And I want to explain that the cabinet has already approved this. Funding and grants has already been a prize of this, and the measure is in effect. So young people, go out and get your gate. If you already have an associate degree or a diploma, you have until 2024 to register for your bachelor's. And if you are doing your associate now, you have two years in which to register for your bachelor's. We put out the press release so that you would know the public, our young people, would know the opportunities that you have to be able to further yourself. 
We said we would increase the number of students assist accessing assistance for tertiary education from 400 scholars only to 600. And Madam Speaker, we have done that. The national bursaries are in place. 464 helped in 2020, 455 in 2021. So we are set and ready to go up to 600. Performance beats soul talk, Madam Speaker. So young people, fear not. The leader of the opposition may not believe, but I believe in you. This side here, we believe in you. And we will continue to give you the best support that is possible. So go out there. The gate is open for you. Develop yourself and take advantage of educational opportunity. What about the students who need to repeat subjects? Many times our students don't get all at the first try. You can register right now. Registration is open with the Ministry of Education for free tuition in certain subjects. And we're doing a hybrid system, so it's more convenient. You have some online classes, some physical tutorials. Register now. Get your second chance, and your second chance at doing the CXC exam, whether it's January or June next year, will be free as well. So we are catering for if you're doing CAPE, if you're not doing CAPE, if you need to repeat. We are catering for all of that. Educational opportunity. Follow the Ministry of Education socials. You follow it for yourself and see what is out there for you and take advantage of it. And I want to tell you, Madam Speaker, one of the main champions for young people for giving them opportunity is our Honorable Prime Minister, and I salute him today for that. Even in the midst of difficulty, the Ministry of Education has maintained approximately 10% of the annual budget over the last seven years, Madam Speaker. This is what priority in education means. That's what it means. Madam Speaker, when I spoke in the 2021 budget debate, you may recall that only a few students were out to school physically, a few thousand. There was still at that time a high level of uncertainty with respect to a full return to physical school operation. As a matter of fact, every time we mentioned that students had to get back to school physically, there was a loud outcry. Many called the government wicked to even consider sending the children back to school physically. Sometimes you have short memories, don't you remember? Others call for school to remain online forever. Madam Speaker, it was again no easy position to be in. Because as a responsible government, we knew and we said that our children, especially the younger ones, would be compromised by the lack of physical engagement. We knew this, but we had a duty to prioritize the safety of the students as well. Madam Speaker, we established the Ministry of Education's Education District Health Unit. We consulted repeatedly with our stakeholders and we gradually transitioned back to the physical classroom. We moved from totally virtual engagement in March 2020 to the physical attendance of forms four to six only in February 2021 to rotational attendance of all secondary school students and standard five students in February 2022. And finally, Madam Speaker, in April 2022, our ECCE primary and secondary students returned to school physically, most of the first time in over two years, and we have not looked back. I want to draw it to the attention of this honorable house that even in the worst of times, Madam Speaker, the most uncertain times, terminal examinations were physically conducted by the Ministry of Education. SEA 2020, 2021, 2022, CXC, June 2020, 2021, and 2022. January 2021 and 22, thousands of students out physically to do their examinations. The workers alone to administer those examinations, 3,500 short-term workers over the time, every year, to administer these exams at a cost of approximately 30 million per year. Careful organization logistics was required to carry out these exams from 2020 in the heights of the pandemic to 2022. But that allowed over 120,000 young people 
the opportunity to progress along the educational pathway in the midst of a pandemic, Madam Speaker. Had we shirked this responsibility, where would these young people be today? How would they continue their educational progress in a world that was moving on? Madam Speaker, I had a daughter who did exams in those times, Minister Maurice Julian, other members of parliament here, 120,000 young people who benefited from the careful work to afford them the opportunity to progress their education. Madam Speaker, leadership is not an easy road. It requires fortitude, testicular, ovarian, and otherwise. But this is the oath we took, to serve in the best interest of all the people without fear or favor. Madam Speaker, I wish to publicly thank the staff of the Ministry of Education who have worked diligently to bring us to this point. You see, it's not always obvious how difficult this period was for the non-teaching staff of the ministry. And on behalf of Minister Morris Julian and I, I want to thank both permanent secretaries, the chief education officer and his team, the DPSs, and I want to call the heads and support staff of the departments that make up the ministry because, Madam Speaker, they all played valuable roles in getting us from where we were to where we are today with our children back in the physical classroom. So, Madam Speaker, bear with me. Supervision, curriculum, student support services, IT, health, safety, and environment, communications, ECCE, research and planning, education district health unit, teacher training, exams, education planning, educational research and evaluation, programs and project management, educational facilities, procurement, HR, legal, IR, scholarships, funding and grants, general admin, school health, safety and security, educational technology, finance and accounts, nursing, textbooks, school boards, and the permanent secretary and ministerial secretariats and all other departments of the MOE, thank you. Thank you for your hard work in getting our children back to the classroom. I want to also thank the leadership and staff of the public, post-secondary, and tertiary institutions, MIC, YTEP, NASC, COSTAT, UTT, UE, for getting our students, our young people, back into the physical classrooms and sustaining them during this most difficult time of the pandemic. Madam Speaker, our students have gone through a traumatic time and having worked together to successfully transition them back to the physical classroom, we have to do all we can to help them settle in and get down to business. Whatever the situation, all of us, parents, teachers, administrators, staff of the ministry, policymakers, all of us have to put country first and stabilize the learning environment for our children to the best of our ability. I want to implore us, let's leave the children out of big people business. They have suffered enough. Let's prioritize their time in the classroom and make it count. Our future as a country depends on that. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the output of the education system is critical for the future of this country. We can make all of the best policies, the best plans, but if we do not have the human resource to carry it out, then we are going nowhere fast. And what we are facing is a human development problem. That is what COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19 have exacerbated a human development problem. We are investing billions of dollars annually into education and training, and we are doing that to produce citizens that are committed to driving the development of Trinidad and Tobago in an upward trajectory towards the realization of Vision 2030. That's the goal, creating citizens who will drive the development of Trinidad and Tobago towards the realization of Vision 2030. That Vision 2030 policy document begins with a profound statement, and I want to quote it. There are times in the development path of a country when extraordinary challenges demand an equally compelling response. These words seem almost prophetic. They were written in 2016. 
but they seem almost prophetic because they did not and they could not contemplate the extraordinary challenge that we would face as a country a mere four years later, which would be the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. What are the specific challenges that we face in the education sector? Some of them legacy issues, which have been exacerbated by the extraordinary challenge that was the COVID-19 experience. I'll list five. The need for an organized system to deliver the curriculum to students when physical school operation is not possible. The requirement to modernize data collection, management, and analysis at all levels of the Ministry of Education. The urgent requirement to produce globally competitive citizens with 21st century skills. The urgency of increasing student achievement and equity of educational opportunity, mitigating the effects of learning loss. And five, the need for critical school infrastructure upgrades and maintenance. These are the challenges that we must apply the 5.5 billion allocated to the education sector to surmounting. There are some facts that must be laid on the table, Madam Speaker. Of the 5.5 million allocations in Ministry of Education, approximately 2.2 billion is used to pay teachers. 1.3 billion goes to subsidies to post-secondary and tertiary institutions. One billion is allocated for school repair, school feeding, school transport, janitorial and security services at schools and scholarships. 200 million is allocated for grants to government or government assisted schools, as well as for students in private and special schools. Add another 800 million in salaries for non-teaching personnel, equipment, vehicle maintenance, exam fees, etc., and you have a rough accounting of how that 5.5 billion is allocated. Another fact. The reforms, adjustments, and transformations required to overcome the challenges we face in the education sector are complex and will take time and sustained effort to implement. There are different options available to achieve the desired outcomes, and depending on what is observed during implementation, it may become necessary to switch or adjust the methods being used. And the last fact, is that progress will be highly dependent on the input of all stakeholders. No one person or category of persons can affect the changes that are necessary to surmount the challenges that we face. So an important factor that will lead to success is collaboration and buy-in from all of the stakeholders. So having identified five main challenges, let us now turn to the budgetary allocation and how it will be used to deal with those responses. The requirement to modernize data collection, management, and analysis at all levels of the ministry. Madam Speaker, if the ministry is to respond in the way that is expected, in 2022, the staff and student records must be digitized as soon as possible. And this is the purpose of the student management system. And this digitization is ongoing. Digital records of attendance, grades, student bio data, disciplinary records, special needs, all of these can be used to generate reports that yield important information for policy making. For example, the SMS can be configured to show when a school's performance is dipping or when a student performance is dipping. And that can be used to design intervention strategies at the right time. The ministry will be able to verify enrollment of students, placement of teachers in short order, independent of school records. That is a fundamental thing, and it can only come with digital records. This platform, developed by the MOE's in-house IT team, is being populated. A pilot of 70 schools has been completed, and a data entry firm has been engaged to continue the input of data. You can imagine, Madam Speaker, the size of this project. We have over 800 schools, we have 250,000 students, and therefore putting in that data, verifying that data, which of course is very important, is a huge project. The security of the data is also paramount. And so we have been working hand in hand with the Ministry of Digital Transformation to ensure that those records are kept securely. With respect to teacher records, Madam Speaker, teacher records are kept physically. If you've ever seen a teacher file, it's a huge file. No wonder that things get lost, misplaced, and this has 
implications for teachers' salaries and, of course, at the end of it, their pensions. So that is also being digitized using the IRIS platform. And so that is ongoing now at the ministry and in-house team is verifying data, teacher numbers, putting in the data, scanning files, and that is ongoing at the Ministry of Education. And the goal is to reduce, if not eliminate, the issues that our teachers are having with, for, for a long time with their salaries, with their increments, etc. Madam Speaker, the level of efficiency and access to information required by the Ministry at this time necessitates this fundamental operational shift from manual records to digital systems. The need for an organized system to deliver the curriculum to students when physical school operation is not possible. Madam Speaker, if there's anything COVID taught us is that we must be versatile. And we saw the tertiary institutions being able to move online seamlessly. We need that for primary, secondary, and ECCE. When schools closed across the world in March 2020, educational resilience became a mandate of all education sectors. And so around the world, all education sectors are involved in getting resilience. And that means that they are now building out e-classroom systems, school learning management systems for all of their schools to ensure that in the case of any other situation like COVID, our students can continue their educational continuity. And therefore, we in Trinidad and Tobago are doing the same. So our school learning management system, a national school learning management system, is important because it gives us important national student data. It allows us to securely store records. It is a repository of standardized student and teacher e-resources. All of that information that is placed on an e-classroom. You have standardized, high-quality e-classroom templates, access to support and training for parents and teachers, and it's a hub for accessing other platforms such as e-books and continuation classes. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Educational Technology Unit which has been formed as a response to what has happened with COVID. They are working with 70 schools, hand in hand with the school ma student management system. So the information being input on the SMS is being used for the school learning management system to build out the e-classrooms. Digital infrastructure at schools, of course, goes hand in hand with this. And so over 9,000 teachers have received their laptops and devices. Students have received between 2020 and 2022, 63,000 devices have been distributed to our teachers and our students. This year, another 20 million has been allocated to replenish the stocks of devices at the schools, as well as to continue giving devices to the students or teachers that may require them. As of August 2022, all secondary schools have been outfitted with Wi-Fi in their offices and common areas to ensure that they have the access to be able to use the SMS and the SLMS. 14 schools through UNICEF, of course, are partner of the ministry. 14 schools have received Wi-Fi throughout the entire compounds, extending outside of the compounds. So these schools are acting as community hotspots. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we will be having more schools outfitted by UNICEF into this academic year. 57 rural primary schools have also been outfitted with Wi-Fi through a collaboration with TAT, B-Mobile, and Digicel, and they are now working. They are now working to get more primary schools on. So during this year, we have 20 million allocated to the digital education program, and that will be part of what we are doing, building all the Wi-Fi infrastructure in more schools. Mr. Deputy Speaker. I can assure you that educational resilience is a top priority for the Ministry of Education. The urgency of increasing student achievement and equity of educational opportunity, mitigating the effects of learning loss. Mr. Deputy Speaker, school closures caused by COVID-19 resulted in dips in student performance globally. And of course, in Trinidad and Tobago, we would have seen that same pattern being repeated. What have we done to mitigate the learning loss. Increasing student achievement and equity of education opportunity, we have selected 26 schools, secondary schools, that need our support and our, which the students of these schools need our extra monitoring and the input of resources. 
In addition to that, the program already ongoing, those 26 schools, a budgetary allocation of $50 million has been given for remedial education. So what are we doing and how are we proceeding to use that $50 million? The annual vacation revision program will be something that will be continuing into the next five years, and therefore that will allow students in the vacation time to be engaged in learning. Dedicated student support services personnel have been assigned to these schools. Learning support assistants, three each in most cases, have been assigned to these 26 schools. Targeted teacher training, student training, School and student needs assessment so that we can find out which students have special needs and require assistance. Timetable adjustments to the operation of the school-based intervention team. This is an important part of the school-based management system that allows the teachers to take a look at what's happening in the classroom, which are the students that need support. And we have asked these 26 schools to put aside time in your regular school day to look for these school-based intervention team meetings. Put it as a part of the school day. So it doesn't happen after school as an afterthought. It's an integral part of identifying the students who most need help. With the 50 million allocation, Madam Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are now able to expand this program of support to 25 to 30 primary schools, which generally feed into 26 secondary schools that we are focusing on. And that is critical, because before the students end up in a situation where they have to go through remedial efforts, we want to address the issues. So these same measures that we are taking for the 26 secondary schools, we are now going to implement them in the 25 to 30 primary schools. Another important part of this adjustment is the curriculum adjustment, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is important, we've been speaking to our principals, and they have told us a couple of things. That TVET engagement has to start at Form 1 in a formal way, so we have done that. And that engages the students and reduces the attrition, because we lose students from the secondary school system who feel they have no hope, they're not engaged, and the school has no relevance to their lives. Another important thing is giving students two years to acquire fundamental literacy and numeracy skills that they did not have coming out of the primary school system. At the Form 2 level, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are going to institute the lower secondary proficiency examination. A different name, but the same thing that would have been called the primary school leaving. When students did not achieve at the standard five level, they were given two years to achieve fundamental literacy, numeracy, and general knowledge skills in science and social studies. That is what is happening at the secondary school to ensure that these students are at the level of Form 2 with literacy, numeracy, and general knowledge. Life skills is also a part of that. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is happening and what has been happening is that these students have been just leaving the secondary school system with nothing, no qualifications, unprepared to develop themselves, unprepared to develop their country and to contribute to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. So we have taken action now to meet the children where their needs are, to give them what they require to develop them into productive young people. So at the level of Form 2, they do this certification, and they have a certification in their hand that can be used to find employment. So in case they fall away, they will have something rather than nothing, because that is what we have been facing over the last many years. So our students, that curriculum adjustment to ensure that they leave school with the fundamental literacy and numeracy to be able to contribute to their country and take care of themselves. Reducing student indiscipline. One of the greatest challenges to school achievement and student achievement is indiscipline. You would have seen, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that Cabinet approved the revised National School Discipline Matrix, and an important part of that is the encouragement of our students in positive behavior management and showing them, reinforcing positive behavior, not just dealing with the negatives. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you would have seen as well recently that the Ministry of Education is entering into an agreement with MILAT. <coughs> And we are entering into that agreement with the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service to ensure that students, repeat offenders, 
students who need support, who are crying out for it. When we see students misbehaving and fighting and so on, it is a cry for help. And in the education system, it may be more than the Student Support Services Division can deal with. They need more support. They need an immersive environment. They need to transform. And we have seen Mylat successfully have that transformational system. And so the intention is when we have offenders in the secondary school system, students who just can't help themselves getting into trouble, we want to offer them that support. We want to wrap the arms of love around our students. And so we will be moving them into the MyLAT program to receive that level of care and support. Because you want them to transform. We want them to do better. We don't, we're not giving up on them. We have to put them into the space that is already established that can help them. The ministry met with the Girl Guides, the Scouts, the Cadets, and principals of the 26 secondary schools because we want to encourage more of these organizations to be a part of the school system, as they were before. We have asked the NPTA, we have written to the NPTA, reaching out to them to partner with us so that we can provide the guiders and we can provide the support the school needs, the leaders of the chapters in the different schools because our young people need positive engagement. They need options for that. So we are not sitting down and just saying they're misbehaving. We are doing the things that will offer them positive engagement, positive development. And that is what we are using, Madam, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to increase the student achievement, the school achievement, equity of educational opportunity. These are some of the measures that we are using. Of course, the community police continue to partner with us in 17 schools, and they are also encouraging the students from the schools to join the police youth clubs in their area. Very good work being done by the police youth clubs, and that is what we need. We need the engagement of the communities to guide our children so that they're not just hearing it in the schools, but when they go back to the communities, they're getting the same types of messages. With respect to globally competitive citizens, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we need to encourage an appreciation of culture and tolerance in our children. We need to create cultural confidence in our young citizens. The ministry is formulating a patriotism policy, which would encapsulate all the things on the official curriculum that we are doing, as well as the unofficial curriculum. Because you want to ensure that our children love themselves, love their country, and they are they learn about Trinidad and Tobago and the beauty of our country, the wonderful people we have here, our leaders, our icons in the sporting arena, the cultural arena. So we are pulling together that policy and we will be bringing that to the cabinet for approval and implementation. The music program for primary schools. During the COVID time, this went dormant. We are revitalizing that program in all of the primary schools, not just some. We are revitalizing it in all of the primary schools and the music tutors will have a mandate to encourage the school to participate in at least three national competitions and execute an annual school production so that our students will be involved not just in their academics because our principals are saying to us that the students, the problems they are having with the students, not just academic, it's the total development of the child, the morality, the ethics, the teamwork, all of these things. And COVID did not help that. So in pulling together all of these activities, it will mean that our students have the opportunity to develop holistically, and that is what we are doing. Digital literacy, you would have seen us do the SCA results portal this year. You would have seen us speak to CXC e-testing being expanded in January 2023. There will be more students taking e-testing from CXC. The online continuation classes where the Classes, the second chance classes for our students will be offered in mostly an online um, version, so therefore they will have familiarity with the online environment. The ebook platform being procured right now um, by iGov for the Ministry of Education. I spoke about the student management system, digitizing all records, the student learning management system where you have now the e classrooms being created. All of these things will encourage in our students the acceptance of digital education and move our transformation along. I come to the need for critical school infrastructure upgrades and maintenance. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, the importance of physical school having been established even as we speak to advances in digital transformation, the physical condition that school plants must be maintained and upgraded to support our students. The Ministry of Education's team has been moving around the country to different schools. Moving around to understand the exact environment of the school, who our principals are, what's happening with our teachers, seeing the infrastructure of the schools, understanding the challenges faced by our principals and teachers, and also the successes, because there are many in our education system. Some important information on the age of schools. Approximately 30% of schools are more than 60 years old. 42% of primary schools, 18% of secondary schools, more than 60 years old. 70% of primary schools, 33% of secondary schools are between 40 and 60 years old. So we have aging school infrastructure. So school repair is always ongoing. Every day, every single day, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have an average of five schools where we have emergencies that need attending to plumbing, sewer, electrical. And these things are taken care of as soon as they arise to ensure that school operations take place. But the time has, has come for us to sink some capital expenditure into school repairs. And therefore, you will see in this budget allocation an increased allocation for school repair so that we can take care of more of our schools. And it is anticipated that more funding will be required. And therefore, we will take advantage of the opportunity in the midterm to get some more funding to deal with schools. But at this point in time, we will use the 150 million that's allocated. Honorable member, your initial speaking time. You have two more minutes. You have an additional 10. Do you care to avail yourself? I will, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <coughs> so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are going to use that allocation, 150 million, to do some critical repairs at our schools. Some of the things that need to be focused on, the VAPA areas, visual and performing arts, the sporting fields, the labs, critical. These are the areas that our students are most engaged in, in most of our schools, and therefore we have some critical work to do at our schools. The leader of the opposition mentioned the unfinished school plans, and I, I want to not spend too much time in it, but to say that a school construction program a properly planned school construction program requires that funding is allocated before the contracts are given out. If you just give out contracts without finding funding, what you are doing is just frustrating yourself and others. And unfortunately, that is what happened before this government got into place. So we have been dealing with it. We have been fixing as we go along. We have spent 400 million so far to complete 13 schools, and we have another phase upcoming of seven schools at 270 million, and we are continuing to complete the school construction as we go along. That's in collaboration with the capital expenditure that will be put into the existing operating schools, as well as the emergency repairs that come up every single day to ensure that schools continue to operate. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've outlined five specific challenges which face the education sector and the manner in which the allocation of the ministry will be used to surmount them. I take this opportunity to thank our teachers, our principals, students, all of our education stakeholders, corporate Trinidad and Tobago, who has been contributing in a valuable way for their continued partnership with the Ministry of Education. The collaboration and that approach is the only way we can help our education sector move forward. Our children need us now. Our future needs us now. And if we intend to build back better and to avert the human development crisis that has been precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic, it will take all of us working together in harmony. I turn to my constituency of St. Anne's East and as I thank them for their confidence in me and for sharing me with the national community. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I can assure you that they are definitely the wind beneath my wings. I want to thank the staff of my constituency office publicly because they do so much for my constituents, take care of them every single day. <clears throat> I demand a lot of them, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
We have monthly hamper distributions. We have weekly distributions of fresh bread. We have a free flea market Friday where we open our doors and mem members of the community come in and they can take all of the items that we have gathered, useful items, for free every Friday. We have an annual Easter bonnet and basket competition for ECCE going on for five years now. Poetry slam to introduce literacy, encourage that for a primary school, spelling B every year, done in conjunction with NALIS. Essay competition, we just finished that for our secondary school students. We have virtual events. For this vacation period, we ran a vacation revision program for our Standard 5 students. We have a cooking with teens, post SCA program in the vacation as well. We do Christmas lunch for seniors. We are doing an entrepreneurship program for young entrepreneurs in 2023. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are a very busy constituency, and I thank my staff for ensuring that all of the initiatives take place for the benefit of the constituents of St. Anne's East. We have a saying, we like to say this, life is better in St. Anne's East. It's true. You know, that's just how it is, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Infrastructural projects. We have just opened the Maracas Valley ECCE Center, and I know that the residents of Maracas Valley are very happy for that. It's something we've been clamoring for for some time. And we have the pending construction of the Maracas Bay ECCE, that is on the cards. Water infrastructure, Upper Mayfair Gardens, Febo Village, I want to remind Gasparillo, Saddle Road, Las Cuevas Road in Maracas Valley, Luengo Village. I want to assure you that the Minister of Public Utilities has been working with us and we expect to get some improvements in these areas as we move along. He has a plan that he is working and we are looking forward to that. The Minister of Sport and Community Development, she has already given the commitment for us to deal with the refurbishment of the Marcus Bay Community Centre, Las Cuevas Pavilion, and we're looking to the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the Las Cuevas Fishing Depot. We know we need to get that done. We are also thankful for the work that has been done on the Saddle Road, as well as the Maracas Royal Road, and we know that that is always something, due to the number of persons in these areas now, that is something that always um, we are looking forward to more support on, and we're thankful for what we have, and we're looking forward to more. I want to thank the CPEP workers, the forestry workers, the URP workers, because they do an important job in keeping our communities well maintained. I want to thank them for that. I want to thank the councillors, the chairman of the San Juan Lavantel Regional Corporation and the Tunapuna Regional Corporation for the service that they are doing on the local roads, drainage and so on because our constituents, my constituents, benefit from the work that they are doing in these areas and I am grateful. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to thank you for the opportunity of making this contribution as I reaffirm my commitment to the constituents of St. Anne's East and to the people of my beloved Trinidad and Tobago. As we continue to work hard, and as we continue to invest billions annually in education and training to produce the citizens who are committed to driving the development of Trinidad and Tobago in an upward trajectory towards the realization of Vision 2030. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you. I now recognize the member for Tabakit. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to this very critical budget debate. I am joining the debate today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, coming in after the Minister of Education. I think it's a well-known fact now that I have been given the responsibility by the opposition to shadow this very critical education sector. So I am positioned to go into significant details because I think the minister's presentation today is characterized by the sheer dissonance that this government has with respect to what is going on with the reality in Trinidad and Tobago. And I say that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because it is clear that they live in a completely different Trinidad and Tobago from the rest of us, completely. And as we go through this debate and we listen to the ministers come one after the other, and as they have been doing since Monday, 
attempting to defend the indefensible, attempting to convince Trinidadians and Tobagonians that the realities, the harsh realities that they are facing either does not exist or isn't that bad. I think, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we must thank the, the leader of the opposition who came here today in defense of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And the leader of op the opposition used her contribution to clinically outline where we as a citizenry in this country face utter levels of mistrust with this government because you simply cannot trust them. And so I've had the opportunity to not only listen to the contributions here today, but the significant contributions over the past couple of days, and in fact, the past few years. And when I say there's a dissonance in the government messaging, what I mean is that what you hear coming from them time and time and time again, and what we know to be happening, I mean, you have no clearer example than when the Minister of Energy turned into Kanye West on CNN and told all of us we live in a good life over here. And so that you, you listen to that. You listen to the good life rhetoric. You listen to things are going so well. We have to be so grateful. I mean, all they haven't told the population yet is that shut up because we minding all year, right? Re relax all yourself. The, the government is minding you, the nation. And so when we are being told that the, we have to be grateful, we have to be so happy with the management, when we are being told that we want everything for nothing, but then we realize that we are getting nothing from the government. I mean, how do you want the population to react? What should be our reaction now? Our reaction now should be to, to say, good job. In the face of record failures in the education sector, we ought to say, good job. I mean, the self-congratulatory messaging coming from the government as the opposition leader rightfully said, is not only tone deaf, but it is absolutely insulting to a very discerning population. And as I go into the education sector, one thing struck me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I listened to the Minister of Education. I am not sure where between 2010 and 2015, the Minister of Education was, but I'm sure it cannot be in Trinidad and Tobago. I am sure. Because when I am listening to the, the, li listening to the list of programs that they are intending to pursue, I want to understand if you were in fact an educator during that time, then you must have known those programs existed between 2010 and 2015. And even if you don't know that they existed, I know for a fact that when you go into a ministry, records are kept. They don't disappear. When you go into the Ministry of Education, what obtained, what happened between 2010 and 2015, the records exist. The systematic dismantling of programs that you are now announcing as new, they exist in the Ministry of Education, so it's just a simple matter of reading. This attempt of revisionist history to pretend that you are solving problems that you have created we will not accept. We will not accept it. And so I want to start with GATE. I am starting with GATE because I think the messaging here is obscene at this point. It is obscene coming from the government. Minister of Finance on Monday came, came forward and said, we are expanding the GATE program. The Minister of Education followed that line. Do you know when those changes happened to Gate, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Early after winning the election of 2020, this government, this PNM administration, embarked on the systematic closure of the very gate they are now claiming to open. Imagine that. So if you want to tell us about his levels of shamelessness, is that you could come today and purport to be, to have the solution for a problem that you created. Imagine that. I want, when you, you, we are talking now about the, that they are talking about expanding gate to amend policy guidelines. 
right, that they amended in 2020, which restricted pro funding for no more than one program at an undergraduate level. Now, when, at that time... Um, Honorable Member, one second. Honorable Member, I heard it on the two occasions. Please, you will have the opportunity to enter the debate. Fine? Proceed. And so, so as I was listening to the Minister of Education today, I had to take a minute and figure out what is really going on here. Because I remembered early on in my parliamentary career, I had to write a press release after the announcements in November, followed by some press conferences because we were very disturbed by the changes to gate. And at that time, I said, the decision by the government calls into question the sincerity of the PNM's administration's commitment to creating a better life for citizens and creating hope for the future and opportunities for future generations. And that still obtains today because you, you, know, you are talking about an administration that is so incredibly short-sighted so incredibly short-sighted that you are reversing poor decisions that you have made just in 2020. Imagine that. So they had to be the only people in the world that did not understand that when you are choosing to pursue tertiary education, those of us, we have different parts going through the system. And the minister came to acknowledge it today. Where was your voice for these students in 2020? Because you were already the minister. Where was your voice when cabinet sat down, everybody sat down and made these decisions that you are now seeing the fallout of? No. No. That we've all, that these students, I am in my first year as a member of parliament. I had a call from a very distraught student. She did not know that when she was going to pursue a diploma and she utilized GATE, because at that time, families were already hit very hard. The, the, the available funding to pursue tertiary education for a number of families had whittled, whittled away to nothing. And then you find out that in your pursuit of a part-time diploma, and you utilize GATE, and I think it would have been something like $12,000. They utilized GATE at that time to pursue that. And then when you make it into your bachelor's program, you've made it into your bachelor's, to be told that you have no access. You had no opportunity. It was callous, it was heartless, and you attempt to, re to revise the decision now. Does not change what you've done to those students then. And so, I, I, you know, I am listening and, and, I'm, and I am appalled by the level of shamelessness that you could come here with because, and talk about the expansion of GATE. What did you meet when you came in in 2015? Now, I'd forgive the minister now because she was not minister then, but again, you have access to all of the documents. A simple matter of learning the sector um, which, which you have responsibility for. And so when you, you, you talk about, and the Minister of Finance spoke about, how are we going to create more opportunities? What are we doing? You, it, you are coming here today to encourage students, participate, take advantage of the opportunities. The People's Partnership Administration, understanding that we needed to balance coming out of the, the tertiary education sector and in fact the secondary school sector, the reduce the number of job takers and increase the number of job creators. What does that mean? It means that Trinidadians and Tobagonians must be told that you can be entrepreneurs, you can be innovators, but not only just be told that, but there must be incubators for these types of developments. And so we initiated creative programs, such as Idea to Innovation, Lumination, programs where young scientists can be promoted into the space of entrepreneurship and innovation. You close all of that down, all of that, right? Because you remember, 2015 was the year of tighten your belt. It was the year, just before COVID, eh? there had no COVID in 2015. It was the year. 
It was the year of wean yourself off the government, right? So between 2015 and 2020, citizens, are, their belts have become so tight, they are starting to suffocate. And now we must tell, you're telling us we must be grateful. Imagine that. We, the People's Partnership Administration at that time, looked as well outside of just Gate and looked at the Higher Education Loan Program, HELP. And this allowed a, a student revolving loan fund. Now, you know, and I'm raising this now, because just this year, I have a concerned parent calling me, very concerned. Her daughter, very well qualified, did everything right, did everything she ought to do, and gotten to a postgraduate program. We all know, you all close the gate on postgraduate program, so you have no access to a gate for postgraduate training, okay? Right. But on top of that, to add insult to injury, the access to the health program has also been limited. Nobody told no one that. Parents are being put in this kind of complete state of run around. You can't get this, you can't get that. Can't. And so the programs, what the program started, the student is ready to go, cannot attend. Cannot attend. Now this is, a, this is to access a loan which they intend to pay back. So this idea of weaning yourself off becomes irrelevant. But you can't access that. And the Minister of Education came here today to tell parents, go ahead, encourage your students, encourage your children, gaslighting the people left, right, and center, selling dreams, telling them it is available when they know, because they are living it every single day, they know. It is not available. Do you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that when we look at the GATE program again, you know what has been happening? Parents are, so, so you've applied, you've done your means test. Again, citizens doing everything they could and getting nothing, right? You applied, you put, your, you put in your, your paperwork for the means test. You are approved for a certain amount. Lo and behold, the gate payout is late. Not surprising, right? Because with the level of inefficiency we see here from the government, you cannot, I cannot imagine that, that they are overseeing anything in, in any proper fashion. So your gate payout is late. So parents wanting their children to be able to register for school on time, etc. You then take a loan. Right, you take a loan from a family member, however you do it, right? You get the money as best as you can to start that semester, just so your child could have the opportunity. When you've done that, whatever rake and scrape you've done to get the money, when so you get the payout, and then when you apply for the next year, you're told, mm-mm, mm-mm, you don't qualify. Seems like you can access the financing. What kind of disingenuity is that? What absolute terror are they raining on the parents of Trinidad and Tobago? How can you justify, as our government, running our system in that manner? It is appalling. And then, as I said, to come here and stand today and say the opportunities are abounding, go and take advantage of the opportunities. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the question of the laptop program. The Minister of Finance, the Minister of Education today, both of them reference the fact that they reference the digital education program. Sounds amazing. Sounds revolutionary, right, digital. Let me tell you what that is. Their key successes in the digital education program, the first one is that they have distributed 7,000 laptops from, to means-tested students and teachers, and a total of the 63,410 devices between 2018 to 2022, okay? And that the, they have um, outfitted the secondary schools for wireless access. 
That is a digital education program that has cost us something like $45 million to date. What they have done, in essence, is take a transparent, accountable laptop provision program where you knew when you passed SEA and you went into Form 1, you had access to a laptop. They scrapped that. They saw no value in that. They told us up and down the country how much of a waste of money investing in students in digital education was in 2015. You had a former minister of education telling us that they are going to put laptops in schools because I can only assume that that minister did not know the difference between a laptop and a desktop. So you rest the laptop there and you tell them, don't move it. Right. Then you have the new minister coming now to tell us, they've let us pat them on the back. Congratulations to the government. They've given out 63,000 laptops between 2018 to 2022 to teachers and students. How are you accounting for transparency here? You took a transparent program. You took, you took a program where you knew where you would be able to access the laptop. You could have expanded the program. You could have delivered devices to students in secondary, in, in, in primary school. You could have done a lot of things. Instead, you scrapped it. You created a problem. You bring a half-baked, half-measured, I mean, ridiculous excuse for a new laptop program. You don't want to call it that. You, you don't want to call it a laptop program, so you call it a digital education program. And you cannot admit that what you've presented to the public is less than what they got before, ineffective, inefficient, and responsible for the learning loss that you are now lamenting. So just like it, a problem that you have created, you, you are now presenting a solution that is ineffective. And so I now want to turn to what they are talking about as the learning loss as a result of the pandemic. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have on previous occasions, and I'll reiterate it here, the statistics are available for anyone who's interested. The reduction in our passes started since 2016. 2017, the, the results were lower than 2014. 2018, the results were lower than what, they met, what, what was our last year in government in 2014. And they, they continued to be reduced. Were the, were the results exacerbated as a result of the pandemic? Absolutely. But were they on a downward trajectory? Absolutely. And why is that? It is because the, the PNM's policy towards education was a systematic removal of everything that worked. Everything that worked, you, you strip it to bare bones, and then you wonder why things were failing, why, you were, why the sector was collapsing. And so here we are. In the period 2017 to 2018, Speaking to a standing finance committee of the previous house, the former minister of education, talking about the fact that the passes they were seeing then were already starting to decline. Listen to the years, eh? This is for fiscal 2018. So this conversation is happening in 2017. No COVID, no pandemic. Okay, just so we clear. The first, the one, in, so they're talking about a project entitled Creating a Culture for Student Achievements, tw 2017. And the first component of that was a primary school component where you took standard five remedial initiatives, which seeks to identify students who are at risk of underperforming at the standard five level and treat with the causative factors such as learning disorders and psychological factors. And the second component was a form one initiative, which would provide remedial support um, for the students who scored lower than 30% in the 2017 exam and those who were assigned to secondary schools. Because already, 
you had an increase in the numbers of students scoring below 30%. Let us be reminded, 50% is still the pass mark. Okay? Right. So here we have a former minister discussing a remedial program. As, as it were, it was an exercise in futility then, because you discuss something, you, you come here, you, you stand up, you list off all the programs, pat yourself on the back again. Good job, everybody high fives all around, we're doing a good job. Then you go back to the ministry, you shelve all of that, and our students are left to fend for themselves. Because clearly, that had to have been what happened in 2017. Because we saw no progress for students in 2018, in 2019, and now we get to 2020, and then all of a sudden we blame COVID. Oh my goodness, this is happening because of COVID. It is dishonest. It is absolutely dishonest because it was happening before. And so when you, when you come to the parliament, and now mind you, why I'm able to reference things from 2017 and 2018 under a previous minister is because while we have a new minister, we have the same PNM policy, eh? so there is no difference in what the PNM is doing to our education sector. You could change who, if you don't change the policy, you will have no changes in the outcomes. So, here we have. Today, I listened to the minister announce happily, I, Minister of Finance raised it too, that there will be, but let's, let's ground it in what happened this year. This year, we had a significant number of students not passing the SE exam, not demonstrating the competency required for a secondary education. Let's be very clear about that. This is no laughing matter. It is no joke for our nation. You had the implementation of a vac vacation revision program. You had a vacation that, that, that $10 million was allocated for. You had a vacation revision program that you are telling us in two weeks, the two weeks have, has elapsed, but you told us that we would get a report on the successes of this program. To date, we do not have that. What we do know is that less than half of the students who were from that 9,000 not passing the exam, less than half access the program. We don't know for how long. We don't know for how many, we don't know how many students completed. We do not know whether or not the program was indeed a success. We actually won't know now for another two years, simply because the exam that you are taking to prove that you've demonstrated competency to access a secondary school education will take place in form two. So we are now wait and see. Clear on that? Right. Now, you have told us that a program that we do not know whether or not it has been successful. We know we're spending $10 million. We don't know if it's successful. We don't know if it has been successful. We don't know how those students will perform in the next years. We are going to keep that program for five years. Make it make sense, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How are you going to keep a program that you don't know whether or not it's successful? Why are you allocating more money to it if you don't know it is meeting the desired outcomes? And that is why I have had the cause to say over and over, that what you are facing in the education sector is not a resource problem. So you could come here and say, listen, we are doing so well because we've allocated X billions of dollars to the sector. But what you are facing is not a resource problem. You are facing a competence problem because the persons that you have directing, steering the course, are not competent to deal with the problems facing the sector. And that is why we are seeing what we are seeing. I want to tell you now, in the vein of the discussion of the vacation revision program, and why I said from the beginning that what we are experiencing here in this house is an attempt of revising history, pretending that the years 2010 to 2015 did not exist or whatever good existed was because we had money and I would just posit it's because we had sense. It's not just dollars and cents, it's just common sense in some of these cases. Actual technical capability to run these institutions that you saw the difference. 
But there was, in fact, a, key, a set of key deliver deliverables on literacy and numeracy that led to significant improvement nationally, which led to the highest academic performance in the history of Trinidad in 2014 in all three exams, SCEA, CSEC, and CAPE. They found support for literacy and numeracy uh, with a universal after school and homework study centers, utilizing a dialer teacher program, setting up a toll free help in math and English language for SEA students, math, English, and integrated science for CSEC students, courtesy of partnership between Ministry of Education and TSTT. That occurred before this government came into power. That occurred before COVID. When I stood up on several different platforms during the pandemic, referenced this program, said, why are you not partnering with TSTT? Why are you not employing different sectors in the, in, during, in the arms of the state to create more accessibility, even in the in, during the pandemic, when we could not meet, we couldn't congregate, there was no face to face. You had things on the books already. The, the, the plan has been drafted out that you could have utilized to mitigate against the learning loss, what did they choose to do? They chose to be reactionary. Now we want to hear about homework centers and study centers and vacation revision program after the students have not passed the exam. After they're anticipating reduction in passes in the next year. So that is when I say, you cannot be the solution because you are the problem. These are the things that I am talking about. In 2015, they would have met over 280 remedial teachers who are specifically trained to target students who are underperforming, and close to 300 substitute teachers in the primary and secondary school in different subject areas. Now you had 2022 for the vacation revision program, because apparently nobody over there reads, nobody knows what's going on. You rushing around now, we have to train teachers. We have to train teachers. Optimize what was already there. If you're not bad, spend money. You're not going to be complaining about where the money is and why and we don't have this and we don't have that, you know. You ignored things. You ignored things that were built that were there, that you could have built upon. You could even tweak it. If you don't like X, you could change it. You could make it more your own, but you didn't have to scrap it. It is the mark of a short-sighted government that cannot build on what they found there before. And then in, during that 2015, 2010 to 2015 um, time period, there was a coaching program introduced for primary school students and secondary school students where 169 coaches were hired, trained, and deployed in school. You listen to the minister today, the, the conversation on positive reinforcement, the requirement for positive reinforcement, and making sure that we, the students can meet people and they have coaches, and that, that existed before. It existed before, you scrapped it. Now you're trying to bring it back like it's new, after you've created a problem. After, and this problem has been ongoing. This is not COVID related. Don't let anybody mama guy you here today. It was before COVID these things were happening. And then one of my favorite parts of today's contribution from the Minister of Education, that we need to ensure that our students leave secondary school with some sort of skill set. All of a sudden, there's a recognition that there is a need for technical vocational training within the school system. Amazing. The, 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 while, we, while I sat in the other place, I recall the former Minister of Education telling us why we needed to reduce access to technical vocational training. And today, the minister is announcing that we are doing certain things to allow persons to leave school with some skill set. You get some training, and then everybody's you know, beating the desk. And again, all of the, the high fives, we're doing so good. It, during 2010 to 2015, the Caribbean vocational qualification at the, sec at the secondary school level was increased from 42 to 102. 
at the initiative was aimed to increase the number of secondary schools offering CVQ regional occupational standards so that each student may graduate with at least one occupational skill. You met it, you close it down, now you're trying to bring it back, brand new program, ridiculous. It is ridiculous, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the program then spoke about the holistic development. At that time, over 5,200 students would have participated in the CVQ offerings at the secondary school level. Imagine how many more could have participated if we could have just erased the PNM from the last seven years. If we could just wipe that clean, we would have been so much better off. And so the rhetoric, the rhetoric coming from the other side, from the government, is always like, it could have been worse, you know, guys. Things are bad, but it could have been worse. It could have been terrible, awful, right. It could have been better. It absolutely could have been better if you were not there for the last seven years. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. And so, and so when you, you come to the population, you have to be, at the very least, honest about what you've done. But the good thing is, I don't know if the government believes that because they stopped the laptop program, nobody in the nation has access to the internet. All of this information is readily available. The information that I have quoted, you can find housing documentation under the Ministry of Planning during the years 2010 to 2015, which would have uh, outlined what programs existed then. You can find the information for in terms of what was cut by the government based on their press releases. So that you, they, I mean, they readily gave us this information. And then I listened again to the, the, the question of school violence. And we are here for you, we support you. Okay, absolutely. What happened to the student services, student support services? Time and time again, every budget, when they're looking for money for God knows what, they're cutting the student support services. Th there was a hotline that was launched for the national, the national student hotline to provide professional counseling to students with confidentiality. There was a, a circle of hope which led to weekly interventions within the schools. They spoke with teachers and students who may have issues. The, the program, was robust so that you had guidance counselors, guidance officers, school social workers to treat with educational, behavioral, and clinical psychologists within the school system to ensure that you had a space where we looked after the mental health of our students. They cut it out. They cut it out, you see any school violence, and then you're saying, oh my, let's do something about it. Imagine that. And so this pattern occurs time and time again with the government. And that is the dissonance I am talking about. That is the duplicity that I am talking about. That is the, the, the detachment from reality that the opposition leader spoke about this morning. That you could stand here and recite things that you close down, that had they been operational in our darkest times, you would not be facing the problems that you are facing here today. And so, as I look through the education sector, it would be remiss of me, as the representative of Tabakit, not to raise the critical issue of school transportation services. When we talk about the high cost of back to school for parents, when I listened to the Minister of Education today give the story of her access to education and the, the sacrifices that they may have had to make, is it not the responsibility of each generation to build so that the other generation has it easier? So you're telling me because you had a difficult time of it, or many of us in the house may have had a difficult time. 
everybody going forward must have a struggle, that we must all be on the struggle bus together. Is that the PNM's policy, that we will all be on the struggle bus together with the members for Diego Martin West and Diego Martin Northeast driving the struggle bus, and we must go along happily? This can't be like that. And so when I listened to the Minister of Education talk about traveling to school and having to travel to school, let me tell you what's happening today. Today, 2022, back to physical reopening of schools, you have parents in Tabakit whose, whose children are going to school in San Fernando. I raised it here at the Media Review. I raised it before. We wrote several letters to find out about what is occurring with school transportation. They told us it's happening. It isn't. We live in Trinidad, right? We live in an area. You know it's not happening. Students, uh, parents are paying $70 one way per child to go to school. That's $140 per child to go to school. That is pre prior to the fuel increases that we just had. So I, I can't tell you what the increases may be, but that's what was occurring before the budget. And I, I was on a panel discussion with the Minister of Trade on Monday night after the budget. And this is what I talk about, the absolute detachment from reality. The Minister said, you know, it's a nominal increase, right? When you are struggling, when your belt is so tight, that small increase for some, for others, is the tip over the edge. It is the tip over the edge. And so you are wondering why there is so much discontent from people, why people are so unhappy when you, because you could come here and say it's a fair budget when the budget is tipping some persons over the edge. They were on the edge and they may be going over now. Because you cannot tell me that you are paying $140 per child a day and then you could tune, on, tune into Parliament and hear that school transportation services are being provided for who? So, where, so where's the bus? Where is the bus? We must know if the bus is passing. It is ridiculous, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And so I call on the Minister of Education, on the Minister of Finance, to ensure that the school transportation services, particularly in rural communities across this country, are up and running, and that the routes have been, have been done in conjunction with the schools and the parents so that there is active consultation and you're not sending buses to go from point A to point B and the children are not going to school there. Okay, so that you have to be, when we ask for data-driven policy, it includes things like community consultations. For my area, I know, and as for many of my colleagues on this side, we would have written numerous letters. I know the member for Orupuch East has been begging for the Ram High Trace in New School. Because those students where they are housed right now are unable to get to school in an easy fashion, but you're telling us about opportunities. You are telling us opportunities exist. And so a main factor, a main factor of this government's um, budget presentation this year, you heard a lot about the, the, the digital thrust. Where are we going, the digital highway? Right? The very same government that is struggling to maintain a regular roadway is going to put us on the digital highway. Excuse me if I am a little bit mistrustful. Because you are looking at, in my constituency of Tabakit, several areas. The, main, the Bonaventure main road. And this is why I had to, when I listened to the member for Tobago West and, and, I, and, and we heard the everything for nothing statement. Is it everything we get in? What simple things like road infrastructure, the people of Trinidad and Tobago have to be fighting for, protesting for, left, right, and center. And I know, I know as the government sits in their seats, they have managed to convince themselves that the opposition is stirring this up. But you have to be driving on the road too. I know the member for, for Point Forty knows exactly what I am talking about when I say the road is not good. I know, so I, you cannot, you, you cannot tell me, you cannot tell me 
that you've so effectively managed to sell yourself your own propaganda that you don't realize that people are living here day to day. And so for my constituency of Tabakit, as we continue along the budget debate, as we go into the Standing Finance Committee, we will be very focused on the education sector, absolutely. But we are also going to be critically focused on the infrastructural, on, on infrastructural development. Because you cannot talk about connectivity and connecting communities when communities are being cut off by landslips across this country. You cannot talk about connectivity and national development and Vision 2030 when communities do not have pipe-borne water still, still, and the, member for, uh, and the Minister for Public Utilities had the time to recite an entire poem. Imagine that. Communities still do not have pipe-borne water, but the minister responsible for WASA had time to kick in Parliament today. Imagine. Imagine. And then, when we stand here, and as we continue with this budget debate, Okay, proceed. Thank you for your protection, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wish, as I conclude, to remind... Okay. Oh, I said... Okay, remember oh, I should probably interject at this time. Oh. You have two more minutes, and you have an additional 10. Oh. Do you... Good. Okay, thank you. I will avail myself of the 10 right, minutes. Thank proceed. you. And so, when we, when we discuss... <laughs> Minister... The Minister of Public Utilities could have said that. Well, I was wondering if you asked him a question. No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. And, right. and he could have utilized his speaking time instead of okay. doing a poem to say whatever he's saying across the floor now. No, you just talk. No, I'm not giving way. You just talk. No, I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am not giving way. Okay, the minister can write a press release because he misused his parliamentary time here today. That's not my fault. That is not my fault. You see, when people hand you notes and tell you, say this, sometimes you must say no. You would have had time to go through I certain communities have no water instead of regaling us with a poem. We didn't need it, okay? And so when we discuss, when the population is listening on, listening on to persons in government telling us that we as a society want everything for nothing. And we are faced with the day-to-day -day realities of the absolutely poor deliver delivery of goods and services in our communities. That persons who are seeking basics, basic access, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they have to be fighting for the basics. In 2018, I sat in the other place. And in the same budget exercise, I had the, the chance to reflect on the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And those of us who know it, who, 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 who are interested in that type of research, you know that it is a basic py pyramid of needs where you are told as the theory goes, that you have to satisfy your most basic needs before you are able to, to move up the pyramid. And so that if you apply that to Trinidad and Tobago society today, if you are talking on one hand about the hope for an aspirational society, if you are speaking on one hand about um, uh, the digital economy in, of innovation, of, of excelling, if you are honest about that, you would have to realize that in order to get to that thinking, you have to satisfy basic needs first. What are our basic needs? Water, shelter, include, and then connectivity. The infrastructural development that we could be, people will be laughing about. I get videos with um, persons playing golf in potholes at this point in time because they go around the country and they, 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 they tee up by the potholes. Who is planting trees by potholes and whatnot. Because as a nature of Trinidad and Tobago society, we try to make the best of everything. We try to make the best of everything. And so 
Well, as we exist today in Patol Paradise, what the Maslow hierarchy of needs is telling us, that all of these aspirational things that you are talking about, we cannot get there. Why can't we get there? Because we are too busy fighting up to figure out how we could get from point A to point B. When I, I, I listen to, to the Minister of Education talk about the experience in her constituency office and what the programs that they're doing, etc., excellent, all well and good. But in my constituency office, when you come to me, the landslip at Bonaventure, the landslip in Caratal, the fact that certain communities are in danger of being cut off completely. The fact that Forest Park, Macaulay, Caratal could have no pipe-borne water for a month, that they could be on water schedules where they are told they will get water on the weekends or at least on Sunday from 6 p.m. And listen to the times, I'm not being facetious here at all. 6 p.m. to, um, to 6 a.m. And so that you have that space to try to fill up your tanks. And if you don't have tanks, heaven help you. That you could have, this is the reality of the existence of persons in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is not unique to my constituents. But I can raise it because that is what I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis. That you can have that as the reality. And then you can come here. You could come here and tell us that what you can expect is growth here and you could expect. We, we can't even get home sometimes. And to show you again the, the, the levels of dissonance, I listened to the Prime Minister's press conference after the budget on the fuel increases. And the idea that people are arbitrarily coming to Port of Spain in traffic time Ludicrous. As a person from South, I can tell you, coming to Port of Spain is a nightmare. And now that gas prices are so high, even worse. And so that you are sitting here berating citizens, telling citizens that you have to do better, you must do better. But you are not holding up your end of the bargain. You as the government are failing on your end of the social contract. There is no reason anybody is supposed to come here in 2022 in a nation like Trinidad and Tobago to be talking about road rehabilitation programs when they know that is a simple matter of a timely rehabilitation. We don't have to discuss that. That, not, that ought not to take up parliamentary time. That is basic common sense that roads, you have, to, you have to rehabilitate it every so often. And that if you equitably distribute that, we are not going to face the problems that we are facing today. You remember last budget, we were told that, that, the, the, big trucks, that the big trucks were causing the road, um, the, the, the destruction of the roadways, and that there would be a fine for the trucks. What, what happened with that? I hope when the Minister of Works comes before us, he will tell us how many of these big trucks that were destroying the road, mashing up the roadways, that they have managed to stop, and what material benefit are the people of Trinidad and Tobago seeing? And so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the disappointment faced by the, the disappointment that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are feeling right now ought not to be ridiculed. It ought not to be trivialized. No one in this house should come here and tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago that the hardships that you are facing is your own fault. At the end of the day, there is a social contract. There is a social contract between the governed, uh, the, those who are governed and those who are governing. We as citizens give up certain rights, we give up certain freedoms that exist in society. And once we have done that, we have a reasonable expectation for service delivery. As we stand here today, we do not have proper service delivery in education, in healthcare, from the Ministry of Works. We do not have it. And to suggest that our discontent is ill-placed or somehow political is absurd, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
and I listened to the Minister of Public Utilities talk about why he was able, why he's able to stand as a member of the People's National Movement. And I've listened to members opposite all the time say, you know you are a member of the opposition, so yeah, yeah, that's why you have to complain. And I say, I am a member of the UNC because I've seen what the PNM does to this country. I have seen over time that the more you stay in power, the more we have to complain about. And that is why I can stand here as a member of the UNC, because the change has to come. Because as I said, if you exist with the policy and the policy does not change, the outcomes would not be different. And so as we engage in this debate, I urge members of the public, listen very carefully to what you're hearing. They are being very serious when they say things are going well. They are being very serious when they berate you for expecting a reasonably good access to public service. They are being very serious when they talk about the taxes and the fuel subsidy, and then miraculously say the reduction in the fuel subsidy would lead to better services. We heard that with Petrotrain. We heard in 2018 that once you shut down Petrotrain, roads would be better, education would be better, healthcare would be better. None of that happened. None of that happened. And so we are engaging in a very important exercise. But we are also listening to policymakers expound what policies they are prepared to present to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Remember, you have two more minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We listened to the leader of the opposition very carefully outline plans and, pro and programs that can be done in Trinidad and Tobago with the necessary political will. I have gone through today programs that have been done, that have existed, that, that we saw results from, from an administration that is not the one that we have here today. And so I say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, be very discerning in your thinking. Be very careful with what you do and how you think about it. People come every day and tell you, don't make this political, don't make that political, etc. But we are making political decisions because it impacts on our everyday life. And so as I conclude here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we as policymakers have a responsibility to ensure that the next generation of Trinidadians and Tobagonians have a fighting chance. And as I stand here as one of the younger members of parliament, it is very unfortunate to see persons who have sat at the table when things were good berate us now for having a problem that, for the fact that we are paying for the sins of others. And that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is what I will stand against at every single opportunity I get. And I thank you very much. I now recognize the member for St. Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is a signal honor for me as the member of parliament for St. Joseph and the Minister of Health to join this debate on the 2023 fiscal package. First of all, let me thank my honorable prime minister for having the faith in me to continue serving as his Minister of Health and also recognize and thank the good constituents of St. Joseph, um, whom I have the pleasure and honor to serve. As I begin my budget debate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me congratulate the Honorable Colm Imbert, the Minister of Finance, for the theme of his budget, tenacity and stability in the face of global challenges. And also to recognize the good work done in the PSIP uh, program, uh, Minister Penny Beckles Robinson. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if one listens to the opposition, and we must, and the population must, and the media must, and you listen to certain commentators, you would believe that Trinidad and Tobago is an island on its own, that we don't rely on the outside world for anything, that we are totally self-sufficient. But we must remind the country, as the 
Honorable Minister of Finance said, there were financial shocks since 2015. We had to deal with that. Oil went to negative territory. No country in the world had to deal with that ever. We had the COVID scare, which was a global pandemic since early 2020. And if one wishes to be properly informed and educated, I will advise to borrow a term from my colleague, Minister Young, all right thinking citizens to read the review of the economy that Minister Imbert has produced. And you will see in that review of the economy how well we have avoided the abyss of an IMF program. We have avoided the abyss of devaluation. We have avoided the abyss of mass layouts in the public sector. And for that, there must be some recognition that something has gone right. This is not a rich man's budget, as the honorable leader of the opposition would have you believe. We stand for everyone in the country, especially the poor and the disadvantaged. And let me explain why this budget, which is being mischaracterized as a rich man budget, serves the needs of the underprivileged. When you listen to the opposition and certain commentators, why are we giving tax breaks to the multinationals? Why are we giving tax breaks so we could have deep water exploration and shallow water exploration? Why are you giving up tax incentives to the upstream producers? You know why? Because without those tax breaks, they will not engage in more production, more exploration, more national revenue, so that we could pay more food support grants, we could pay more minor house repair grants, we can pay more sanitary public plumbing assistance, all out of the Ministry of Social Development, electrical house wiring, seed grants, disability grants for children, disability grants for adults, senior citizens pension non-contributory, public assistance grants, rental grants, and clothing grants for fire victims. The money has to come from somewhere to keep on putting money where it makes a big difference, in the hands of the poor, in the hands of the disadvantaged, to pay for CDAP, to pay for housing, subsidize water, subsidize electricity, free health care, and free education. The money has to come from somewhere. So when you connect the dots, those tax incentives to multinationals redound to the benefit of those who need the money the most. But to listen to the UNC, give more, give more, but they never tell you where the money is coming from. Why don't we want the revenue authority? So the professional class and the business class who do not pay their fair share of legitimate taxes can be brought into the tax net so that we could collect more revenue to spend more on the poor and disadvantaged. Explain to me the logic behind that. So I reject totally that this is a rich man's budget. And I think if we connect the dots, we could see why. Mr. Deputy Speaker, for two years, the Ministry of Health was unifocused on COVID for good reason. But as we come out of COVID and we come to the end of this stage of the pandemic, notice I am not saying we come to the end of the pandemic. I don't want to be misquoted by anybody. As we come to the end of this stage, this acute stage of the pandemic, we have to refocus the healthcare se sector. I just want to say that the leader of the opposition is talking about a commission of inquiry into COVID. And again, we pretend that COVID only affected Trinidad. There were 622,629,459 known cases of COVID worldwide. That is known. 
the actual number could be multiples of times higher. There were unfortunately 6,547,878 deaths worldwide. No country was spared. And in Trinidad and Tobago, yes, we lost 4,200 of our citizens. And we always send our condolences to them. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I had to hear on Monday night's news, the leader of the opposition say that we have the highest death rate of COVID in the world. Untrue. When you look at the international data and measure the case fatality ratio, it ranges from a high of 18.1. Do you know where Trinidad and Tobago is? 2.3. So why is it that for the UNC to look good, Trinidad must feel? They always put party before country. We are nowhere near the top of the COVID death ranking, nowhere near. But if ever the UNC comes into office and the commission of inquiry is actually instituted, I hope the lawyers acting for the Commission of Inquiry will call the leader of the opposition for her to explain her position that the reason why we were doing well in 2021 was because sunshine kills COVID. Is it that all of a sudden the sun moved? Is it all of a sudden that the warm weather which was attributed by the leader of the opposition for our COVID response all of a sudden we went into the ice age. Can anyone explain that? And I hope the Commission of Inquiry brings Oropuch East to explain his guinea pig statement. Because that was a travesty on this country to discourage people from getting vaccinated. I hope Senator Nackett goes before the Commission of Inquiry to explain his statement that COVID vaccine, he doesn't want to live in a communist country, so he will not take a COVID vaccine. All of these, the UNC never helped. They took us to court on every single occasion and vilified. Members, please. Members, please, on both sides, the outbursts, Please proceed. Vilified public servants. And I'm hoping that none of the three persons who speak on health will mention or congratulate Roshan, Mariam Richards, Professor Carrington, and Michelle Trotman. Because you made their lives a living nightmare. Even the member for Carody East who fashions himself after Tim Gopi Singh, did not even go there. At least he did not cross that line. At least Karen East did not cross that line. But he fashions himself after Dr. Tim Gopi Singh. I urge you not to mention those public officers' names because you made their lives living nightmares. I want to thank, at this point, every single healthcare worker, every single one. Because it is the same policies and care that Dr. Tim Gopisin got in Coover that saved his life. But once he is well enough, he bad talk every single thing. It was good enough for him. And even Karani East would not go there, who sees himself in that vein. And the $210 million allocated will be put to good use. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as we move from being unifocused, we want to put some projects, some policy systems in place that will take the healthcare sector even more forward. I want to speak about Central Block. You know why? because the leader of the opposition had the temerity and the gall 
to talk to thee about Central Block. That was a prime minister who reigned for five years with oil and energy prices over $100 a barrel and ignored Central Block. And you have the gall to come and ask the D about Central Block? Right? You ignored a seismic report. And you are asking about Central Block? It is Dr. Keith Rowley and this cabinet that put his name behind Central Block. Yes, we have had some delays. But as one central block goes up, we have started to demolish the other. And I want to thank staff and patients at Port of Spain Hospital for their understanding. They are operating under some trying circumstances. And by 2024, they will join Arima with their new hospital, Sangri Grandi with their new hospital, Point Fortin up and running, and be working in a world-class facility. Mr. Deputy Speaker, to increase the throughput for radiological services, to make patients more comfortable, we are installing a new 128 slice CT before year end at Port of Spain to supplement the containerized CT we have. So we're gonna have some redundancy capability and to easy workload on the containerized CT. Our capital city by 2024, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, will have a modern hospital that Trinidad and Tobago in its 60th year, 61st year, and 62nd year of independence can be proud of. Proud. It was a travesty, a travesty, that the Honorable Kamala Fassad Vicesa did not attend the Central Block. Under Northwest Regional Health Authority, at the St. James facility, a new MRI, which is a gift from PPGL, PPGPL, Phoenix Park uh, Processors, Gas Processors Limited, will be installed by 2023. So Northwest will have their first MRI under this government. That is to be celebrated. Under the NCRHA, the new Arima Hospital is up. It is running and running beautifully. And I could attest to it because I was a patient there. And I did not get special treatment because I have a letter from a patient. He didn't give me permission to use his name. Mr. Terence Yalsing, September 9, 2022. Let me just put this into the record. The care that I received at the Arima General Hospital was second to none. And I must commend Dr. Vimal Sitahal and his team for the tremendous work that they are doing. The professionalism portrayed by the staff at the Rima General Hospital is commendable. But you would not hear the leader of the opposition or any of my three colleagues speak about that. And that is what we are doing throughout the system. It is the first hybrid hospital, maybe in the Caribbean, where we treat COVID patients alongside non-COVID patients, and I was a patient there. The reputation of that hospital has traveled so far that we are starting to get requests from other countries to come and see how that hybrid system is working so that they could introduce it because COVID is here to stay. So that is where we are. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Sangri Grandi Hospital, MP Roger Monroe, it is 60% completed, my friend. You will get your new hospital in 2023, hopefully by the end of the second quarter, the same way MP Kennedy Richards got back Point Fortin. This will serve the population of the entire eastern seaboard. It is modern, it is new, and it is fashioned after the Point Fortin Hospital. So Point Fortin has been twinned with Sangri Grandi. I am pleased to see. Mr. Deputy Speaker, another major infrastructural project is our Ministry of Health Administration building. It's a 20-year-old dream that the Ministry of Health should stop renting properties. We are scattered all over the place. And I could tell you during COVID, when you wanted to have a heads of department meeting, I am in the ministry, the CMO is in the ministry, Dr. Hines is in Sacred Heart, 
Paho is in St. Clair. Corporate communications is in Park, Park Street. It was a nightmare to bring them together, especially when rain is falling. So we are going to have all of these agencies under one roof by hopefully second quarter of 2023. And the synergies in having all these agencies under one roof is something I look forward to as Minister of Health and will serve this country well in decades to come. Mr. Deputy Speaker, San Fernando General Hospital, oh, the new labor ward, which my friend from Faisabad is proud of also, he will never admit it. The remodel NICU, he will never admit it, is doing well. We are working with MP for San Fernando West, the Honorable Faris al Rawi, as announced in the budget, to do a refurbishment of the grounds and the buildings of San Fernando General Hospital, and also making provisions for improving the provision of cardiac services. Something that goes under the radar because it's not fashionable in health to talk about these things. The Society for Inherited Blood Disorders. We have given them now a permanent home at San Fernando General Hospital. And they are so happy and pleased to have that permanent home. It helps people with thalassemia. It helps people with all those complications of inherited blood disorders. It is so pleasing to hear the good works they are doing and the positive response we are getting from the society. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as we move on now to some key policy positions from 2023 into the future, with the twin objectives of giving our customers, our clients, our patients a better level of service and respond to healthcare workers for better goods and services delivery. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is no secret it is no secret that through the years and decades, the issue of finding blood for patients has been a thorny one. The current CHIT system is inequitable, it is dangerous, it is unpredictable, and it puts an already distressed family in more distress to go and have to find blood. We started to take decisions back in 2019 to move to a voluntary, non-renumerable blood donation system. But of course, COVID hit. But once we started January 2022, we put this back on the front burner. And the model that we use is based on a PhD research model for exclusive voluntary non-renumerable blood donations. A thesis done by Dr. Kenneth Sterling Charles. It's a 170 page thesis. And that gave us a feedstock for moving forward. So we are hoping to move from the old system, which is stressful, which is dangerous, which is unpredictable, to a new system where we hope to have an army of good. What do I mean by this army of good? an army of 20,000 persons who come onto our database to agree to voluntarily donate blood twice to three times a year without a care in the world as to who that blood goes to. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm looking for something in my wallet here and I hope I have it. It just occurred to me. Yes. What used to happen with blood donations in this country? And this is the card. May I have permission just to show this card, please? This is a card. This is your blood donation card. And what people used to do was to put money into their account. Not money, sorry. Blood into your account. So I donate a pint of blood. I'm guaranteed blood when my mother falls ill, my sister falls ill, or I fall ill. That type of system we have to move away from. Let's take the security guard recently who needed blood in San Fernando. If she doesn't have access to blood, her outcome, her outlook is not good. So we need to move away from this system of exclusivity where certain people have blood, certain people have blood in an account to one where, where I give blood, 
I have a, no care in the world as who receives my blood. It could be a child suffering from cancer who receives the blood. It could be a beta thalassemia patient who receives the blood. It could be the bandit who is shot who receives the blood. It could be the security guard who needs the blood. Regardless of race, color, creed, or class, occupation, every human being presenting to a hospital needs blood. But this old system where you put blood into your bank, which guarantees you blood, I am saying, as of today, I am releasing my 30 pints of blood for the use in the general population. That is what I am doing. I am no longer considering myself a beneficiary of the 30 pints of blood I have given voluntarily over the years. This is my contribution. I am asking people to latch on to this program. We have started it. In the old days when we had a voluntary drive, we would get 13 pints. Then we started to get 50 pints. Then we started to get 87 pints. Now we, when we do a drive, we get about 100 pints of blood. So we are making a start. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I now move to the issue of NCDs. The tackling of NCDs, as the COVID pandemic showed worldwide, is one that needs policy, data, screening, treatment, and care. And the government will step up its NCD program, will step up its NCD initiatives. But what is the missing component worldwide, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, in tackling NCDs, is patient compliance with their medication, with their exercise regime, and sticking to a reasonable, um, di not diet program, but eating properly. So under the TT Moves program, our change program, is to ask people to eat more fruits and vegetables, walk four to 7,000 steps per day, and drink more water. And we are asking the population to partner with us under this TT Moves initiative, we are going to be taking it to the communities with mobile units. We already have one up at Eastern. We are going to be taking six mobile units into the hearts and minds of villages and communities to talk to people family by family, one by one. It is not going to be a mass media cam campaign. Our screening we had about 74 screening programs with 104 institutions throughout 2021. And let me tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how well these screening programs work if the population partners with us. And for that, I refer briefly to read into the Hansard, a letter which, which appeared in the Express on Wednesday, 7 September 2022. Kudos to staff at St. Mary's Health Fair. A friend invited me to a health fair at St. Mary's Hall in Takarigua, that's the constituency of Tunapuna, where the nurses and doctors were pleasant and helpful. I even did a cholesterol test, and in less than a week, I received a phone call to collect my results at the St. Joseph Health Center. Within 20 minutes of my arrival at the health center, I was already hanging, heading out, my results in hand. Thank you, Rosetta Ransom, Maloney Gardens, Dabody. This is the kind of patient responsibility we need. We will put out the health fairs, we will do the testing, but get your results and then work on those results. So moving forward, we're going to have many more of these. On the issue of diabetes, we are going to be taking, and we already started taking, a very novel life course approach to dealing with diabetes. And I hope my three colleagues recognize it. Dr. Ragbir, I know you have a, a good general practice, uh, a member for Faisabad. This falls entirely in your garden because this is about gestational diabetes, and MPC Chiran, you are going to talk on health. So we are taking a life course approach to diabetes via an IDB funded project with DP, Professor Paul Tiluxing. For the first time in the history of this country, we are going to have national guidelines on the management of diabetes in pregnancy. We are going to be increasing our care for our diabetic women before pregnancy, 
during pregnancy, when the baby is born, the baby is a child and beyond. Because as the member for Faisabad will tell you, a diabetic obese mother will most likely have an uh, overweight baby who is more prone to diabetes. So we have to stop this cycle of diabetes at birth and pre-birth. So I hope I get your support member. And then going forward, we are going to provide them everything. And you know, I, I really have to be saddened when I hear there is no CDAP. There is no shortage of CDAP as I constantly state. What is happening is that the pharmacies don't reorder their stocks in time and the pharmacies run out. So please, oh gosh, oh gosh, please. We spend $45 million per month on CDAP. There is no shortage of medication. The fault lies at the level of the pharmacies who don't order. And I have proof because I was in a pharmacy one day. A constituent of mine started to cuss me in the pharmacy. No CDAP. A one glucophage, none. I say, fine. You abuse me in front of the whole pharmacy, I take it. I say, come, let's walk next door to the next pharmacy. Prescription filled. Prescription filled. Because pharmacy A didn't order, but pharmacy B ordered. So please, don't mislead the population. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the issue of diabetes and treatment of care, we have instituted a series of diabetic foot infection workshops. Do you know that 30% of our hospital beds are taken up by the complications of diabetes and diabetic foot, inf foot infections? 30% of our beds? We have 3,000 beds. That is 900 beds taken up with treating patients with diabetes and diabetic foot conditions. So we are going to be rolling out a series of initiatives. The final part of our three-part stakeholder meetings will be in October 2022. And coming out of this will be the development of clinical guidelines for the prevention and management of diabetic foot infections, implementation of a working task force to oversee all programs on diabetic foot infections, and a pilot project partnering with the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago for foot screening programs at the ERHE. So that is what we are doing. We are also working with the Hearts Initiative for hypertension to decrease the incidence of strokes and so on. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I now move on to the issue of mental health. The world, the world, not Trinidad and Tobago, the world is facing a mental health crisis. The World Mental Health Report from PAHO, Transforming Mental Health for All, Dr. Tedros is quoted as saying, more men, good health is more than the absence of illness. It is an intrinsic part of our individual and collective health of, and well-being. Notice those words, collective health and well-being. And the way forward that WHO and Dr. Tedros indicated was to transform our attitudes to do with stigma, actions and approaches to promote and protect mental health and integrate mental health into primary care. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we started this before. I have spoken publicly since about 2014 about the conversion and decentralization of mental health into our wellness model. As part of that, St. Anne's Hospital which is possibly the largest hospital by bed capacity of 1,000, where people are institutionalized for decades. We have ban managed to reduce the occupancy there from 1,000 to 750. So more people are being treated in the communities where they need to be treated. And we need to do more. And we recognize that we need to do more. So we launched something called Fine Care TT with 30 websites to help people get free online 24-7 access to a suite of services under Fine Care TT. 
And the data we will get from that will help us pinpoint where we need to go. So let me share the data. From January 2021, notice when we started, huh? to September 29, 2022, we had 41,219 users with 79,816 page views. However, what is interested is the demographic breakdown. The 18 to 24 group, 23% were users. The 25 to 34 age group, 22%, and the 35 to 44, 21%. In other words, that cohort, that demographic, 18 to 44, accounted for 66% of the visits to find care TT seeking advice and help on mental health issues. To the younger population, and then when you break it down by gender, is 59% male, which is a bit surprising, to 40% female. So now that we have this body of data, we know when we go out into the communities who we need to target. And I give you the assurance that we are totally revamping the way we do these health fairs from now on to incorporate much more mental health screening and mental health support at the time. So we have taken steps, as the WHO recommended, to integrate mental health into the primary care setting. Our pilot study is going to start very soon, and the objective is to shift from institutionalization to community-based care as the cornerstone of our new mental health trust. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I go on, I just want to make brief mention that we are totally revamping another bugbear, as the three uh, speakers will know about. The availability, not of MRI or CT or mammography services, but the reporting of those exams. We have had problems over the decades with timely reporting. I can tell you that we have restarted the steering committee to look at our PACS system. What is PACS? Picture, archiving, and communication system. And our RIS system, which is our radiological information system. We listen to feedback from patients, staff, and clinics. And the program objectives, which you hope to start to roll out very soon, will be one, to streamline workflows, two, simplify image sharing across regions and sectors. That is crucial. That is crucial. So that images can be read and reported quickly. Right now at the pilot at NCRHA, we are reporting 90% of the emergency images within 24 hours. And that's the kind of standard we want to get to across the regions. We want to have scalable and high quality solutions improve access time to radiological examinations, and what will be the outcome for the patient? A better quality of care, decrease waiting time for your results, and at the end of the day, unnecessarily long hospital stays. So these are some major interventions together with blood, this one, that will enhance the patient experience at our hospitals across all five RHAs. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I heard the leader of the opposition and unfortunately the member for Tabakit, and I know it's politics, bad talk the health system and we have done nothing and things bad and things worse. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on coming into office in 2015, let's talk about what we have done. Let's talk about what we have inherited. Let's talk about what we have fixed. Women were dying in our hospitals at the rate of one per month in childbirth. And the member for Faisabad knows that. The Honorable Kamla Pasad Bisesa had at her disposal the member for Faisabad and that other member whose name I don't like to call in the public domain, who is also an obstetrician and gynecologist, who Carney East models himself after. Brother, don't go there. 
because there's a life after politics. Carney East, there's a life after politics. You have to live with your conscience. Two of them couldn't fix the issue of maternal mortality. You know who fixed it? Me. This government. This government. And I have to listen to Tabakit and Separia see health system collapse. What was the maternal mortality rate in 2015? 49.3 per 100,000 live births. You know what we brought it down to in 2018? 18.1. Slash it by more than half. 2019. 25.7, 2020, 26.1, 2021, it went up because of COVID. Do you know how many maternal mortality deaths we have had this year? One. And it was as a result of COVID. One. One. But things bad. Things bad in the health sector. When women were dying one a month under the UNC, what did they do? Nothing. It is we fix that. Let's talk about neonatal mortality rate. In coming into office, you know what the rate was? 15 per uh, 1,000 live births. You know what it is now? 5.7. We have decreased it significantly. That means 100 children per year are now alive under the PNM because we have slashed neonatal maternity rates by two thirds, but things bad, things bad. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the issue of NCDs, women's health, I want to thank Dr. Adesh Sirji Singh and his staff, Dr. Roma Bridgelal, and all at the Directorate of Women's Health because the Directorate of Women's Health and Children's Health is not only about bringing down maternal mortality rates and neonatal mortality rates. One of the other programs which I hope to put on the front burner again is the whole issue of increasing our rates of breastfeeding in Trinidad and Tobago. You want to talk about NCDs? You want to break the cycle? Let's get more mothers breast breastfeeding. So we are going to be initiating the Breastfeeding Friendly Hospital Initiative. We are stepping up our activities here as part of our NCD drive. The ERHA is 74% ready. NCRHA 72%. Northwest 53%. Southwest 68%. Tobago 68%. We need a minimum of 80% readiness to be accredited are to be considered breastfeeding friendly. It's a work in progress, but let me tell you some of the advances. The exclusive best breastfeeding rates at birth, which is the first index we look at, is now 62% in 2022, up from 56% in 2011 in hospital. So we are making progress with our mothers in hospital to start to consider breastfeeding as exclusive means of nutrition, at least for the first six months of a baby's life. So that's in hospital. It's up from 56 to 62%. We now are going for the first time to be measuring what will be happening after they are discharged for the first six months of that baby's life. We have never had that data collection before. So that is what we are doing. And the ultimate goal is to have 50% of babies exclusively breastfed by 2025, both in hospital, but most importantly, when they go home. And not to fall victim, not to fall victim to the marketing efforts of, breast, of feed, breast milk substitute feeds. They are simply, if you can breastfeed your baby, please mothers, consider that. It is cheap. It costs you nothing, and the benefits to you and your baby are just endless. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to touch on NCDs and smoking. We would have come to Parliament to debate the, uh, the amendment bill of 2019 for graphic health messages warning. 
I would have come to Parliament back in February because the cigarette manufacturers had asked for a six-month extension. That was granted. I was open in Parliament. And those came into effect on September 26, 2022. How did we achieve this? The tobacco control regulations, which took effect from September 26, we now join 112 countries that have graphic warnings. The Tobacco Control Unit informed and held stakeholder meetings with the Chamber of Commerce, Supermarket Association, Fair Trade and Commission, and Ministry of Trade and Industry. They also had meetings with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, Customs and Excise, and the Ministry of Health Public Health Inspectors so that we can ensure enforcement of the amended regulations. And in July 2022, the Tobacco Control Unit initiated compliance assessments, assessments to sensitize sellers of tobacco products, and that is ongoing. So we have been tackling all the issues of NCDs as far as we possibly come, could. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the few minutes I have remaining, I want to urge members opposite. Honourable Member. Yes. You have roughly about three more minutes, but you have an additional yes. ten. Thank Get you. To avail yourself one Thank time. you very much, Proceed. sir. In the, as the debate uh, continues, it is unfortunate that in the era of the big untruth, spawned, in my view initially, by the by Cambridge Analytica, which had its roots in other countries, adopted by other countries, adopted by the partnership in 2010. Yes, what I would say the partnership in 2010. But they brought it from outside. It is unfortunate now that purveyors of truth and fact have to work so much harder to get our narrative out because there is something in the atmosphere, in the ether, in the water, that proponents of the big untruth are finding fertile ground in persons. And that is what the member for Lopino was talking about, the spider and the fly. And I want to congratulate him for his response. Minister Gonzalez, you did well. Because that poem, is exactly what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago. You pull people with your populist narrative. You remember when the election in 2010, 2015 was being fought. There was a fire in a factory. And the then Prime Minister, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisesa said, let's give $5,000 to every worker if affected by it. That is populism. Populism does not work. But we have a prime minister who will tell the country the unvarnished truth because the truth will set you free. And as my colleague, Minister Young, will say, to the right-thinking citizens, they know the truth. They know the truth. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we will always, on this side, tell the country the truth. We will never lie to you. We will never put on rouge and lipstick and pretend that we like you. We will not take decisions that will make us popular in the short run, but we will take decisions that will make you better off in the long run. That is our aim and objective as a responsible PNM government. Leadership is not easy, especially in difficult times. Leadership is not easy in difficult times. It is in difficult times you know who is a leader. It is in difficult times you know who has your back. And that is what Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley is about. And that is what all of us are about following that example. We are not afraid of the protests. We are not afraid of the editorials. We are not afraid to tell the country what the unvarnished truth of our circumstances. But we will also tell you what is the path of redemption moving forward. Stick with us. 
And as I say, stick with us, I ask the people of St. Joseph now, are you better off now? Let me tell you why. Two brand new community centers, $25 million worth of community centers, My Tower or My Tagual and Cayman. Remember Fatagwiki said the ICT program is working. Well, let me tell you something. The ICT program working in my tower, it working in Cayman. And Minister Gonzalez, you are there. You saw the computers. You saw the children using it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the constituency of St. Joseph, the following roads have been rehabilitated and paved. William Street, Francis Avenue, Cayman Road. We have done drainage works of industrial lane in Chamflay, the widening and dredging of the San Juan River, which will help mitigate flooding in where? Arangwes, Arangwes Villas, and Mount Lambert, and even in the constituency of Barataria San Juan. Thompson Lane, concrete works and drainage. Ongoing works at San Antonio Street, San Juan. First Avenue Road Rehabilitation of Mendes Drive, Chamflay. Talking about Chamflay, Minister Marvin Gonzalez, my brother, thank you for the CWIP program, the booster pump on the Eastern Main Road, Chamflay. That community program is excellent. And I know Manzanella will agree with you. Thank you, brother. And to commence in fiscal 2023, We'll be paving Abercrombie Street from the Eastern Main Road right up outside the church, First Capital Park, and so on. Neverson Street off Bridge Road to be paved. Quarry Drive off Mendes Drive to be paved after we replace some pipe pipelines there. And Cayman Road off Abercrombie Street to be paved. Let's not forget the new pavilion that we built in the Arangwe Savannah with a north facing and a south facing, so people can play games. And I have approached the Minister of Public Utilities to put up some solar lights there so we could play ball in the night. Thank you, because your football community is asking for, for that. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is my report of what we have been able to accomplish in health. This is my report of just a snippet of the activities that we have undertaken in the great, wonderful, loving constituency of St. Joseph. And as I close, I want to thank all those hundreds of constituents of St. Joseph who reached out to me, prayed for me, sent messages when I was ill and hospitalized at um, Arima. It was touching. I felt loved. I felt appreciated, and I think that experience of being a hospital patient really changes you for the better, not only as a minister of health, but as a human being where you have to bear your soul to others, to receive treatment, and as I said, as I read out the letter from the person from Arima, that treatment was not for me alone. It was for everyone. So as we continue to make strides in the health sector, I say thank you once again to every single healthcare worker. I thank the Honorable Prime Minister for his continued faith in me, and I thank God for having me here today. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Karini East. Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you for allowing me to, to join the debate into the 2023 fiscal budget. I would like to begin by thanking my political leader for a comprehensive and a compassionate reply to the budget. Deputy Speaker, my colleague, the Minister of Health, began his contribution a bit confused. He, he was confused of which ministry he represented. He started off speaking about tax refunds of multinationals and the Revenue Authority. It is no wonder we did so badly in our COVID-19 response. With regards 
with regards to claims that my leader said sunshine would kill COVID-19, I would like to say, I would like to refute that fact. And I would like to refute that. And I would like to state, Deputy Speaker, sunshine does reduce the transmission of COVID-19 on surfaces. And that is all that she was trying to allude to. So in the temperate countries around the world, Deputy Speaker, they are expecting a surge in COVID-19 cases as the autumn and winter months approach. And that is a fact. Sunshine cannot kill a virus. That is, that is, that is not, no one ever said that. What we were trying to say is that sunshine reduces the transmission due to COVID-19 on surfaces. That is why you sanitize your hands every time you touch something. Deputy Speaker, looking back at the last two years and the, the claim that um, the member for Oropoot said that we were all guinea pigs. At the time, I did not want to respond or enter the public debate into that statement. Reason being, I did not want to add to vaccine hesitancy at the time. But the fact is, Deputy Speaker, there is some truth to the statement, right? If you were to look at, Deputy Speaker, the clinical trials of vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, while they were being produced, many, many COVID-19 drugs had issues, and some of them actually made their way to the public. And one of those drugs was the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Mr. Deputy vaccine. Speaker, 481, please. This is misinformation. And these very vaccines have been approved by international agencies. This is incorrect. Please, members, right? You take ownership for your, your comments. Proceed. So, Deputy Speaker, what I'm trying to say is that during the trial phases of many of these COVID-19 vaccines, which were brand new, COVID-19 was a novel virus. So many of these companies started, started from scratch to produce these vaccines, and not all vaccines made it to the marketplace. And some that did make it to the marketplace had issues, but they, they, they made it to the marketplace regardless. For example, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was stopped during its trial, reason being there were cases of severe blood clotting. And this actually came to fruition when it was released in the open market and millions of persons used the vaccine. To such an extent, Deputy Speaker, that the emergency use authorization of this vaccine in the United States was amended because in some cases it was found to be dangerous and could cause a possible lethal complication. So, you, you know, when you have to understand, everyone approached COVID-19 as a new virus and statements were made. And looking back at it now, some drugs were better than other drugs. So, so by, by um, a member saying we were all guinea pigs, there was some truth to that statement. Not all of the vaccines were as, as, um, as healthy as they should be and were as effective as they should be, Deputy Speaker. Now, that is the point I was trying to make, right? right? We, we have the Madonna vaccine, we have the Pfizer vaccine, we have the Sinopharm vaccine, and I'm not criticizing any vaccine, but I'm speaking on scientific basis. I'm speaking on the scientific basis of, of studies that have been done. And the United States, have, they have amended the emergency use authorization of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, Deputy Speaker. And we have that vaccine here available in Trinidad and Tobago. We bought, I think, 800,000 doses of that vaccine from the African Medical Supplies Platform. In fact, one FDA commissioner went as far as to say it was unethical for a doctor to prescribe that vaccine in the United States if another one was available. So, so I would just like to refute that fact. And I did, not, I did not say this at the time, not to add to vaccine hesitancy, but I would say it now, two years after, and this vaccine has been in, in our use by millions of persons. With regards to what the Minister of Health had said about um, former Member of Parliament, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh, who is, yes, my political mentor, yes, I trained under him in Karanis, yeah, uh, and I would like you to know Dr. Gopi Singh is what I would consider a renaissance man in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Gopi Singh was a national cricketer. He played for the West Indies team while he was a student in medical school. 
Dr. Gopi Singh actually became a world-class medical specialist in obstetrics and gynecology. And then he became the second best minister of education we ever had in Trinidad and Tobago after my political leader. And he is a national medal awardee, the Shakonia Gold Medal. So, Minister, you know, be careful what you say about Dr. Gopi Singh. He has accomplished a lot more than you. The rest of what the minister has said, I will, um, I will refute while I make my presentation. So I would like to begin by thanking every single healthcare worker and frontline worker in Trinidad and Tobago. They have contributed to keeping our essential services functional during the heights of the pandemic. They are our modern day hero, heroes. Serving Trinidad and Tobago in our nation's supermarkets, drugstores, maxis, taxis, and yes, in our health institutions. We must never forget their service to Trinidad and Tobago and their fellow man. Please, Deputy please, Speaker. Please, across the floor. I'll try and avoid it, please. Deputy Speaker, our healthcare workers, they deserve every cent that they will receive, and I dare say even more. What about improved working conditions, reasonable terms of employment, and mental health assistance? The Simongal report spoke of healthcare workers feeling abandoned by management. What in this fiscal budget addresses that, Minister? I had hoped this administration would have sought to reward all frontline workers and not to only single out those in the Ministry of Health. Many did not have the benefit of being able to work from home. What about those that kept our oil rigs pumping and those patrolling our nation's borders, both on land and sea? Those who braved COVID-19 to do their duties. We have, Deputy Speaker, we have lost over 30 police officers and many more from the fire service, Coast Guard, and the Army to COVID-19. What about their families? Did they not keep us safe during COVID-19? Where is their compensation? I expected the Minister of Finance during this bumper fiscal year to find a way in his heart to bring an improvement in the standard of living of every Trimbegonian citizen. And that did not happen. We have seen our roads destroyed during this PNM administration, and it has now become more expensive to use them. The oil and gas of this country belongs to every single citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. The Prime Minister wants to tell citizens on how to use fuel. This is while he is transported in a convoy in around four to five Toyota Land Cruisers. Do as I say and not as I do. It is no secret life in Trinidad and Tobago is becoming more and more difficult. People yearn for the return of Kamla Passad Bissessa to the reins of power in Trinidad and Tobago. How much more can people take? Every single ministry is failing and the quality of life that we have seen in 2010 to 2015 is now a distant memory. Deputy Speaker, the, the, Minister, the Minister of Finance spoke of saving lives and livelihoods, but many of this administration policies were on the extreme end of the spectrum of what nations implemented around the world. We have fallen so far back in terms of economic development that a small rebound is now being heralded as recovery. This government has massacred livelihoods with no regard to the medium and small business owner. The, st the small street food vendor was banned because persons would stand in a line outside to purchase doubles. There's a very low chance of getting COVID-19 outdoors. Fast food was banned because workers in the kitchen would mingle, but Massey was allowed to prepare food and sell fried chicken in their supermarkets. How was that possible? Who prepared the food? Else, the majority of small vendors became destitute during this time, losing means to care for themselves and their families, and especially in Karanese. 
not many have been able to reopen. We have literally turned the hands of time back in Trinidad and Tobago with families retreating to seeking a living of the land and not venturing into, in, into entrepreneurship. The Minister of Finance also spoke, as well as the Minister of Health, of the global number of cases of deaths due to COVID-19. So he hoped by using a big sounding number, the number of deaths in Trinidad and Tobago would sound very small. And allow me to analyze the figures that he presented. <laughs> we had one of the world's most restrictive border policies during the height of the pandemic. Citizens, sons and daughters of Trinidad and Tobago were not allowed to return home. Not, not, they were not even allowed to enter and to be quarantined. And what this meant was that we severely restricted the viral load entering the country. And thus our COVID-19 cases should have been much lower than most of the other countries around the world and in the region, such as the United States and Great Britain, where travel was not stopped. But somehow, we ended up with one of the highest deaths, rates of death per 100,000 persons in the world. Almost number one, almost number one. Deputy Speaker, with just over 4,200 COVID-19 deaths and a case fatality ratio of 2.3%, we have recorded 300 deaths per 100,000 persons in Trinidad and Tobago. 300 deaths per 100,000 persons. We are currently ranked as the 173rd worst performing country out of 195 countries. We are number 22 from the bottom of the list. St. Kitts and Nevis is ranked as number 101 with 86 deaths per 100,000. Dominica is ranked as 105 with 95 deaths. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is the source of this information? John Hopkins University Coronavirus Center, 26th of September 2022. Dominica is at 105, ranked as 105, with 95 deaths per 100,000. And Jamaica is at 115, with 111 deaths per 100,000 citizens. So to put that into context, for every 100,000 persons in Trinidad and Tobago, we had 190 more deaths in Trinidad and Tobago than Jamaica. 2,000 more persons died here in Trinidad and Tobago as compared to Jamaica if we had the equivalent population, right? Why is this? After the parallel healthcare system and weekly media briefings, billions were spent and yet to be audited. There were systematic failures in our healthcare response. This administration, through the Minister of Health, failed everyone with his policies and leadership. Citizens died who did not have to die. Poor people died who, did, who do not have a voice to say what happened. We have the highest death rate in CARICOM. Ask the minister, explain that. He was talking about Yemen. Yemen is undergoing a civil war. They do not have health care. They, they, they are like Ukraine and Russia, right? Yemen, Yemen's rate is 18, and then after that, it comes to North Korea, where we have no data, right? We are number 22 from the bottom of the list, Deputy Speaker. Our health infrastructure was totally overwhelmed. There was a systematic failure in delivering quality health care to citizens. To overflowing wards with in inadequate drugs, equipment, and medical personnel. And finally, cockroach and moss infested step down facilities. Patients passed when in many cases they could be here with us today, with their family, with their friends, and with their life intact. Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister says that money was spent here to keep us alive. In fact, one year ago, Minister Dial Singh is on record of saying that the Ministry of Health spent $480 million on the, COVID, on the country's COVID-19 response since the beginning of the pandemic. This sum must be consider considerably more right now. The CAF Development Bank of Latin America has re recently approved 1.65 billion US dollars in financing 
for a number of countries, in, including Trinidad and Tobago. How much of that total will our country receive? And how much have we received already? Deputy Speaker, we have been told that COVID-19 funds were channeled into infrastructure, human resources, consumables, buildings, facilities, paying for quarantine, buying equipment and personal protective equipment. I am calling for an audit into the spending of COVID-19 funds during the period March 2020 to present day. Deputy Speaker, the Minister of Finance, in his budget speech, chose, to, chose the period during the surge of 2021 Easter, Easter weekend in Tobago to the period just after the Delta surge in early 2022 to highlight a reduction in the number of positive cases. Not one mention of the PNM initiated Simongol report into the daily mass deaths at our hospitals. At one point, at one point, over 30 deaths per day, to the point where more trees were overwhelmed. And, and Deputy Speaker, they banned cremations, right? They banned cremations during this time. Pe persons of Hin the Hindu religion were not allowed to, to put their relatives and friends and loved ones to rest in a respectful way. That, that you know that we are accustomed to. And you know, we, we resent that. We resent that. Right? Why did they do it? Was it there is no scientific basis for what they did in banning cremations? There is no scientific basis. Why why did the minister not indicate if systemat if systemic deficiencies in our nation's healthcare infrastructure? Remember 48 1. We have gone on for the last 15 minutes on COVID. 14-1. I am responding to what the Minister of Finance has in his budget speech. If you read it, I could actually quote the page I am responding to. Page 107, sir. Right, Deputy Speaker. Remember, again, it's your time. If you see it that way, Proceed. Thank you very much. Right, why did the minister not indicate if systemic deficiencies in our nation's health infrastructure would be addressed via this budget? Mr. 49.2, on the relevance of, sorry, on the point of sub judice, the issue of standardization and cremations, etc., and burial rights is a matter before the courts. In fact, whilst the state won several of those matters, there's one remaining matter. So I'd just like the honorable member to avoid that topic, please. One second. Hmm. Okay, so member, um, with regards to the aspect. I moved on, I no, was hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. Right, with regards to the subject sub judice issue in standing order 49, with regards to the cremation and those things, I'd like you to stay clearly away from that. No problem. Right? So proceed. No problem. Right, so Deputy Speaker, I was speaking about COVID 19 issues, but I was expecting the minister to state that many of the deficiencies were not necessarily only about COVID-19, but issues of mental health, drug deficiencies, and lacking of equipment in our nation's hospitals. The 105-page report was a damning indictment on the leadership of Minister Dial Singh as the Minister of Health. The committee's report tells of staff shortages being common, doctors and nurses having to perform non-medical functions, and of being overworked to the point of exhaustion. Poor working conditions were highlighted, with nurses being made to work many long hours in PPE. My leader, Kamala Pasad Bisesa, has consistently called for additional nursing and medical staff to be hired in order to release the stress placed on our doctors and nurses. Short-term locum contracts resulted in great uncertainty and low morale among our young doctors, and it's a sad confirmation of earlier UNC revelations of major human resource infractions in the healthcare system. 
the fact that a single nurse was assigned to as many as 30 patients also speaks to a systemic failure to provide adequate nursing resources. The lack of foresight to order adequate quantities of tocilizumab is yet another indictment on the minister, on Minister Dial Singh. Doctors had to cope with shortages of midazolam, metalprenicillone, and propofol. Dextamethasone was used in cases where metalprenicillone was indicated. I commend Professor C. Mongol's committee for its patriotic duty. His entire team gave a true assessment of our performance at that time. Now the question must be asked, how many of the committee's recommendations have been implemented with this budget? He did not say that, Minister, right? Professor C. Mongol and his team spoke of poor data management system, a recommendation that supplies from C40 be continuously open seven days a week, a proposal that oxygen concentrators be purchased for all large institutions. He spoke of mental health support for staff, on-site recreational facilities for all regional health authorities, an assessment and equality of the delivery of meals. People with their family, their child, in these um, step-down facilities, getting our bread and cheese two, three hours after breakfast, that is not good enough. Substandard bathroom facilities, COVID-19 drugs not being procured, healthcare workers on a short month-to-month -month contract, un unable to take a vacation, unable to apply for sick leave, right? Having long, they have no long-term security for their family. They cannot get a bank loan. They cannot plan for postgraduate training, right? Cruel and unusual punishment minister. Deputy Speaker, the minister also spoke about taking a leadership role in health development to ensure fairness, to protect social values of equity, and to secure access to, of healthcare for low and vulnerable groups, low income and vulnerable groups. It's on page 109. But how could this be achieved when mysterious occurrences happen, such as on the 25th of May, 2021. Questions remain after four senior specialist doctors were transferred out of the Coover Hospital. And then you want to come here and bring whistleblower legislation to parliament? The facility's only lung specialist was reassigned when patients were dying from not being able to breathe. This again was poor people they were trying to save. The Prime Minister does his medical in California, USA, not California, Dow Village, Coover. Madam Deputy Speaker, the question should not be asked, have any of these doctors been rotated back into the Coover Hospital, or was this a disciplinary measure against them for speaking up? Deputy Speaker, we are also have it reported in one of our daily newspapers of the atrocities in another hospital but smartly, he did not reveal his identity. Otherwise, he may have been rotated out. On the 15th of December, 2021, we had 32 COVID-19 deaths and the virtual collapse of our nation's health infrastructure under Minister Dial Singh. A junior doctor bravely went to the Express newspaper to state the working conditions of healthcare workers after hundreds of millions of dollars was spent on COVID-19, where the money went. At the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, this doctor spoke of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion, and a doctor-patient ratio of one to 60. Needless to say, patients died. There was not enough manpower to care for them. It spoke to the level of care a critically ill patient would receive in our nation's premier hospital. The minister is on record of saying that a half a billion taxpayers' dollars was spent on hiring additional human resources, you know, procuring consumables and upgrading infrastructure. But we have confirmation from this doctor of a lack of oxygen tanks with patients' health being compromised while tanks were being refilled. So half a billion dollars and you couldn't buy enough tanks, right? According to another report, our young doctors were unequipped to do their job, as they had to share two oxygen, 
um, saturation monitors for 60 patients. So at any one time, you only have the oxygen saturation of two patients out of a, in a ward of 60. People are going to die. How does the minister also explain when the doctor reported of a lack of PPE and having to work on COVID-19 patients without gloves? Little is known of the circumstances and associated, associated factors related in the deaths of our hospitals. As they say, dead men tell no tales. Moving on, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to also speak on the Children's Life Fund, which was created to provide funding and critical support for children needing life-saving tertiary-level healthcare services not available in this country. And I would like to thank my political leader, Kamla Pasad Bisesa, for creating this fund and for donating to this fund. She donated her own part of her own salary as well as her ministers. And along the way, there were many success stories, including the family of Daryl Frank and the proud baby, and sorry, and the proud parent of baby Darius. And this was in 2013. Darius got a new lease on life, having life-saving surgery in Colombia when he was only two weeks old. He was diagnosed with an atrial septal defect, a condition where there is a hole in the heart of the two upper chambers. The surgery could not be performed in Trinidad and Tobago, and the family applied to the Children's Life Fund for financial assistance, and they got it. The chief secretary at the time, Orville London, said that a newborn baby always reminds us of how important life is and that he was delighted to see the surgery was successful and that the family could have a future with their son. Deputy Speaker, fast forward to, the, to today. Uh, it's a horror story. In 2021, we had the death of a teenager while he was awaiting treatment and it raised questions about the operations of the Children's Life Fund. Tristan Ramlochan, and may he rest in peace, 14 years of age at the time, had acute lymphoblastic leukemia and died on April the 14th. Ramlochan's parents tried, made valiant efforts to raise the $90,000 US for his um, treatment, and they were unable to do so. They had um, GoFundMes, they had um, barbecues, and they were not able to attain the funds, and the Unfortunately, a young man died. So there are lingering concerns that this fund is not accessible to seriously ill children. Deputy Speaker, um, in fact, we have Senator Dial Singh advocating that the Children's Life Fund cover patients with beta thalassemia major, a major blood disorder that reduces the body's production of hemoglobin. And this disease is characterized by severe anemia requiring regular red blood cell transfusions. Um, some of the persons that have been denied access to Children's Life Fund are Shannon Luke, Terence Chadu, and Jovi Mitchell, all who were told that they did not qualify because the condition isn't life-threatening. And these parents have had to raise funds through barbecues and GoFundMe campaigns. Exactly the situation the Children's Life Fund was, addressed to, was created to address. And my leader spoke about that this morning, and the fact that when we return to power, the legislation would be modified and amended to make um, um, amendments to allow these per persons such as this to access the Children's Life Fund. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, I'd like to move to the CEDAP program, which the Minister of Health also alluded to. This program was introduced in 2003 to help citizens with a range of chronic diseases to get access to costly prescription drugs free of charge. And CDAP was introduced also as a social support service to citizens in need. But in June of 2018, a decision by cabinet made modifications to the CDAP and these modifications have had disastrous consequences to the CEDAP program. New pharmacies are now required to pay a $68,000 startup fee. The average new pharmacist does not have that money to pay to start up a CEDAP program. Pharmacies before this did not have to pay this money. 
And when asked about this concern, Minister Dial Singh said that there are enough pharmacies in CDAP. And what this has done, it has prevented many rural pharmacies from getting onto this program, defeating the objective of this initiative. Also, the pharmacy board head spoke of the ministry buying the cheapest medication for CDAP, and he went on to say it concerned him about the issue of counterfeit drugs. He insisted that all medication in Trinidad and Tobago, including CDAP drugs, be tested. And he went on to say in Trinidad, we have limited, limited facilities to test these medication. He said the Ministry of Health is choosing the, choosing the cheapest medication possible to put on CDAP. Rahman also said that there is an issue of a reliable supply of payment to the pharmacies. He went on to say, as a comparison, that the only way to get your road paved is to burn tires. And what he meant to say is that the only way to get payment is to stop supplies, and then the ministry would hasten to pay. So minister, probably in the, in the pharmacy that you were in, you should have asked the pharmacy if he, if he got paid for the seed up. Moving on, Deputy Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> on page um, 11, the Minister of Finance spoke about the awkward trend in confirmed COVID-19 cases, but no significant increase in vaccine uptake. And Deputy Speaker, he stated that he has not seen any significant increase in vaccine uptake, which remains at 51% of our national population, and, the, and that the virus is losing its virulence. Deputy Speaker, since the dismantling of health restrictions, we have had 90 deaths in August of 2022 to COVID-19. We have had over 50 deaths in September of 2022 because of, because of COVID-19, and I don't know the exact figure because they have stopped giving daily briefings. <laughs> well, the numbers are low if compared to the murder tally. Truth be told, this administration is comfortable with losing 50 persons a month to COVID-19. Currently, COVID-19 is killing almost no one under the age of 40, and hospitalization numbers are manageable. The death and hospitalization rates also remain low among older people who are boosted. And in all of these groups, severe COVID-19 illness is concentrated among people who have significant medical problems. And what this means is that booster shots matter. So I'm going to booster shots now. Boosters offer the biggest benefit in the reduction of severe illness among vulnerable patients. And for, pe for people who are more vulnerable to severe COVID-19 because of their age or health condition, the best advice is to stay up to date with your booster shot. During the last mid-year review, Minister Dial Singh indicated that $12 million was allocated for purchasing vaccines. Among them, he said, was Moderna's bivalent vaccine, which has now been approved by the FDA and dozens of countries around the world. So, Minister, have we made a pre-order of Moderna's bivalent vaccines pending WHO approval? You spoke nothing about this. Is the minister saying that vaccinated elderly and vaccinated immunocompromised patients must take Sinopharm and Johnson & Johnson as the booster shot for the Omicron variant, which is now the dominant form of COVID-19, the now dominant form of the coronavirus in Trinidad and Tobago. These vaccines were formulated against the original Wuhan strain and not against the now dominant and extremely contagious Omicron subvariant BA4 and BA5. In a recent study in Japan, COVID-19 herd immunity was near 90% after the latest Omicron wave. But that protection was shown to diminish after a matter of months. And what that means is that COVID-19 is here to stay, it's endemic. And, and our elderly persons, our elderly persons are immunocompromised must be boosted, right? We have, we have consistent high daily cases and deaths from COVID-19. And our vaccinated citizens have no access to these reformulated shots unless they were to leave the country. 
Currently in Trinidad and Tobago, we only have access to the Sinopharm and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. All Pfizer vaccines have expired many, many months ago. And as I told you just before, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been limited in its use by the United States Food and Drug Administration. The FDA said in a statement that the change is being made because of the risk of a rare and dangerous clotting condition called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome after receiving the vaccine. Healthy persons could die after taking this vaccine. And that is why it has been limited in the United States, right? The Minister of Health also refused to state if he would order the antiviral drug Plaxovid from Pfizer and used by President Biden when he contracted COVID-19. Clinical trials of this drug have shown that it reduces the risk of hospitalization and death by 88% within five days of starting, victim, start, of starting symptoms in unvaccinated persons. So four out of five unvaccinated persons in Trinidad and Tobago could literally be alive today if we had this drug. At some point in time, Plaxovid or its generics will enter Trinidad and Tobago. And the question will be asked, why did we not acquire it earlier? The CMO is on record of saying that a cost-benefit analysis will have to be done to determine the feasibility of purchasing these life-saving drugs. And vaccines are available for the public to be vaccinated. But what if you don't want a vaccine? There, there are many persons that just don't want a vaccine. I move around my constituency, and many elderly persons, when you ask them if they're vaccinated, they, they, you know, they, they say they don't want the vaccine. This, this drug will be able to save persons' lives. It'll be able to reduce the strain on the hospital administration admissions. Minister Dial saying Pfizer has signed an agreement with 35 generic manufacturers in 12 different countries to provide Plaxovid to low and middle income countries. You can order it now. It will save four out of five unvaccinated persons, as well as 100% of vaccinated persons who take it. What is the point of spending, spending billions of dollars on hospital infrastructure to save lives when you could just spend a fraction of the money to actually do so, right? But then again, Deputy Speaker, it's just poor people we're talking about here, right? Deputy Speaker, moving on. I have to drink some water. New hospitals. Madam, Deputy Speaker, the Minister of Finance, as well as the Minister of Health, indicated that citizens would have equitable access to quality health care through our modern health facilities. I would like to thank my political leader for the vision to plan, design, and build the Kuva Hospital in one term in office, an institution integral to the recovery of thousands of citizens from COVID-19. I would like to thank her for her vision for starting the Arima and Point Fortin Hospital, as well as the San Fernando Teaching Hospital. Without the development of our country's healthcare infrastructure during the period of 2010 to 2015, we would have never been able to withstand the storm of COVID-19. I would like to remind the goodly minister that the Yorima Hospital was commissioned by Kamala Pasad Bissessa and the partnership government on the 3rd of October, 2013. The then Arima Member of Parliament, Roger Samuel, announced the project at a post-cabinet press briefing that in a government-to-government -government agreement with China, the hospital would be built at a cost of $1.6 billion. This was in the making after Kamala Pasad Bissessa held bilateral talks with the Chinese President Xi Jinping during his 2013 state visit to Trinidad and Tobago. Deputy Speaker, the Point Fortin Hospital, the People's Partnership Government turned the sod on the co to begin construction of the $1.2 billion Point Fortin Hospital at Egypt Village, Point Fortin. The project was executed under a government-to-government -government arrangement between Trinidad and Tobago and Austria, who were also involved in the construction of the San Fernando Teaching Hospital. In fact, the then Minister of Health, Fuad Khan, said he met no plans in place to build a new hospital in Point Fortin when he entered office in 2011. This is a UNC initiative. 
He also noted that the hospital was earmarked for construction after seeing the state of disrepair of the old Point Fortin Hospital. Moving on to the Sandy Grandi Hospital. In the 2019 budget speech, Minister of Finance, Colin Imbert stated that the new Sandy Grandi Hospital would be built for $850 million. Minister of Dial Singh added that it would be built using the same design, the same contractor, and the same model as the Point Fortin Hospital. I would like to ask the Minister of Health, what is the final cost of the Sandy Grandi Hospital? Is it still $850 million, sir? Deputy Speaker, the Minister is on, is on record of saying the Sandy uh, Grandi Hospital. Member. Yes, you have just about four more minutes in your initial speaking time. You have an additional 10. You care to avail yourself of that? Yes, sir. Proceed. Right. The Minister is on record of saying the Sandy Grandi Hospital will now cost taxpayers an additional will now cost taxpayers an estimated $1 billion, $150 million than originally planned. It gets even stranger with the Port of Spain General Hospital Central Block, which was supposed to start on the 19th of May, 2019. The $1 billion project was supposed to be completed through a public-private partnership with Shanghai Construction Group Caribbean Limited. In fact, in January of 2022, it was reported that SCG had served a termination notice on Udicott and quit the billion-dollar project. It, um, it will now cost taxpayers at least $110 million more and an additional two years to complete construction on the Port of Spain General Hospital Central Block. Running out of time, so I will find other things to talk about. <laughs> Um, Deputy Speaker, I'd like to move to my constituency quickly. Um, the purpose of a national budget is to manage the affairs of a country and to improve the lives of its citizens. And if so, Deputy Speaker, this package is a colossal failure. Let me briefly examine this budget's direct impact on the people of Karenese. Karenese is not only the center of the island of Trinidad, but is also the heart and soul of the country. It is an electoral community of ambitious, hard-working nationals with rich arable lands of agro and light manufacturing. Only a few years ago, Deputy Speaker, um, communities of Karenese were relatively safe and secure. Today, our quiet districts are killing fields. They are dumps for murder victims. They are open drug turfs and centers of human carnage. This is most evident in Kelly Village, a beautiful community with law-abiding citizens. Deputy Speaker, during this administration's tenure, Kelly Village has become the scene of some of the most horrific crimes committed to date. Almost every day, there are gory murders, wild shootings, noisy drug parties, and other wanton acts of violence. There are so many brutal slayings that it is difficult to keep count. Victims are of all ages and of all groups of society. In short, Kelly Village is now one of the murderous districts in Trinidad and Tobago. This government, Deputy Speaker, this government has turned Kelly Village into Killing Village. I have brought this serious matter to Parliament on several occasions and pleaded for increased police patrols, the construction of a police posts, CCTV cameras, and other measures. I've appealed for the reactivation of police youth groups and other creative solutions. Kelly Village, Deputy Speaker, is a small community and law enforcement authorities have extensive resources and modern resources. The Minister of National Security has offered explanations, excuses, and guarantees. He has issued assurances, commitments, and undertakings. He has tossed around all sorts of high sounding language in a weird accent that I could barely understand. But still, homicides take place. Killings have become as common as flooding in Kelly Village. It is extremely disturbing that the people of Karen East, and specifically Kelly Village, cannot look forward to a reprieve from the horrible crime scourge. There's nothing in this budget that offers hope for Kelly Village and other crime-affected communities in this country. So the people of Karen East pray for the best, but expect the worst. <laughs> and moving on very quickly, I would just like to st um, state that um, I would like some help with the, um, I wrote to the minister 
of Agricultural Land and Fisheries on October 2021 on behalf of the residents and farmers of Hercules Straits in Ravinsab with regards to the structural integrity of that bridge and for the farmers of Ravinsab Main Road. Approximately 100 persons use this bridge daily. And um, at a recent site visit, upon seeing the condition of the bridge, I have developed a great concern for the vehicles that must traverse this bridge on a daily basis. The bridge is an old dilapidated wooden bridge with many rotting structures, sections, and no safety railing. The residents have indicated to me that the condition of the bridge is so bad that garbage collection trucks can no longer cross and are unable to collect garbage for the residents. The bridge is also used by heavy machinery and farmers of the area. I will also like, I will also appeal to the Minister of Agriculture and Land Fisheries about the bridge located at Lalu Trace, which I spoke about in the last budget. And um, the bridge has since fallen into the, into the river and it needs a complete reconstruction. In August of 2021, due to heavy rain, the resulting excessive water volume and water pressure, the structural integrity of the bridge failed and it collapsed. It is now impossible to both pedestrian and vehicular traffic. This, br this bridge affects over 50 residents and over 20 farmers in this area who rely on it to transport their produce. These farmers ha have supplied um, produce to the NAMDEFCO National COVID-19 Relief Hampers, and I'm asking for some help in the restoration of this bridge. Um, the residents include pregnant women, elderly, as well as um, there's no street lighting towards this bridge. I would also like to speak to the Minister, speak to the Minister of Education, who I wrote on the 7th of April 2022, concerning the inadequate conditions at the community center in which the Londonville Presbyterian School is now housed. Currently, 90 students are housed there temporarily. Um, the original arrangement was for 60 students in 2017, but currently, because this has been going on for over five years now, it includes standard four and five. There's inadequate space for the students, with some classrooms being shared with up to three classes. Infants with 28 students share 400 square feet. Standard one, two, and three are in one room. 33 students in 544 square feet. Standard four with 21 students are in a 170 square foot room. Standard five with eight students is in a 160 square, square foot room. These small classroom sizes affect the ability to learn, and the rooms offer no distancing between the students, which prevents social distancing during a pandemic. This facility does not also include a quarantine room or a sick bay um, in the event that a student has flu-like symptoms. Students also attend school via a private bus, so should a, should a student develop symptoms, there's nowhere to house a student. The washroom facilities are also inadequate, with just three for boys and three for girls. The washrooms are also used by the public, who also use the community center. The school has two male cleaners, and we are asking that there at least be one female cleaner um, for the benefit of the female students. And the locks on the washrooms also do not work. Parking space is inadequate. Deputy Speaker, uh, moving on. Um, I thought the Minister of Health would have used this opportunity um, to speak of um, the, the international concern of monkeypox, which the World Health Organization has said is a public health emergency of international concern. He made no mention of if we would get monkeypox vaccines, and I'm very concerned about this, seeing that carnival is coming up. Currently, there are over 64,000 cases in across 100 um, countries around the world. Borders are open, and people are traveling freely as they were before COVID-19. Cases have been reported as close as the Bahamas, bah Barbados, Jamaica, and Venezuela. The U.S. has been unable to control the spread of the virus, and I would have liked the minister to give us an update on um, when PAHO has given us those vaccines. Minister Dial Singh has given no timeline for the arrival of much-needed vaccines, and this leaves healthcare workers such as myself and the general public exposed. Our nation is unprepared, and our vulnerabilities are enormous. Minister Dial Singh, please at some point state when and how many vaccines are to arrive in Trinidad and Tobago. We must immediately expand testing capacity and educate Trinbagonians on how to stay safe. 
Um, Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to speak very quickly about poliomyelitis. The minister also has not brought this to our attention. Um, in the United States, um, and the, the Pan American Health Organization director, Dr. Carissia Etienne, has set a ramp up our vaccination of polio. And she sounded this warning, advising that immuniz immunization is the only way to suppress polio. Um, currently, regionally, the vaccination coverage is about 79%, the lowest since 1994. And we would need over 95% to have herd immunity in Trinidad and Tobago. And what happened is during the last two years during COVID-19, many parents did not um, stay up to date with their children's vaccination status with regards to these, these viruses. And we have a lower vaccination rate right now. I told the minister would have spent some time you know, educating the public about what is happening with our poliomyelitis situation. And in closing, how much more time do I have, Deputy Speaker? I have just about three minutes. Thank you. And in closing, I would, um, I would appeal to the Minister of Health uh, to modernize the Dental Act. Um, just quickly, right now we have many, many, many illegal dentists practicing in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, many from Venezuela. And they are advertising openly on Instagram and Facebook and, and all these media. And the general public doesn't know who is a registered dentist and who is not a registered dentist. And many of these Venezuelan dentists are offering um, services at one third and one quarter the price of Trinidadian and, and Trimigodian dentists. And we do not know the level of safety that they have in their offices. If they have an autoclave machine, if they are using gloves, if they are sterilizing the equipment, we know nothing about these dentists. So we are asking the minister to please allow the modernization of the Dental Act to allow prosecution of non-registered persons performing dentistry, right? Also, as it stands in law, nothing prevents a person who is not a registered dentist from importing, gaining access to, and being in possession of drugs, dental equipment, and other paraphernalia pertaining to dentistry. And we need a law to stop that. Right? There are too many quacks, too many illegal practitioners of dentistry in Trinidad and Tobago. So I make appeal to you. Um, with those few words, Deputy Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute in this debate. And um, thank you very much. I, rec I recognize the member for San Fernando East. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, so many of my colleagues on the other side seem to be conflicted. And how could they not be? They seek on a daily basis to destroy the very country that they claim they want to lead. Instead of building, all they do is seek to destroy and to obstruct. Let me begin by dealing with some of the misinformation that we heard here today. I begin with the member for Princess Town. The member for Princess Town began by complaining, or he ended, sorry, by complaining about the state of roads and drainage within his constituency. Let me remind the good member from Princess Town that there's something called the Princess Town Regional Corporation, which is managed by the UNC. Unfortunately, Mr. Deputy Speaker, parts of San Fernando East are managed by the Princess Town Regional Corporation. And I hope with local government reform that that can be changed because constituents from San Fernando East in the areas that are managed by the PTRC constantly complain of not receiving any services from the Princess Town Regional Corporation. And I'm talking about areas such as Corinth, parts of St. Madeline, and of course, Taradale. So I would direct the member from Princess Town to please seek counsel and assistance from his good friends at the Princess Town Regional Corporation. Next, we move on to my good friend, the member for Tabakit. The member for Tabakit, uh, you know, said with a straight face here today that members on this side could not be trusted. Let me remind the honorable member that the main reason why we are here and they are there is because this country refused to allow them to stay in office after 2015 because they could not be trusted. They were kicked out of office. You know what's strange, Mr. Deputy Speaker? 
they have a problem with my moving during the national anthem because of an emergency situation. But they have no problem sitting in the same benches with a gentleman charged with fraud. They have no problem with that. They have a problem with my pointing out glaring and obvious bias. I, I told no lies, Mr. Deputy wait, Speaker. Wait, wait, hold it. Hold it. You're not in charge here. It's all no lies. No, no. First of all, let's retract that, that last term. The, the last. The Sorry, term I told no on truths. Right. And, 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 and hold on, right? And, and secondly, and, and secondly, you stand by your earlier phrase on what the standing order raised by the member? What standing order is that, sir? You stand in order raised by the member. You stand by, by what you... What yes, you I do. Proceed. All right, thank you. Mr. <laughs> Speaker, in addition to 48, um, 6, I also raise 48... Um, no, 49. 49, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The subjudicate matter. Um, okay, okay, okay. No, I, the statement made, the subjudicate aspect is with regards to, because he didn't call no name, with regards to. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member said, colleagues with, in relation to a member on the, sitting on the opposition bench, and that is the point I am making. Mr. Deputy Speaker. No, but again, again, I would like clarity from the chair with regards to what aspect of subjudice, what aspect are you talking about? He said colleagues, where? Just let me know, please. Guide me. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is in the public domain. The gentleman is very aware in terms of what he's speaking about. And in that context, I am asking you to ask him to withdraw you're under the relevant standing order. Again. Remember, you care to proceed on, on the topic that you, the aspect that you're speaking about with regards to the information provided? Certainly, thank you. Right. Proceed. Yes. So, I hope I can reclaim my time, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker. 48-6, and I will explain very briefly. The only time a member can bring issues of character against any member here in the opposition or any member at all is on a substantive motion. He cannot raise issue of character okay. outside of that 486. And again, for clarity from the chair, the member has not identified any particular individual. So, um, so on, from on both sides, from your chief whip, hold on, from your chief whip intervention, and with regards to the member, I ask for clarity. No one is able to give me. He says he stands by what he's saying, and he shall proceed. Thank, and he thank you. Wrong. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And he's Mr. Still wrong. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they have an issue. They have an issue. Member. They have an issue, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with my calling out. One. All of us. All of us cannot speak at the same time. And for the last time on this particular aspect, member, you stand by your comments. Thank you. Yes, they, have a, they seem to have an issue with my calling out blatant bias in a daily newspaper. But they have no issue. They have no issue following someone living in a pink palace that no career politician could ever afford, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That is how skewed their values are. They have a problem with me, but they have no problem being a part of a party that formed perhaps the most corrupt government in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. It just shows who they are, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The member from Tabakit. of insulting, insulting language, offensive and insulting, and I ask him to withdraw that. Overruled. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure what they're so worried about. 
The, the, the member from Tabaki spoke about trust, but I guarantee you she would never leave a drink unattended around a member from Kuva North. But she's worried about members on this side, Mr. Mr. Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, 48 4, 48 6. So again, again, honorable. 48 1, irrelevance of 48 4, 48 6. Members, I'm waiting for silence so that I, I, can re, I, can, I can refer to your colleagues' comment. Again, honorable member, members, and for all other members, let's get on with the debate. It's, it's getting late. Let's get on with the particular debate. In terms of your last, your last statement, I think retract and you, I, you, 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 I, I, I retract, you, Mr. Deputy make, Speaker. Make a I better retract. statement. But the member for Tabaki knows that the reason that we are in government is because the people. Mr. 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 Deputy to be Speaker, you asked the honourable member to retract his statement, I and I think that he should be, he should do it. I did retract. He should do it. Okay. Member, member, Chief Whip. Acting for the records, I am sure he did, and he has. I sure he did retract. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I'm not sure what all the concerns is about, and that's why the theme of my presentation today, your contribution, is called facts, not feelings. Those on the other side seem to have a problem with facts, and we are here today to set the record straight. Even a member from Tabaki knows that the alternative to the people's national movement is chaos and confusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And that is why we are in office right now, and they will spend the rest of their natural lives in opposition. I move on. Mr. Deputy Speaker, other, other strange statements made today, and I, and I refer to the member from Kearney East. He, he made, the member made some comments about uh, Pfizer's Paxlovid drug that I'd like to straighten out. Uh, Pfizer's, I have an article here. Pa Pfizer's Paxlovid goes generic in 95 countries. Critics say too little, too late. A medicine's patent pool announcement announced Thursday that it had signed agreements with 35 companies to manufacture generic versions of Pfizer's life-saving COVID-19 Paxlovid treatment for distribution in 95 low and middle-income countries. This came under fire almost immediately from medicines access groups as too little, too late. However, activists quickly slammed this new accord, saying that it would take up many months to actually set up the generic production lines of the game-changing oral drug, which in clinical trials reduced COVID mortality by 90% among high-risk groups. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the drugs aren't available in Trinidad and Tobago because they have not been created yet for us. So I've set the record straight on that one, because I know the honorable member would not want to misinform the national community. Also, I'd like to inform the honorable member that PAHO has not yet given a timeline for the monkeypox vaccines. So it isn't that this government has not accessed the vaccines. It is also, again, they are not available yet, but will be soon. Also, the, the dental health bill right now is currently before the LRC and will eventually come to this August chamber. Thank you. Let me move on now to deal with some of the some of the comments made by the opposition leader today. And the opposition leader promptly tried to rewrite history and also rewrite reality with uh, the presentation today. She spoke of broken promises, spoke about the People's National Movement not keeping its promises. This very same opposition leader came here today saying that she would not bore and meander the public with a long response to the budget, and then promptly proceeded to break her own promise. That is how those at the other side operate, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As soon as the promise was even made by the opposition leader, it was promptly broken. And that is why the public 
just cannot trust those on the other side. The opposition leader spoke about outstanding payments. In just two organizations, two state enterprises, and I'll use maybe, well, I'll say that several organizations have outstanding payments because matters are before the courts. Because during the, up, the People's Partnership or UNC's time in office, there was such rampant corruption, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that many matters are still before the courts today. And I only use two, EFCL and EMBD, as an example, where there are approximately $5 billion in outstanding statements. Unfortunately, there's no evidence of any tendering process or any supporting documents. Mr. Deputy, to Speaker, Deputy Speaker, standing order 49, I believe the, um, the member admitted the matters are before court and he's going into evidential matters. Again, right? So I'll give you a little leeway, but yes. No problem. Move on to uh, uh, yes. Also, the opposition member attempted desperately today to rewrite history in terms of our crime statistics. The, the member made it seem as if crime was under control while they were in office. But as soon as they left, there was a spike in crime. Well, that's understandable, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because as we all know, criminals never bite the hand that feeds them. And while those on the other side were in office, we had state-sponsored crime and criminals in this country. We had live sport. We had gangs accessing government contracts and so on. Mr. Deputy and so Speaker, on. 48, 6, please. I made a statement of fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Overruled. Thank you. Also, the opposition leader attempted to rewrite the economic history of Trinidad and Tobago. And let me set the record straight. The opposition leader made it seem again that there was all roses and sunshine from 2010 to 2015. And then all of a sudden, as soon as governments changed, the economy collapsed. Nothing could be further from the truth. As far back as 2008, and I'll give the opposition leader a short economics lesson, because clearly it's needed. As far back as 2008, we had global financial crisis. That caused the world economy to collapse, and with it, energy prices. In 2009, Trinidad and Tobago had a deficit budget, which means a budget that was partially funded by debt. Those, those deficit budgets continued, Mr. Deputy Speaker, right into the term of the UNC government. And what occurred between 2014 and 2016 is on record as part of economic history as one of the worst downturns of energy prices in the history of the world. I'll quote for you from the World Bank's uh, webpage. Between mid-2014 and early 2016, the global economy faced one of the largest oil price declines in modern history. The 70% price drop during that period was one of the three biggest declines since World War II and the longest lasting since the supply-driven collapse of 1986, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But that, of course, did prevent those on the other side in 2014 from presenting the single largest budget in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Much of it borrowed money, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Because of the irresponsibility by those on the other side with our economy while they were in office, we have been digging ourselves out of that hole ever since. So don't, so don't fall for the, for the, for the bold-faced misrepresentations by those on the other side making it seem that they left an economy that was all rosy. That is not possible and it simply isn't true. We have been working diligently, this government, to stabilize the economy of Trinidad and Tobago and to set the stage for economic growth going forward in spite of the various crises that we have faced. And that is exactly what we have done. What this budget says unequivocally is that Trinidad and Tobago is back in business. After several years of severe hardship, this government has set the stage for growth and economic expansion with a responsible and almost balanced budget. Let me begin by discussing the fuel subsidy. A subsidy is defined as a sum of money granted by the state or a public body to help an industry or business keep the price of a commodity or service 
low. Let me give you a story, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Our habits have changed here in Trinidad and Tobago dramatically over time. When I was growing up, it was a family of four, and we had one car. There was a lady in Marabella called Miss Helen. Okay? Miss Helen drove a bread van, as they, as they call it. And she would collect all of the neighborhood children and, and take them to San Fernando. I guess you would call that today carpooling. But that is what persons did in the past. Today, because of the introduction of cheap motor vehicles and also cheap fuel, we have an abundance of cars on the roads of Trinidad and Tobago. And our habits have changed dramatically. A family of four today may have Mr. four cars. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker. 48 one, the relevance of this speech. Is he speaking about the car that was sold to the, the former It's okay. Woman, it's okay, like member. That. Member, thank you. Overruled. <laughs> yes. Overruled. So a family of four may, may easily have four motor vehicles because several individuals may own more than one. In Trinidad and Tobago sometimes, I think we believe that we can have it both ways, and we can't. You cannot have cheap motor vehicles, cheap fuel, and then have no traffic no pollution and no drain on our foreign exchange. It just doesn't work like that. Imported motor vehicles is one of the largest drains on our foreign exchange. We have to take a long look at ourselves and our habits and decide how we are going to adjust to a changing situation. Now, subsidies, especially the fuel subsidy, were designed and meant for poverty alleviation. The problem with the fuel subsidy is that it's inefficient and it's an inefficient means of alleviating poverty. And in many cases, it would benefit the wealthy more than it would benefit the poor in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll give you an example. Say we have a 50% subsidy on fuel. If you are driving a motor vehicle, it costs you $100 to fill the tank. That means that the state would be paying a 50% subsidy on your fuel. If you're driving a motor vehicle, a luxury vehicle perhaps, and it costs $500 to fill the tank, the state would be paying $250 on your behalf. And that is why a subsidy, a fuel subsidy, is wholly inefficient when it comes to poverty alleviation. And that is one of the major reasons why it is so wasteful. You are literally burning money up in smoke. It's going up in smoke, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It benefits the wealthy far more than it does the poor. And that is why we have decided to take spending away from this inefficient fuel subsidy and direct or funnel those funds into more targeted programs that will benefit the poor in this country. It also acts as a disincentive for conservation of fuel. It promotes traffic and pollution and is a drain on our foreign exchange. Regional comparisons still, uh, after all of that, even a partial repeal of the subsidy Trinidad and Tobago still has the lowest fuel prices in the region, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Those are facts, not feelings. At the same time, we maintain the price on LPG, which is meant to protect the poor. And you just have to look up and down this region. The price of LPG in other CARICOM countries can easily be five times what it is in Trinidad and Tobago. So we are setting the stage for development while protecting the poor and vulnerable in Trinidad and Tobago. That is called responsible governance, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is my view, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the subsidy on premium fuel should be completely removed. Anyone driving a vehicle that requires premium fuel is driving a luxury vehicle and should have no right to a fuel subsidy designed for poverty alleviation. And that includes me, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There should be no subsidy on premium fuel. In other words, with these targeted programs, we are placing money in the pockets of the poor in this country. And let me mention to your list several of the programs in which wasteful taxpayers' money, which would have been spent on a subsidy, will be spent to alleviate poverty in Trinidad and Tobago. The increased personal tax allowance up to $7,500. An increase in VAT registration threshold from $500,000 to $600,000. Increased subsidy on, very, on the very successful housing and village improvement
program, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This has been extremely beneficial to the people of San Fernando East and has provided homes for persons who, in some cases, did not know how they were going to ever uh, find a home for themselves. The establishment of a school to work apprenticeship allowance. This is an extension of the OJT program. It incentivizes employers to give our young people an opportunity to learn, um, at, you know, to learn at their own pace. Social grants totaling $5.4 billion. Senior citizens pension grants of up to $4.3 billion. Food support, food cards, school lunches, $175 million. Disability grant, $630 million. Social assistance grant, $355 million. Mr. Deputy Speaker, even with the partial removal of the fuel subsidy, Trinidad and Tobago remains the country with the single lowest cost of living in the entire region, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Facts, not feelings. On top of that, due to reduced spending on a wasteful fuel subsidy, a wasteful and inequitable fuel subsidy, 13,000 low-income customers of both, both WASA and TNTEC will receive water and electricity subsidies at an estimated cost of $3.75 million in 2023. And, have set aside, and we have also set aside $450 million for much needed road paving throughout the country. As the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance have explained publicly, much of the funds that were supposed to be for road paving were directed towards our COVID fight. But, and now that this budget is, will, will be passed, we have ensured that there's enough funding so that roads all over Trinidad and Tobago will be repaired. On top of even that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we still enjoy, and, and, and you know, people like to talk on the other side, they like to misrepresent the facts and talk about cost of living. With all of that we have done thus far, we also, on top of that, still enjoy subsidized electricity, subsidized water. We have subsidized inter-island ferry travel, subsidized air bridge, free, chronic, free drugs for chronic illness, free transportation for senior citizens and students, subsidized tertiary education, subsidized health care, subsidized homes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Every HC home is subsidized by the state with taxpayers' funds. We even have subsidized mortgages for persons to access those homes and other first-time homeowners. That's a 2% mortgage at the TTMF, which cannot be found anywhere else because it is subsidized by the state. Subsidized LPG, and the list goes on and on and on. Trinidad and Tobago has the absolute lowest cost of living in all of CARICOB, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Facts, not feelings. Unfortunately, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a lot of these facts have been skewed and obfuscated by several economic masqueraders out there in the media. Several of them seem to have found a home at the University of the West Indies speaking forums and a particular business desk at a media house. But I'm here today to expose some of these masqueraders. Yes, we have economic voices in the public domain masquerading as independent when they are nothing more than de facto members of the opposition, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Many seem to have found a home at the University of the West Indies, as I said earlier, or their speaking forums. We have one such example. There's one masquerader, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in 2020, stated with such authoritative brio, without qualification, no ceteris paribus, no with all things remaining the same, as if it came from the good Lord himself on Mount Sinai, that by the year 2022, Trinidad and Tobago will run out of foreign currency. That is what this person said. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this masquerader with a straight face predicted a current account deficit and a balance of payments crisis by 2022. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me present to you the reality of the situation. And I will quote from the budget document. Our premier record as a country which has never defaulted on its public debt remains intact. In contrast to other countries in the region, 
who have found it impossible to honor their debts over the years. Our current account, the current account of the balance of payments is anticipated to record a surplus of more than $4 billion in 2022. So Deputy Speaker, how could a professional make such a poor judgment, trying to predict the future, arrogating powers unto herself that she clearly did not have, attempting to predict what our economy will look like years down the road? How could they have gotten it so wrong? I move on to our net foreign reserves. Our net official foreign reserves as of August 2022 stood at 6.8 million, sorry, billion US dollars, representing 8.5 months of import cover, well above the international benchmark of three months. So this is the reality. While this masquerader is talking about current account and reserves crisis and running out of foreign exchange. We are not even close, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Moving on to the HSF, as a result of higher than expected oil and gas prices, we have deposited 163 million US into the HSF for, in for stabilization fund for intergenerational benefit. That acts as another buffer, and we have the ability to stabilize our fiscal spending in case of any kind of oil price shock internationally, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We also have inflows of foreign exchange from the oil and gas sector for the first eight months of calendar 2022, which were 1.9 billion US dollars, or 1.33 billion more than the same period in 2021. Mr. Deputy Speaker, those are facts, not feelings. But I ask again, how could a supposed professional and economic expert have embarrassed themselves so thoroughly by getting it so wrong. As if marketing Bitcoin throughout the entire region wasn't embarrassing enough. They make this prediction that is proven to be unsubstantiated and completely false, Mr. Deputy Speaker. False. But there's a sinister plan here, but I will get to that in due course, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Why should we ever trust the opinion of this supposed professional ever again? I have no idea why anyone else would. There's another masquerader, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who has been constantly promoting his policies of pain, even in the middle of the COVID crisis. This callous gentleman, while people were losing their lives and livelihoods, demanded a dreaded devaluation of our currency and a dramatic slashing of our public service workforce maybe up to 10 to 15% of our public service in the middle of a global pandemic. No. The last 15 minutes. Did he speak before us in the debate? Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I don't know why, why the member for Oropo seems so bothered today. <laughs> We're moving on. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as you all know, this government has committed itself to not devaluing our currency because we understand the kind of pain that a devaluation will cause on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We are but a small island, and a lot of what it is we consume is imported. A devaluation would immediately dramatically increase the cost of living for every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is something that this government has committed itself to not doing. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I crave your protection, please. It's a bit noisy. Silence, please. Silence. Mr. Deputy Speaker, these recommendations can only be considered as cruel, outdated, and uncaring economic policy. These are called austerity measures, and they have been proven to be without merit. Since this gentleman was kicked off of an economic advisory committee, he has embarked on a campaign of misinformation because it is all about him being right and everyone else being wrong. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are the Ministry of Finance, will not be deterred by this misinformation, and we will continue to do what we believe is fiscally responsible and to the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We have yet another masquerader, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, who I actually do have a level of respect for. This gentleman recently came up with a list
that ranked Trinidad and Tobago as the 15th worst performing economy in the world. So Deputy Speaker, we give ourselves far too much credit. When asked exactly where, what, where this list came from, the gentleman stated that it was calculated by himself using IMF figures. Only one problem. We have regular Mr. meetings. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, sorry, Madam Speaker, 48-1, the relevance of speaking about an, an, a fictitious character without identifying yourself or who this fictitious character is, what's the relevance of speaking fictitious characters? Say who your source is, identify what it is you're speaking about. We don't know who you're speaking about. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I think the member for Coover North is still concerned about unattended drinks, but let's move on. Trinidad and Tobago, they ran Trinidad and Tobago 40, as the 50 worst six, please. before. <laughs> Madam Speaker, 48 6, please. I, what, what drinks he's referring to, Coover North? I'm not. Thank you so much. He mistaken me for tourism. <laughs> he mistaken me for tourism. Trinidad and Tobago. His, this, this list calculated by this gentleman ranked Trinidad and Tobago as the 15th worst performing economy in the world, uh, supposedly using IMF figures. Only one problem. We have regular meetings with the IMF, and the IMF has stated unequivocally that this calculation and this ranking makes absolutely no sense, and they do not agree with it. In other words, uh, Madam Speaker, the IMF has said that your mats not mats in, so you better mats again. So I hope my good friend is listening. Another masquerader, a final, from the Tobago Business Chamber earlier this week made a statement that stated that this budget seemed like the government didn't have a plan. How can that be, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, national budgets are produced by the Ministry of Finance in conjunction with the Ministry of Planning and Development along with other stakeholders. That is the Ministry of Planning and Development. This is to ensure that government's fiscal measures are in keeping with our developmental goals as stated in the Vision 2030 and Roadmap to Recovery documents, both of which are readily available online. What's confusing is that the Tobago Business Chamber was one of the organizations that contributed to the development of both of these documents. So I don't know how this gentleman attached to the chamber could have made a statement that it seemed like we have no plan when he was part or his organization was part of developing said plan. But Madam Speaker, let me tell you what is the sinister goal of, of these masqueraders in the public domain, giving economic advice that I could only describe as misinformation. Madam Speaker, this is not random old talk by people and professionals who should know better, but a concerted effort to effect a sinister scheme. These masqueraders understand just how important investor sentiment is to protecting the exchange rate of this country. If investors do not believe in the Trinidad and Tobago economy, they will stop spending and begin, begin hoarding foreign exchange. What they are determined to do, Madam Speaker, is to force a currency devaluation, which will bring hardship to all, but they simply do not care. Madam Speaker, just on a point of clarification, the member continues to refer to masqueraders and so on. In an, in an effort to have some clarity, because if colleagues in responding wants to set the record straight, we, want, we would want to be in a position to whom the member is referring to. Could you point to the standing order you're referring to? Madam Speaker, 48 one in terms of the relevance of his speech. Oh, all right. So I overrule. Continue. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. It seems so excitable today. I don't know what it is. What they're determined to do, Madam Speaker, is force a currency devaluation, which will bring hardship to all in this country. But they do not care. As long as their needs, uh, their necessary, are feathered, they could not care about anyone else in Trinidad and Tobago. And that's when I say those on the other side are conflicted because they seek to destroy the very country they claim they want to lead. Mr. Madam Speaker, 48-6 and 48-4. 48-6, Madam Speaker, 48-6. 48-4.
He is imputing improper motives against members on this side of trying to destroy this country. That's absolutely untrue. He should retract that. Madam Speaker, thank you, because I spoke facts, not feelings. Moving along, this government has committed itself to not devaluing our currency in an effort to protect the poor, and we will not do so. Thank you. Moving on, Madam Speaker, to the sister Isle of Tobago. I'm the opposition leader today, one of her criticisms is that it seemed like this government was seeking to punish Tobago. But Madam Speaker, of course, once again, the facts will reveal that that is completely untrue. We have had at the Ministry of Finance several meetings with the newly appointed Chief Secretary and other representatives of the THA. The population should take note that it is this PNM government that has tried or attempted on several occasions to grant further autonomy to the people of Tobago, but have been blocked and obstructed from doing so by this obstructionist opposition. The Tobago allocation in 2022, Madam Speaker, we allocated $2.4 billion to the THA. For 2023, we allocated $2.5 billion dollars, approximately 4.3% of the total national budget. So how can it be said that we are attempting to punish Tobago, Madam Speaker? The facts simply do not support that statement. The Tobago tourism sector is poised to expand, with new hotel investments aiming to contribute to meet a shortfall of 2,500 rooms. Private sector investment in hotels, such as the proposed new Marriott Hotel at Rocky Point, the Manta Lodge and Sanctuary Resort, proposed new marina facility in southwest Tobago. Now, let me explain about this marina facility in Tobago, Madam Speaker. And I know those on the other side have a, have a very slim grasp of economics, so I'll try to assist them. When it comes to diversification and developing projects that actually have huge impact on our economy. Any country or any person or business has to compete along its competitive advantages. I like to equate it to, to Shaquille O'Neal playing basketball. Shaquille O'Neal is seven feet, 300 pounds. So he plays close to the basket. Going away from your competitive advantages is like asking Shaquille O'Neal to shoot threes. It makes no sense. Tobago's major advantage over its CARICOM neighbors is one, it's green, it's green, clean, and serene one, but there are other islands that are the same. Its major advantage over its CARICOM neighbors, with whom they have to compete for tourist dollars, is its location outside of the hurricane belt. Honorable member, you have five more minutes remaining of speaking time. Mm -hmm. You may request a further 10 minutes if you so desire. I'll take it, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Please proceed. Competitive advantage. I'd also like to recommend to Tobago that Tobago would be a prime location for medical tourism. Medical tourism is a multi-trillion dollar business and is a non-cyclical business. It is one that Tobago should take a very strong look at because its competitive advantages plus the access to medical professionals at Mount Hope give Tobago an opportunity to lead the entire region in that industry. I will speak more on that at another point. At the same time, Madam Speaker, this government also supplied tremendous support during the COVID crisis to Tobago. And I'll give you a list of exactly some of the things that were provided during the COVID pandemic to Tobago. We offered $50 million to the Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Sector Support Program to provide working capital to the tourism sector. 30 million for farmland development. 50 million for the Tobago hotel industry for financial grant support and to facilitate maintenance and upgrade works via the Tobago Tourism Accommodation Relief. And 4 million tourism COVID relief grant allocated to render greater support to the ancillary service providers in the industry. Madam Speaker, clearly, we have done all that we can to support Tobago, and there's no such thing as this government trying to punish Tobago in any way, as alluded to by the opposition uh, leader. 
Other sources of funding for projects in Tobago will come from various ministries, including state agencies. We have works and transport, tourism, social development, local government, all to the tune of up to $731.5 million. Tobago also has access to a $135 million in loan financing for development projects. projects. Also, $100 million loan financing from CAF for coastal protection works in Tobago. The overall allocation for expenditure in Tobago for 2023 is in the region uh, exceeds over $3 billion, Madam Speaker. Those are facts, not feelings. Moving on to diversification, Madam Speaker. And I believe I heard the opposition leader rattle off a bunch of archaic ideas and projects that made it seem as if the opposition leader is, does not realize that we're entering a digital age and it's time to step up. A lot of the projects that were mentioned today by the opposition leader are completely archaic and out of step with reality. So, referring to the diversification in the energy sector, I think there were parts of this that were missed by the general public, so I shall assist. One really important project, Madam Speaker, the methanol to polyolefins project by the Alkene Development Company of Trinidad and Tobago, ADCOT. This project, with expected overall capital expenditure of 1.5 billion US dollars, that is foreign direct investment in Trinidad and Tobago, aims to establish facilities to produce polyethylene and polypropylene resins. Madam Speaker, polyethylene is the widest used plastic in the world. It's high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene. Polypropylene is a clear plastic. Both are used for packaging, both are extremely important. Next, we have the aluminum ingot processing project. This is intended to create a new energy-based manufacturing industry without significant gas requirements. Products would include electrical cables and coal roll sheets made from aluminum. Capital expenditure on this project will be approximately 685 US million dollars, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what we are doing here is very extremely forward thinking. The, the foundation of the modern industrial world is built on iron, steel, plastics, and aluminum. Trinidad and Tobago is already the capital of manufacturing in the entire region. With access to these base materials, we can produce a manufacturing industry here in Trinidad and Tobago that can, one, employ thousands of people and generate billions of dollars in foreign exchange. And that is exactly what this forward-thinking PNM government is doing and ignoring the archaic ideas that have come from the other side. Madam Speaker, I wanted to really say some more about the NIB, but I know I'm pressed for time. The, as you would know, the government has been moving to move the retirement age to the age of 65. So let me explain of how exactly that works. We have an NIB fund of approximately $31 billion, which is the last single largest fund in the entire region. How it works is that contributions are made to the fund, and then along with the returns and investments of the fund are used to pay out benefits. The challenge that the world is seeing is that we, we have an aging and shrinking population. Because of that, contributions are shrinking. So we have several choices. One, we can increase contributions, which this government has committed to not doing. It would be taking more money out of the pockets of the people of this country. Or we can reduce benefits, which is also something that we will not do. So, Madam Speaker, we are forced to increase the workforce. Unfortunately, in Trinidad and Tobago and in much of the region, our birth rate has fallen to a point where it is less than two. I believe it's around 1.75 or 73 at this point. It's less than two, so we're not even replacing ourselves. And this has caused a challenge to our NIS fund. And this is why changes have to be made. It wasn't some of the crazy ideas offered by the opposition leader earlier, and I have no idea where the opposition leader would have gotten those ideas from. 
Uh, many have welcomed this proposition, Madam Speaker, in terms of being able to work a bit longer. It gives an opportunity, one, to pay off debts and also to increase savings before retirement. Madam Speaker, as I conclude, I want to say that this budget states unequivocally that Trinidad and Tobago is back in business. After coming through some extremely trying and difficult times, we have set the stage for this economy for a takeoff that we have been predicting for several years. I noticed during the budget presentation several members on the other side, when they heard the predicted energy prices for the next few years of 90 plus dollars per barrel and six dollars per MMBTU of gas, they went dead quiet. And Madam Speaker, they understand why. If energy prices stay at that level, they know that they will be enjoying 15 unbroken years in opposition because this government will absolutely provide for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We will grow this economy and we will do so while protecting the poor of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Orokuch West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for recognizing me to participate in this debate and to try to bring some sanity back into this conversation about the lives and future of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I want to break with tradition a little bit, largely because I just listened to a sub 55 minutes, Madam Speaker, of an explanation and a justification as to why this country is in the crisis that it is in. Because we have a minister in the Ministry of Finance who does not have a clue about finance, does not have a clue about what he is talking about, Madam Speaker. Not a clue. In fact, listening to this honorable minister was a painful exercise. A painful exercise, Madam Speaker, because he was talking all over the place. This minister was not sure whether he was a member of parliament for Tobago. He was talking about Tobago. He was talking everything else except finance, Madam Speaker. Except finance. Everything else except finance. Gentlemen, sir, you have had your opportunity. Allow me to have mine now, please. Madam Speaker, but that's not the worst part of this thing. The worst part today that I heard from the minister in the Ministry of Finance is when he listed out a series of subsidies as if the government was doing this tremendous favor to the population. And then he crossed a line, Madam Speaker, because he sent a signal. And you could tell from his colleagues, his own colleagues, that they were not sure that this was a policy position that he stated. When he said, Madam Speaker, that it is his view, and I want the Minister of Finance, when he's wrapping up, to advise whether this is the Ministry of Finance's view, whether this is this government's view, that there should be no subsidy on premium fuel. There should be no subsidy. Because the signal that this minister is sending, that this government, on behalf of his government. And, and maybe it's because it's late, my hearing might be becoming a bit impaired. So I'll ask you all, please, to control the conversation, the crosstalk, so that I can hear the contribution. Continue, Member for Puchwes. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this minister is also signaling what I believe to be the government's clear intention to remove all these subsidies, all these subsidies that he's talking about, that he begrudgingly is given to citizens. These subsidies, Madam Speaker, removing subsidies left, right, and center. Madam Speaker, this very sad minister also used the parliamentary privilege of standing here Madam and Speaker, attacking individuals. Madam Speaker, 48-6, the member of parliament for San Fernando East was clear to state that it was his personal opinion. Okay. The, the member All there right. is okay. saying this. All right, I overrule. Please continue. Just for clarification, Madam Speaker, when a member of parliament, a minister in the Ministry of Finance, stands in this house, he doesn't have a personal view. He's expressing the view of the government. That is the government's view. Now, if the minister in the Ministry of Finance, if the minister of Finance wants to disavow himself, if he wants to disavow that, that's up to them. But the minister today spoke as the minister 
in the Ministry of Finance, and that his, his statement clearly signals to the population that this fuel price increase that we're experiencing here is not yet finished. I move on, Madam Speaker. The minister also used his parliamentary privilege. He stands there in this honorable house and attacks persons who are not in this house, casting aspersions left, right, and center, but it's too coward to call the names of the people he's assassinating. That character assassination is dis It's very unfortunate, Madam Speaker. It's very unfortunate that an adult, a person involved in politics at this level, will stoop so low as to attack people's character. Madam Speaker, the minister also suggested, having listened to the honorable leader of the opposition before, that she presented a series of archaic plans. A series of archaic plans. Madam Speaker, he then tried to present one of his own. But tell me, Madam Speaker, whether these are archaic plans. A biotechnology manufacturing corridor, a digital innovation park, a creative Trinidad Creative Center, an energy logistics hub, solar tech renewable park, the South East, Southwest Peninsula Economic Zone. Those are not archaic, Madam Speaker. Those are projects that are feasible and practical, but the minister does not know that because it's above his intellectual capacity, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there's much more I could say about this presentation by this honorable minister, including the fact that he tried to rewrite history, including the fact that he admitted that when, this, when the UNC came into government as part of the People's Partnership, they found an economy that was collapsing. But he chose to leave out certain parts, just like his Minister of Finance, which I will come to just now, Madam Speaker. He chose to leave out specific parts because while the economy is falling, based on international prices falling, Madam Speaker, the Kamala Passad Bissessa administration was still able to grow the economy by more than 20%, and that's a fact. They were still able to increase and make submissions and provisions to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, and that's a fact. They were still able to employ 55,000 new jobs, create 55,000 new jobs, that's a fact. That, Madam Speaker, is what the minister needs to compare with what is happening today. Madam Speaker, allow me to a few minutes to calm down, Madam Speaker. And I want to begin to put this back into perspective where we have lost it because of the presentation of the minister on the other side. Madam Speaker, I want to congratulate the honorable leader of the opposition for such an intelligent, comprehensive, and people-centered response to what was in fact a most disappointing budget presentation by the Honorable Minister of Finance. I also want to congratulate my colleagues who have spoken before and my other colleagues who will speak uh, after me in, the making, in raising the concerns and the recommendations they have for how this country should be dealt with going forward. You see, Madam Speaker, we on this side, as patriotic citizens of this country, know that we must hold this government to account Otherwise, it will be chaos, mayhem, corruption, and mismanagement. You could draw the word corruption. You could use the other ones, okay? It will be chaos, mismanagement, and wanton wastage. Madam Speaker, another one of the multiple misconceptions raised by colleagues on the opposite side is something I want to correct today, hopefully for the last time because it forms an integral part of a lot of what the government likes to, to tell the population of this country. Let me be very clear, Madam Speaker, that there's no such thing as government revenue separate and aside from taxpayers' revenue. Every red cent collected by this Minister of Finance and by this government from taxes, grants, loans, sales of assets, rents, Every red cent belongs to the taxpayers of this country. That is not PNM money. That is not the member for Diego Martin Northeast's money. That is not the Prime Minister's money, Madam Speaker. That money belongs to citizens of this country. So this narrative that the government has been using, that the state must share the burden equally, 
it is all taxpayers' money and it is all money being spent and sh that should have been spent on, on the citizens of this country. Because the wealth of Trinidad and Tobago doesn't belong to the PNM. It belongs to taxpaying citizens. Madam Speaker, this budget is a crime against the people. Allow me to explain, Madam Speaker. If you listen carefully to the reactions of members of the public, you would be clear, Madam Speaker, that members of the public have rejected this budget for what it is. It's an abuse of office, Madam Speaker. You see, Madam Speaker, a government is supposed to use the resources of the state for the improvement of the substance and quality of the lives of citizens. So when you have a minister coming here and the decisions that he's taken with regards to paying monies out, that is taxpayers' money, and instead of making their lives better, he's making their lives worse, Madam Speaker. That's an abuse. That's an unacceptable abuse. And if you listened to the words of the people, Madam Speaker, and the commentaries that have been um, raised by citizens outside, you know that this is not a government of the people, for the people, or by the people. Madam Speaker, there are several instances where ministers in the, last, in the recent past have displayed their own angst against citizens. But this government, Today, on Monday, I think put the nail in the coffin, Madam Speaker. This government, these ministers of government, are so far removed, Madam Speaker, from the realities of the day-to-day -day crises facing citizens of this country, that it is worrisome. And it is worrisome, Madam Speaker, because these are the same ministers that are making expenditure decisions for over $400 billion in the last seven years and another $57.7 billion on this budget. Due to time constraints, Madam Speaker, I want to focus on only one of those issues, the removal of the subsidy on fuel. I think the entire country remembers the sickening sound of the Minister of Finance laughing as he raised the price of fuel, snickering that citizens had not rioted yet. And last Monday, I saw the same lack of concern, the same angst against the population. When every member of government thumped their desks, gave each other high fives, celebrating the fact that the Minister of Finance announced that citizens were immediately going to have to pay between 15% and 14%, 15 more for, for premium and 14% more for super gasoline. This, by the way, is the same Minister of Finance, Madam Speaker, who, when he was in opposition, was completely against the increase in the price of fuel. But when he had the opportunity, Madam Speaker, he jumped to raise the price of fuel. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. I believe, Madam Speaker, this is the fifth or sixth time, and I honestly believe, given the comments made by the Minister in the Ministry of Finance, that this is not finished yet. They are going to come again and again and again and again until the subsidy, until the protection that citizens have based on their own money is removed by this uncaring, heartless government. The minister raised the price of super by 158% in his seven years. He raised the price of premium from $5.75 to $7.75 over the, per liter over the last seven years. He raised the price of diesel, Madam Speaker, by 227% over seven years, Madam Speaker. And while he pushes fuel prices up, this is the same minister of finance who is offering public servants a trickle. 4%, 4% over six years. Madam Speaker, this minister has also publicly stated, the Minister of Finance, that is, has also publicly stated that he has received over $8 billion, $8 billion more in revenues in fiscal 2022 than he expected. And as a result of the continued energy boom, Going into 2023, he expects to get even more revenue, Madam Speaker. But you know, like the rest of the world, even this minister knows that this energy boom is temporary. 
It's temporary, Madam Speaker. So what should have been done is a caring government would have used some of that saving, some of that additional income that he got that he didn't budget for to rally citizens through, to protect citizens from the punishment of higher energy prices that they are vesting under the population, especially, Madam Speaker, especially given the hardships that citizens are now starting to emerge from, especially given the hardships that this government is also going to vest upon them through property tax, through increased energy prices, through increased um, wasser rates and, uh, and, and tea and tech rates, especially since the minister knows that their spending power the disposable income of citizens have fallen drastically, Madam Speaker. That what a caring government should do should be to assist the, the citizens, subsidize the citizens so that we don't have, not just we, Madam Speaker, all citizens don't have to go through the trauma of facing higher prices and the runoff effect and the multiplier effect on that of higher food fuel prices on everything else. Instead, this callous PNM regime throws average citizens, hardworking citizens, under the bus at a point in time when their disposable income is probably the lowest, thanks to the measures of this government. Madam Speaker, it is obvious that once you include, increase the price of fuel, once you increase the price of fuel, the price of everything else, every other good and services that have a, a transportation um, component will increase. And that's literally every single good and service, Madam Speaker. The minister came, this minister repeated it, uh, the other minister before me, who spoke before me. That is a proposal to give 175,000 persons a one-off grant of $1,000. But that is a mama guy, Madam Speaker. Because even if world prices fall for fuel, the price for fuel today has been fixed by the minister. It's been fixed by the minister. And nobody believes that this minister, especially given the rants and the raves of the minister previously, nobody believes that this minister or the ministry or the government is going to ever reduce the price of fuel, even if world energy prices fall. Worse, Madam Speaker, the increase in the price of fuel was immediate. But minister failed to say when these persons who are recognized to be desperately in need and adversely affected worse by this increase in fuel prices, when they are going to be able to access this grant, that this one-off grant that he's offering to them. Just to be clear, Madam Speaker, that works out to $2.74 per day. $2.74 per day, and they have no idea when they're going to get it. It's mama guy, Madam Speaker, but there's more. There's more. This one-off grant completely ignores the plight of parents already struggling to send their students to school who have just managed, they literally have just managed to eke out enough money, borrow money from wherever they can, and that's the reality of the situation we are living in now, borrow money from wherever they can to buy school books and uniforms. Madam Speaker, in my constituency, and I'm sure it happens in other constituencies as well, there are individuals who are simply unable to send their children to school because they cannot afford to pay the transport. They cannot afford to buy food for these children. Children are being kept away from school because of financial hardships. That's the reality that we live in now. That's not the reality that they live in, Madam Speaker, but it's the reality that we live in. There are thousands of parents who are experiencing this trauma. And now, to put increased fuel prices on them, because the grants that the minister is speaking about does not come to students. It does not come to these poor parents. It does not come to them at all. You see, the minister is promising to give $1,000 on one hand, Madam Speaker, and taking back 10 times as much via property tax and, and hikes and uh, uh, wasser rates, etc., as I mentioned before. Madam Speaker, the ministers also clearly stated, clearly stated that the cost of the fuel subsidy, according to him, 
would be upwards of $2.2 billion. And therefore, they have capped the fuel subsidy at $1 billion, meaning that taxpaying citizens must now dip into their own pockets to pay $1.2 billion. The minister claims, the minister of finance, claims that that is additional money that could be spent on social grants, education, health, transportation, etc., and assisting the poor and vulnerable. Madam Speaker, I want to know, and I want to ask the minister, why these are mutually exclusive? Why is it that they could not subsidize the fuel and provide, allow me, and provide the support needed through the same social grants, education, health, and transportation? Why must there be a trade-off? A trade a minister previously indicated that we must find the Minister of Health, I believe. You must find the money to spend. Madam Speaker, I want to tell them again where the money is because it's not that a trade-off is required. The money exists, Madam Speaker. The money is there. All that is required to access that money is for the government to stop the state-sponsored corruption. I will redraw, Madam Speaker. All that is required is for the government to stop the state-sponsored mismanagement, extraction, illegal loss of funds that they have been facilitating by refusing to implement the public procurement you know, and the... Member, I, I don't know illegal loss of funds is any different. So we draw that and find another way, please. I withdraw the... I, I, I withdraw, Madam Speaker. I withdraw. In 2020, and these are not my words, Madam Speaker, in 2020, the Express called it the cost of corruption, and I'm quoting, open quotation, the cost of corruption. Member, um, what you have to understand, and I, I think we've said it here, it's well settled. Anything you quote becomes your words. So if, if it's not allowable for you to use it firsthand, you can't quote something that's inappropriate, all right? So that should be your guidance for whatever you're going to quote. Madam Speaker, the government has refused to implement the Public Procurement and Disposal of Property Act 2025. They have continued to do so. That has cost taxpayers $5.2 billion per year for the last seven years. $5.2 billion, Madam Speaker. If yesterday, if last year, if in fiscal 2021 or in fiscal 2022, they had fully implemented this, this legislation, according to the, direct, the, the procurement regulator, Madam Speaker, $5.2 billion would have been accessible to this government. That is $5.2 billion that they spent that they cannot account for. $5.2 billion that has vanished because we have not seen the production. We have not seen the output for it. That $5.2 billion would have been back into the government's hands to spend with enough money. They could have taken $1.2 billion out of that $5.2 in mis is mismanagement and misdirected funds. They could have taken $1.2 million in that to subsidize the fuel so we don't have the crises that we have now. And that and $4 billion, Madam Speaker, could have been spent on grants, laptops, social support, education, health, etc. Instead, Madam Speaker, the government's refusal to implement this, legis this legislation means that, again, $5.2 billion minimum would again be lost to mismanagement and any other word they want to use, Madam Speaker, for loss of funds without any evidence of output being created. And they're refusing to implement the legislation, Madam Speaker, but they're coming again to ask for $57.7 billion again to spend without proper oversight by the procurement regulator. Madam Speaker, interestingly enough, I noted that the Minister of Finance complained that over the last 84 months, the government has struggled to pay salaries, and this has, caused, this has forced them 
to borrow more than $30 billion. In other words, Madam Speaker, $30 billion, as I said before, $36.4 billion is what has been lost to this country in taxpaying money for which no accountability has had because it's disappeared, it's not been under the procurement regulator. $36.4 billion lost that way, Madam Speaker. But the government, the Minister of Finance came on, on Monday gone and told this country that they had to borrow $30 billion. But I will deal with $30 billion subsequently. But it's, it appears to me, Madam Speaker, that we seem to be borrowing money to pay for things that we are not seeing. So we are losing $36.4 billion. We are borrowing $30 billion. So we have lost that $36.4, and we are losing this $30.4 billion, this $30 billion that the minister says he's borrowing. All has gone into this, uh, whatever other word they want to use, Madam Speaker. Lost to the country, lost to taxpayers because of incompetence or mismanagement or otherwise extracted from the Treasury, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, listening to the minister on Monday gone, the minister cited this $30 billion figure, trying to tell the population that things were so bad, he actually had to borrow a little bit upwards of $30 billion. Madam Speaker, we have indicated, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition has indicated before, that you cannot trust this Minister of Finance with figures. And it appears we cannot trust this Junior Minister as well with numbers or any other such thing, including plans and policies. Madam Speaker, the fact is that despite the Minister's allegation that he had to borrow $30 billion, when you add up the figures that were supplied by the very same Ministers, it is not $30 billion, Madam Speaker, that was borrowed by this government. The figure borrowed by this government over the last seven years is two and a half times higher than that, not 30 billion. This minister and this government has been responsible for borrowing $78.191 billion over the last seven years. That is the minister's track record for borrowing, Madam Speaker. But let me share another statistic with you, Madam Speaker, because that means that this, in seven years, this minister has been able to borrow half of what was borrowed over a period of 57 years before that. The reason for my concern, Madam Speaker, is because of the growing crises that we have, the growing debt component, the foreign debt component, at a point in time when we, our foreign exchange holdings are depreciating, and we are now at a position, Madam Speaker, where the level of foreign debt is almost equal to the value of our foreign reserves almost equal, and that's a crisis waiting to happen, Madam Speaker. But that's this government's policy. So you're borrowing and indebting future generations and future generations and their generations after that. But you're not putting anything in place. You're not putting anything in place to repay those things. Madam Speaker, we are creating, we have not, we're not creating anymore. We have created a substantial debt trap. And that is burying this current generation and future generations to come. Madam Speaker, once more, I want to quote uh, another example of the minister's incorrect use of figures in his last budget presentation. And I quote, Madam Speaker, on Monday, this minister came to the parliament and told this country, and I quote, I am advised by the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries that natural gas production has stabilized and that decline in production, which began in 2020, has been reversed. I am further advised, and I continue the quotation, I am further advised that gas production has increased significantly since May 2022 and is now close to 2.9 MCF per day. I am advised that we will end the year with an average production of 2.75 MCF of gas per day. And barring unforeseen circumstances, this is expected to increase to just under 3.0 MCF per day in 2023. But let me just say, Madam Speaker, end quote, sorry, but let me just say, Madam Speaker, that if these figures are true, then this country is in serious crisis. And if these figures are not true, then this country is in serious crisis because it means that the minister is wrong. 
So, Madam Speaker, I checked the budget speech. I checked the copy, the hard copy of the budget speech provided by the minister. I checked the online budget speech. I listened to the minister's budget contribution, as painful as it was. I checked the media for articles to see if the minister provided a correction, but there was not. Not even today. The minister, therefore, stands by what is in his budget statements and all the figures presented there. Madam Speaker, the fact is that gas production, according to the available data, is not now at 2.9 MCF, as the minister quotes. In fact, it is 1,000 times higher at 2,900 MCF, or 2.9 BCF, billion cubic feet, per day. Now, I had friends in the energy sector calling me from Houston and everywhere else, Madam Speaker, to verify if what this minister is saying is true. It is not true. And at this level, the Minister of Finance should not be making such billion dollar, billion dollar errors. I wonder sometimes, Madam Speaker, if this Minister of Finance even knows what is going on in the Ministry of Energy, much less for the Ministry of Finance. And that is why this country is in the crisis that it is in. From then to now, the minister had multiple opportunities to correct his blunder. They have not. None of the members that spoke today have. And for four, five days that have passed, they have allowed this misinformation to continue to exist. Madam Speaker, I want to refer the minister and the Ministry of Finance to some statistics today. I want to help him out a little bit. The Minister of Finance, in his presentation, made extensive use of IMF data. He's done that not just on this budget speech, but on the spotlight for the economy and on media review and in previous budget statements. He's placed great reliance on the statistics derived from the IMF website and their data center in several of his, of, of his uh, presentations. I have used the very same data. And for the minister in the Ministry of Finance's reference, I want to advise him that the source of the data is, and he can go and check it, please. It's at www.imf.org forward slash en forward slash data. That's the source of the information that I use. All that was required was a proper sorting of the data by country and a ranking of the data by year. And from that, you can discern trends by the IMF based on historical data and, 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 and projected data supplied by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to the IMF. And allow me to share some of the trends that this minister chose to leave out. And you decide why, Madam Speaker. You see, the Minister of Finance has a habit of comparing Trinidad and Tobago with a series of other countries cherry-picking his choices based on the narrative that he wants to sell. Just so that he could claim that Trinidad and Tobago is better off today because the PNM in government. Well, we who live in the real world, the citizens outside there, the 1.4 million citizens outside there, they know that this country is far worse off today than it has ever been under any previous government in Trinidad and Tobago. Back to the data, Madam Speaker, according to the data downloaded yesterday at 4 p.m., the Trinidad and Tobago economy lost about 16% of its real GDP between 2014 and 2021, while the rest of the Caribbean grew by 3.2% and the rest of the world grew by an average of 24% during the same period. So while we were dropping, the rest of the world were increasing 2016 to 2021. What is worrying, Madam Speaker? is based on the same trend analysis and current government policy, the same data, the same IMF data, based on the same trends. The projection is that the Trinidad and Tobago economy, the real GDP, our real output, will be 2.3% smaller in 2027 than it was in 2024. While that is happening, the projection is that we, it will get worse. While that is happening, the projection for the rest of the Caribbean is that they will get better. 
Now, this is exactly in sync, Madam Speaker, with the facts presented by the, minister, by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition earlier, which showed a failing business environment which has already resulted in the loss of investor confidence in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I know that the minister will jump up quickly and point to investments promised by energy companies in particular, but these are all based on private negotiation with concessions protected by secrecy and, and uh, non-disclosure agreements that we have no access for. We have no access for, and it would not be the first time that the Minister of Finance and ministers on the opposite side, Madam Speaker, have come here to this parliament and made broad pronouncements of multi-billion dollar investments that never materialize, because that has been the history of the members on the opposite side. What the data shows, Madam Speaker, and again, I'm referring to the IMF data, nobody's analysis except mine, of factual, I didn't create any statistics. I didn't create, all that was required was a ranking of statistics. And if the minister would stop being lazy and do his own ranking, he will come to the same conclusion and get the same results and be just as worried as we are on this side, unless the minister already knows that and prefers to sell the flavor, to sell the image that Trinidad and Tobago is doing well, when the facts do not support that. In fact, Madam Speaker, when the data is sorted even further, and that's a basic, basic algebraic interpretation, basic algebraic methodology, when the data is sorted even further, it shows that Trinidad and Tobago, pay attention, Minister and the Ministry of Finance, Pay attention. It shows that Trinidad and Tobago will be ranked based on failing infrastructure right now, based on failing energy fields and the full dependence of the government only on energy and nothing else. We will be ranked as one of the eight worst performing ministries. Sorry. Trinidad and Tobago will be ranked as one of the worst performing economies. The eight worst performing economy out of 195 countries in the world. And the minister could do his own homework and come to his own conclusion and check it for himself and verify that what I'm saying is fact. Under this government, you are sabotaging the future of Trinidad and Tobago and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, over the last seven years, the Minister of Finance has talked about diversification. He's talked about targeting specific industries for development. They spoke about agriculture as a, as a, growth, uh, a growth pole, a growth industry. They've spoken about fintech and about a flurry of game changers and mega projects, and more recently, digitization as a vehicle for transformation of the economy. All of these, Madam Speaker, thus far has failed. Because too often the decisions to proceed with projects is not based on financial, uh, financial propriety. It's not based on cost-benefit analysis. It's based on narrow political interests as opposed to long-term developmental objectives. And that's why a completed children's hospital at Coover remained closed while citizens were forced to wait for weeks and months and years for basic surgery and basic medical attention. Bad mind, Madam Speaker. Political decisions that has affected Trinidad and Tobago citizens negatively because this government does not simply care about the people of Trinidad and Tobago. For seven years, this Minister of Finance spoke about the need to move away from over-reliance on the energy sector. But as soon as world prices rise, as soon as we started to get a little lift in the cost of energy, the, minister, the Prime Minister and his inner circle jumps on a plane, Madam Speaker, and circle the globe to engage in, energy, in talks with energy companies. That is not the way to do neg negotiations, Madam Speaker. That is certainly not the way to do negotiations. Certainly not outside of the public eye, without public, without public servants. Today, just like previously, the Minister pins his entire hope for growth on the energy sector only. They have sabotaged everything else. Madam Speaker, the minister claimed in his budget statement somehow that somebody 
just like this current minister, the minister in the Ministry of Finance, somebody told them something about something. In the budget statement, the minister claimed that someone told him that the country should abandon oil and gas production. Well, I have no, I, that is completely un unbelievable, Madam Speaker. I believe that the minister has made that up just like he's made up so many other numbers, some of which I will prove just now. No right thinking person would say, give up oil and gas. As a matter of fact, common sense, Madam Speaker, which may be a stranger to those on the opposite side, common sense, right thinking citizens, like the Minister of Health like to, like, like to throw out just now, right thinking citizens would have told the minister that revenue streams from the energy sector should have been used because it's temporary and should have been used to create the environment for sustainable development of new industries and revenue sources. Sadly, as we have seen from the minister's presentation, there is no strategy, no plan, and no vision for growth in this country. All there is is a minister fabricating numbers based on projections that somehow he is going to, without putting anything in place, generate growth, positive growth in this economy in 2022 and going forward, when every other indication, economic, fiscal, and social, tells us otherwise. Madam Speaker, again, central bank data. Central bank data. Central Bank has a data center. I'm hoping that the Minister in the Ministry of Finance knows that as well. I extracted some natural gas production data from the Ministry of Finance. Number? Yes, ma'am. You have five more minutes of speaking time. You're entitled to a further 10 minutes if you wish to request. I most definitely will appreciate if I can have that extra time, Madam Speaker. Please proceed. Madam Speaker, the data from the Central Bank website shows clearly that between 2015 and 2021, the average production of gas was 3,330 million cubic feet per day. During that period, the economy contracted significantly because of the continued reliance on oil and gas, continued reliance on energy, and the failure to transform the economy. So now, today, when we have a situation where the production of oil and gas in 2022 and projected for 2023 is 84% of that, it's less than the average over that 2020, 2016 to 2021 period. It's less than that. Suddenly, the minister is talking about economic growth. That's why the minister would jump on fiscal, for fiscal 2022, he will jump on the use of nominal figures because the increase that he's talking about here is not real production increase. It is based on inflation. It's based on higher prices. That's all. And that's what the minister is planning on riding the wave on the back of ad infinitum without putting anything in place for what will eventually happen, which is that the price of gas and oil and energy products will fall. But international agencies, Madam Speaker, so it's not just the numbers from the IMF and the projections. It's not just the central bank data, Madam Speaker. International agencies are also warning the minister about the directions his policies are taking, is taking this country. On Monday, the minister of finance, in, in his anxiety to feed the narrative, left out some critical information that to date has not been made public, but is contained in the standard and pause report of July 21st, 2022. What the minister did not mention at, during his time at the crease on Monday in this honorable house, was that the standard and pause in the very same report forecasted that export growth would decline in 2023, 2024, and 2025 by 8.4%, 26.7% and 0.3% respectively in, during that time frame in each of those years, Madam Speaker. So that coincides with what the IMF projection is saying and what the central bank statistics are showing, that there is going to be a worsening going forward of the state of the economy if things remain as bad as they are, as mismanaged as they are, as in, uh, under the incompetence of this government 
and the minister in the Ministry of Finance, and the Minister of Finance, and the rest of the members of cabinet on that side, Madam Speaker. As an economist, and as a patriot of Trinidad and Tobago, I find it extremely disturbing, Madam Speaker, that such strong and prolonged contraction of real economic growth will severely compromise the long-term growth potential of Trinidad and Tobago. Why the minister did not share these projections while he was touting Standard & Poor's, gave him a, a credit rating, and patting himself on the back for its outlook in the short term? Why he didn't share that, Madam Speaker? I leave that for you to decide. But there's much more to be worried about, Madam Speaker. The same Standard & Poor's report used by the minister also predict a growing unemployment rate to 6.5% by 2023. That's next year. In fact, that's the, 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 the fiscal year that we are walking to tomorrow. A growing unemployment rate of 6.5% predicted by the very same standard and pause that gave him a short-term buy because of high energy returns, high energy prices. Madam Speaker, another figure that I want to give to the ministry and give to the minister, these were the labor force participation rate, Madam Speaker. It's already established, I think others have spoken about it before, that there has been a substantial contraction in the number of persons employed over the last seven years. What is of even greater concern, Madam Speaker, is the fact that the labor force is also falling. Madam Speaker, there's been a sharp decline in the labor force participation rate from 61.9% to 55.9% during the period 2014 to 2022. A sharp decline. So we have a situation where people are no longer looking for work while we have a growing population. They're no longer looking for work, Madam Speaker, and that is of concern because the query must be, we have an increasing population, but decreasing people employed, and a decreasing labor force, and a falling labor participation rate. Where are these people, Madam Speaker? Why are they not in the official unemployment statistics? It is instructive to note that there are no more gangs and gang-related activities in Trinidad and Tobago, according to the Minister of National Insecurity. Are these missing persons now part of what is an underground economy? Are these growing numbers of persons not seeking job because they are involved in some other kind of activity? Madam Speaker, can we not see, can those on the opposite side not see a direct correlation between the increased numbers of persons who are no longer in the labor force, no longer looking for work, and a rapid growth in gangs? You see, these are some of the kind of statistics, Madam Speaker, that I wish that the members on the other side would pay some attention to because these should be the statistics guiding the Minister of Finance in the determination of the priorities of his government and the financially responsible decisions which should guide the budget which we are currently debating, Madam Speaker. This is also of some level of concern, Madam Speaker, because what we have facing us today is a falling number of persons employed carrying the weight of the population unemployed. And that's a difficult, difficult thing to continue, which, has what has, which, which is now creating some serious social and economic difficulties. Madam Speaker, in a few more minutes available to me, I want to spend a few minutes talking briefly about some of the crises that we face in my constituency. Madam Speaker, every single time rain falls, my constituency floods. Every time. Today, as I stand here today, there are people sweeping out floodwaters in Arapooch West. Now, I accept that severe rain could cause flooding, Madam Speaker, but that flooding exists whether rain is for a short period or a long period because of the failure of the Minister of Works and Transport to desilt the rivers and clear the, clear the river banks build higher riverbanks, and make sure that all is done that is required to curtail flooding in Arapooch West. Madam Speaker, I have searched the budget documents presented last month for some indication that the minister would have made some effort to keep the promises that he has made, 
to the tens of thousands of persons in Southland facing these flooding. Unfortunately, that has not happened. So today, we have farmers in Rahamat Trace, in Puzzle Island, in Woodland, in Pluck Road, etc., who continue to be regular victims of predial larceny and flooding. And there's nothing in the development program to give them any hope that this government is going to take any of the billions that they spend and contribute contributing taxes to pay to the state. There's no hope that this government will take any of that to spend to improve their condition. But it's not just flooding, Madam Speaker. It's not just flooding. Because while we are flooding on the outside, we have a poor, very poor track record on behalf of the Minister of Public Utilities in providing water to the population of Arapuche West. Very, very poor. The minister had the opportunity today to come and tell us what the plans were, how he was going to fix the water shortage problem in Arapuche West and elsewhere. And he failed to do so, preferring to stand here and laugh and make joke while people in my constituency are suffering for a basic human necessity as water. Madam Speaker, I have written to the minister with responsibility for CPEP almost two years ago seeking additional CPEP gangs to ensure that the smaller water courses are cleared and maintained so that this flooding issue that we have would not be as bad as it is. I have not had the courtesy of a response from that minister to date. Residents of South Trinidad, residents of my constituency and other constituencies in South Trinidad have said to me that they feel that they're being subjected to discrimination, geographic discrimination, because of the neglect and disregard by this government against them. Next week, when we discuss and debate the, uh, at the Standing Finance Committee, the estimates of expenditure, I want to signal my intention to ask the minister, the current minister, which is responsible for CPEP, for a breakdown of the number of CPEP gangs by constituency. I am not interested at this point in who they are. I don't, just, I don't want the names of the contractors. I just want the numbers. You see, in Standing Fiscal Committee, and for fiscal year 2021, the then minister had provided a breakdown showing how many gangs were in existence and in operation in each constituency at the time. It was available by constituency then. But weeks and months afterwards, when we asked for an updated figure, Madam Speaker, the very ministers on the opposite side told us that that information is not available because they don't do it like that anymore. They don't do it like that. They brought it in fiscal 2021, but suddenly, when they realized what it showed, they stopped providing the information. If there's nothing to hide, Madam Speaker, then why are they hiding? And I want to tell you why they're hiding, Madam Speaker. I would like the minister. In fact, let me, let me say it differently, Madam Speaker. I challenge the minister and the Ministry of Finance and the Minister of Local Government, who is now responsible for CPEP, to explain to the country, to the population, why my constituency of Oropuch West, which has 56 square kilometers, much of it rural, bushy, and with poor infrastructure, thanks to this government, and high unemployment, why a 56 square minute, uh, kilometer constituency has 12 CPEP contractors? 12, as of 2021. I challenge the minister to tell us if there's more, because I have not seen an increase. 12 CPEP contractors, 56 square kilometers. Do you know that San Fernando West? Do you know that San Fernando West? Do you know that San Fernando West, which has 10.3 square kilometers, with good roads and drainage and lights and little forested area, has 46 CPEP contractors? 46? If that is not geographic discrimination, Madam Speaker, I don't know what is. Understanding Order 481, which surely includes the truth. That's just not true. Madam Speaker, the okay. Honorable Minister. Continue. <laughs> Continue, ma'am. We need standing finance committee to provide the truth because in 2021, this was the facts provided by the ministry, by the finance. This was the facts provided. So if there was geographic discrimination in 2021 and there is none now, Minister, you have the opportunity to prove it. Correct it then. Don't talk now. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we also have some of the worst roads in this country. Some of the absolute worst roads. And quite frankly, I join with my fellow constituents and I join with members of the public in this country to criticize and condemn this government.
for the old talk and mama guy that they've been provided for the last two to three years, that they didn't have the money because they were spending it to save lives. Madam Speaker, if that were true, the statistics would bear it out. But the data, facts are strange things, and the data does not lie. Facts are strange things. If it is that they were spending the money elsewhere instead of fixing roads because they gave another priority, that priority wasn't saving lives because the numbers do not bear it out, Madam Speaker. We have the, roads, the worst roads in the country right now. And no matter how many times we've written to the minister, he's never responded. There's a plan that the minister will come forward now to say that, that they're going to fix roads. But that is talk. And we have been hearing that talk for the last seven years. It's not today. It's not last year. It's not during COVID time that the roads were bad. The roads have been bad for seven years. And while in my constituency, they have refused to fix the roads. We see paving on top of paving, on top of paving, on top of good roads being paved in other constituencies. So we have a situation where a minister could stand up today and boast of the roads being paved in his constituencies. But bring it down to south. We need it more than them, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the minister in his, in, in his budget presentation laid out a groundwork of things that he said that his budget was going to do. It was going to lift the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Sadly, Madam Speaker, he, he is following the same path that he has done for the last seven years. The same plans, the same policies, the same prescription, and it's going to cause the same chaos it's going to cause the same distress. Madam Speaker, I don't think that this government is even aware because they live in ivory castles pro protected by armed guards. They live in, in luxury. But they are missing what is going on outside. Citizens are frustrated and they are fed up. Businessmen are frustrated and fed up. Madam Speaker, with, the, with those words, I would, like to, I would like to suggest to the Honorable Minister that he will and come at Member, your speaking time is now spent. Leader of the House. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn to Saturday, the first day of October at 10 a.m. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Saturday. I know we're all anxious to go home. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Saturday, the first day of October 2022 at 10 a.m. All in say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Saturday the first day of October 2022 at 10 a.m.